It's doing good. You sound like you have a horny mouth. I have a what? A horny mouth. Me? Yeah. A horny mouth. Oh, you are. You are something else, I'll tell you. All right. Do I make you the host? I would advise that, yes. Okay. I just changed hosts. My hair plugs. And we're rolling. We're going to do this, Dan. People said we couldn't do it. We're going to do it. I'm feeling kind of bad. The show, the show has started because this is as good as it's going to get right now. This is as good as it gets. It's Labor Day and Oive. Welcome to the mop up for September 5th, 2022. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 92 degrees and partly cloudy. I want to welcome home the mice. They're back. They were vacationing on the Hamptons for the past weekend. I'd like to thank the cockroaches for filling in for them. They did a great job annoying me, but the mice are now back. Happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day. Dan, happy Labor Day, Dan. Happy Labor Day to you. Yeah, I'm sorry you had to work today, but uh, you know, we're all leftists here on the David Feldman Show. And because I'm a leftist, I felt I, you know, I don't have to prove anything. So I told the staff, nobody gets Labor Day off because I'm a leftist. So what's the point of my giving my staff the day off? I don't have to prove anything to anybody. So my entire staff, all 100 employees came to work today because, as I told them, we're coming up uh towards the end of the quarter which means their performance reviews are almost done it's the final push i don't care if it's labor day let's hit those numbers let me just say to my staff here on labor day you are family which means all of you can be replaced now it pains me to think of finding new family members because i love you so many of you have purchased homes since joining my staff and the thought of your not being able to pay your mortgages because you disappointed me and i had to let you go while strangely titillating uh i find it too much to think about right now it does excite me the idea of firing somebody knowing they have a mortgage and a family but i don't have time the quarter is almost over I'd rather think about who I'm going to fire on Christmas Eve when I have time to think clearly about who on the David Feldman show has been naughty and who's been nice. And uh, then I announce my, my firings on Christmas Day. That's the present I give to myself every Christmas. I announce who is going to get fired from this show on Christmas Day. So for, I know, I know some of you have been sitting around craft services all day, my staff bitching and moaning that you had to come in on Labor Day. I get it. I get it. But the question you should be asking isn't why do we have to work on Labor Day? The question you should be asking yourselves is what kind of Christmas do I want for myself and my family? That's the question my staff should be asking itself right now. Do you, wanna, do you want me to call you on Christmas morning to tell you I had to let you go? Is that the Christmas you want? Or do you want a good call on Christmas morning where I tell you I'm getting a lot of pressure from above to cut costs and I, I want to renew your contract, but I'm afraid you're going to have to take a 40% hit and work longer hours for the good of our family. I hope you want that call and not the call where I'm firing you. So to the 100 staff members of the David Feldman Show, put on your game face. I don't care if it's Labor Day, I'm planning a long one. Tell your family it's gonna be a late night. Solidarity. Happy Labor Day, Dan. 
You too, boss. Glad to be here. Yeah. I don't think the skills that you've accrued here translate to any other type of job. So quite frankly, where else are you going to go? Where else are any of you going to go? You're stuck here, so make the best of it. Happy Labor Day solidarity. I love my staff, by the way, all 100 of them. But some days you just got to crack some skulls. Not for the good of the show, just so I can feel alive. It's all I have, cracking the skulls of my staff, especially on Labor Day. Almost as good as firing some on Christmas Day. Ah, spokesperson for the National Labor Relations Board <laughs> says Amazon did not make a good enough case when it claimed during a hearing that Christian Small's Amazon Labor Union engaged in questionable behavior that resulted in workers at a Staten Island, New York warehouse to decide to join his union. Amazon has until September 16th to appeal the ruling and says they will. That's good news for Christian Smalls. Amazon is not recognizing the NLRB's uh, recognition of the Amazon Labor Union, but a, a hearing shows that they better. Meanwhile, today, as I mentioned, is Labor Day, and Christian Smalls, the leader of the Amazon Labor Union, gave an interview with Yahoo Finance to announce today's big march. Here is Christian Smalls. History speak from Apple workers to Trader Joe's to, to uh, uh, women in the fashion industry. Um, all these different industries from different parts of the country are traveling into New York City on Monday on Labor Day to help amplify these elections and these campaigns that we won already to be recognized as bona fide unions and everybody else in these other industries that are continuing to fight. It's important that we all stand together and bond together as a union. And we are we're just here to bring back the real meaning of Labor Day in New York City. So I'm happy and excited to do that on Monday. As Professor Harvey J.K. says, if you're not talking about labor, you're just talking shit. If you're not talking about labor unions and organizing, you're just doing a Marxist critique with your head up your ass. David Zalpolsky is Amazon's general counsel. Take a look at his face. That's David Zapolsky. It's spelled Z-A-P-O-L-S. KY. He is Amazon's general counsel. When Christian Smalls was fired by Amazon back in March of 2020, after he walked out, he led a, a walkout because he was complaining about inadequate protections against COVID. After he got fired for staging a walkout, Amazon general counsel David Zapolsky, Z A P O L S K Y, wrote a memo to Amazon's leadership, which read, this is what Amazon's general counsel, David Zapolsky, wrote about Christian Smalls. Quote, Christian Smalls is not smart or articulate, and to the extent the press wants to focus on us versus him, we will be in a much stronger PR position than simply explaining for the umpteenth time how we're trying to protect workers. We should spend the first part of our response strongly laying out the case for why Christian Small's conduct was immoral, unacceptable, and arguably illegal, and only then follow with our usual talking points about worker safety. This is the definition of evil, right? Christian Smalls walks out of Amazon because people are getting infected in March of 2020 with COVID. Jeff Bezos is not pro providing the warehouse workers with the protections they need, the masks. And uh, David Zapolsky, Amazon's general counsel, calls that immoral. He goes on to write in his memo, make Christian Smalls the most interesting part of the story and if possible, make him the face of the entire union organizing movement. You got your wish, David Zapolsky. You got your wish. That's 
Amazon general counsel, David Zapolsky, who received his degrees from radical hotbeds like Columbia and Berkeley, right? Those were radical hotbeds during the 60s. He uh, got his undergrad degree in music from Columbia, and then he got his law degree from Berkeley, and nobody taught him what morality is. Rotten hell, piece of shit, David Zapolsky, Amazon's general counsel. Well, I don't let certain things go. Uh, if you remember two weeks ago, I got into an argument with a guest on the show, a self-reported leftist, more style than content. Uh, he defended ultimate fighting because he likes it. And he was offended because he's a self-professed leftist and uh, he sees nothing wrong with the sport, but I do. And turns out I'm right, he's wrong, uh, unless he's not really a leftist. There's no way you can call yourself a leftist and support UFC. Uh, so according to a new piece in the financial, I was gonna let this go, by the way, but the guy came at me with such vitriol and so self-righteous, accusing me of being a liberal because I had a problem with UFC. I said it was evil, which it is. And I can't believe that I have to tell people that UFC is evil and that Joe Rogan is evil for doing the play-by-play -play for Ultimate Fighting and that Disney, which owns ESPN, should be ashamed of itself for showing this blood sport on ESPN. I can't believe that, that people who call themselves leftist have to be told this and, and then get indignant and attack me for being a neoliberal because I don't approve of the UFC. Well, maybe this leftist doesn't read enough. According to a new piece in the Financial Times, Dana White, who runs UFC Ultimate Fighting, is a union buster. Happy Labor Day, poser. Dana White is a union busting. Now, for those of you, again, who didn't see the show two weeks ago, I criticized Joe Rogan for calling UFC, and I criticized Disney for running UFC on ESPN. I said it was dangerous. It instilled the wrong message for viewers and it was bad for the fighters. My guest was appalled. How could a leftist like me, David Feldman, talk that way about the UFC? And again, he accused me of being a snob and a neoliberal, all because I find UFC violent and immoral. According to the Financial Times, which comes out of London, Joel Stein wrote a piece over at the Financial Times on, what was it, September 1st. Uh, in a poll of UFC fighters, 95% say they want to form a union. The Financial Times says that UFC exploits its players. He points out that while the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball give half the revenues to players, the UFC distributes fewer than 17%, which tends to end up in the hands of a rarefied few, the winners. Dana White, and here is what's really appalling about UFC and the guest on my show. Uh, and I sent him this article, and of course I haven't heard back from him. Uh, Dana White, who runs UFC, according to the Financial Times, does not provide health care to his 670 fighters who remain under contract exclusively to them. He chooses who they fight and when they fight. Dana White, by the way, owes the success of UFC to Donald Trump. Gee, what a surprise. Donald Trump was the only casino owner brave enough to host a UFC fight at, I think it was the Taj Mahal. Before that, it was hard to get uh, a UFC 
fight booked in Atlantic City or Las Vegas, especially since Senator John McCain called it human cockfighting and said it should be outlawed. When asked about fighters who have to take jobs to pay their rent, Dana White told the Financial Times, quote, you're either one of the top guys in the world or you're not. He's being sued, right? And uh, he says the people in that lawsuit are the or nots. Yes, solidarity and power to the people and every leftist, like the guest who came on my show, who defended UFC, every leftist should rally behind Dana White and UFC because it's so fair to its employees. So much so that Republican Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen, he's a, an o Oklahoma Republican, an Oklahoma Republican who's running for Senate. He's also a former MMA fighter. He thinks the UFC should be treating the boxers as uh, employees, not independent contractors. He says they have only one boss, it's Dana White, and he says Dana White exploits the boxers, the MMA boxers, the fighters. He is introducing a bill that would extend the Muhammad, Muhammad Ali Boxing Reform Act to mixed martial arts. My guest, I, I, two weeks ago, he was indignant. He, he said, I wasn't a real leftist. I didn't understand UFC. I shouldn't watch it. I shouldn't be passing judgment on it. Uh, I sent him the article, no response, of course, but he's a leftist who cares about the people, right? You come on my show looking for a fight, claiming you're on the left, a man of the people, but when presented with incontrovertible evidence, that UFC is the height of exploitation crickets because that guest wasn't looking for a discussion. He was looking for a fight. Well, it's Labor Day. Let's have a peaceful, relaxing Labor Day. It's uh, Labor Day. Everyone is kicking back. I'm kicking back. I'm not angry. I'm not picking a fight with posers who come on my show looking for a fight. That's not who I am. I'm all about peace and uh, America spent Labor Day weekend kicking back. Wait, we have late breaking news. Authorities in Norfolk, Virginia, confirming a shooter early this morning opened fire at an off-campus party near Old Dominion University. Seven people shot, two killed, including Angelia McKnight, a 19-year-old student at another school, Norfolk State University. Back to you. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is still Labor Day weekend. We're we're chilling. We're taking it easy and. Well, there are about 360 million people in America. The odds are there's there's going to be a shoot. Oh, another one. Hang on. And on Friday, a deadly shooting outside a Baltimore high school shortly after students were dismissed for the day. Mm. Back to you. Yeah, well, I mean, that was Friday, and technically the Labor Day weekend hadn't really started. So, yeah, but this it's been a relaxing weekend where we're all being nice to one another we are we're good people in florida five people were shot two of them killed after someone opened fire inside a packed restaurant back to you yeah okay so that's florida and you know florida doesn't really count as you know whatever happens in florida that doesn't figure into the stats it's been a peaceful quiet labor day weekend it has in Maryland, one person dead, several injured in two separate shootings. One outside of 7-Eleven. Minutes away in Largo, moviegoers flee a theater after one person was shot in a parking lot. Back to you. Yeah, well, uh, okay. Uh, it's been hot and so people are at each other's throats. But other than that, it's been pretty quiet.
I, I'm pretty happy with that. In Minnesota, gunshots sparking a panicked stampede at a packed state fair. Police last night saying one person was shot in the leg. So Back to you. Okay. Uh, anything else you would like to, to tell me about? According to the Gun Violence Archive, more than 30,000 people have lost their lives to gun violence this year with 458 mass shootings. Back to you. All right. It's, uh, we hate each other, right? We, we, we're Americans and we just, the leftists are fighting over fighting. I can't get along with leftists because they defend UFC. And uh, we just, everybody hates one another. Back to you. Yeah, okay, back to you too, right back at you. Well, one of Nevada's best well-known investigated journalists, Jeff German, who made a career looking into mobsters and corruption in Las Vegas City Hall, as well as the casinos, was found stabbed to death outside his Las Vegas home Saturday night. At the time of his murder, German was working for the Las Vegas Review Journal. Police say German had not called them to report any threats on his life, but always uh, suspicious when a well-respected investigative journalist is stabbed outside his home. What is Trump doing with those files? The Trump presidency began with Compromat. I've talked about this. Uh, I do believe in Russiagate, sorry. Uh, and it began, the presidency began with Compromat. Compromat being what did Putin have on Trump and how could he control Trump? Compromat, what did Putin or what did secret agents give Trump so he could have on Lindsey Graham? I mean, I, rumor is that Trump had Compromat on Lindsey Graham, that Graham was straight. I mean, this would be devastating if that ever got out that Lindsey Graham was straight. What did Trump have on everyone else? And what did everyone else have on Trump? Trump's relationship with the National Enquirer made it possible for people like David Pecker, who ran the National Enquirer. Yes, his name is David Pecker. They would catch and kill stories in order to protect Trump. For example, if a porn star was about to come forward saying she had sex with Trump, the inquirer would say, oh, that's a really interesting story. We'll pay you for that. And they would pay the porn star hundreds of thousands of dollars for an exclusive and then not run it. It's called catch and kill. That's how you protect Donald Trump through catch and kill. And that is why Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, ended up going to prison because setting up hush payments uh, that end up being funneled through the inquirer to shut down a bad story is considered an illegal campaign contribution. It's called it an illegal con campaign contribution in kind, right? So Trump loves Compromat. He's all about Compromat because Compromat is how you get judges and prosecutors to look the other way. We always say, how does he do it? How, why isn't he in Compromat. He doesn't go to prison because a manila envelope ends up on the desk of a prosecutor, which the prosecutor then opens up and says, you know, these photographs, uh, you know, I love my family too much. Uh, Trump isn't worth it. If my family found out that this is the only way I can get an erection. Uh, it's just not worth it. And they go away. Compromat, compromat, compromat. So why was Donald Trump storing classified information in Mar-a-Lago? He, I think, needed compromat. I think he wanted compromat. That's what I think. That's what I've been saying. And that's what his former communications director Stephanie Grisham said over the weekend on CNN. I think it's some kind of a, a leverage. Well, leverage, she calls it leverage, uh, because Donald Trump is the king of leverage. He said it himself. He was talking about leverage as in debt, 
but uh, he is the king of leverage. I have some leverage over you, and if your wife finds out, she will no longer be your wife. You're sunk here. You're going to drop the charges. Here is Alyssa Farah Griffin, who also worked at Trump's White House, pretty much telling CNN the same exact thing. Even the subject matter, because I think knowing the former president, we have to kind of think about why he does things and his motivations behind things. And, and one we have to keep in mind is leverage. That's what he wanted, leverage. We don't know over whom, not sure. We will find out, unless he's got leverage on our attorney general. Bill Barr served as Trump's attorney general and protected Trump from prosecution when the Mueller report came out. Now, the second half of the Mueller report, if you remember, was a blueprint on how the Justice Department could prosecute Trump for obstruction of justice. But Bill Barr didn't want to prosecute a sitting president. There was a memo from the Office of Legal Counsel within the Justice Department that says, we're not gonna prosecute sitting presidents. The, the memo was decades old and Bill Barr was uh, standing by it. Is it Bob Barr or Bill Barr? Bob, Bob Barr, one of, the, one of the bars drove his mistress to an abortion while he was impeaching Bill Clinton for a blowjob. The attorney general, I think, is Bill Barr. Bob Barr is the congressman from, Republican congressman from Georgia. Anyway, pretty sure it's late, it's hot, no air conditioning. Anyway, former attorney general Barr does not want to prosecute. He does not believe in prosecuting presidents. Doesn't believe in prosecuting powerful people. But he's no longer defending Donald Trump. Here is former Attorney General Barr on Fox News talking about the chances of Donald Trump getting prosecuted for holding on to classified documents. This could not have made Fox viewers happy hearing Bill Barr talking about Donald Trump this way. Okay, it is clearly foolish what, what happened and inexplicable. But beyond that, they, they may well be able to make a case out here. But then there's an additional question. Given the fact this is a former president, given the state of the nation, is it, and, and given the fact that the government has gotten its documents back, does it really make sense to bring a case as a matter of prudential judgment? And that's a question that I think will turn on how clear the evidence of obstruction or deceit is. If, if they clearly have the president moving stuff around and hiding stuff in his uh, uh, desk and, and telling people to dissemble with the, with the government, they may, be, they may be inclined to bring that case. And you know, there's gonna be differences of opinion whether that makes sense. Uh, but we really have to know the facts to say, you know, uh, to make a judgment about that. I, I hope it doesn't happen. Of course he hopes it doesn't happen. He doesn't think powerful people should go to jail, only poor people. That's why he's a Republican. It's not good for the country when powerful men like Donald Trump go to prison. But Barr has been attorney general twice. And out of professional courtesy, he did defend attorney general Merrick Garland and the search of Mar-a-Lago, something Fox viewers do not want to hear. Here is former Attorney General Barr defending Merrick Garland. Shocking to see this on Fox News. I think the driver on this from the beginning was, the, was you know, loads of classified information sitting in Mar-a-Lago. People say this was unprecedented. Well, it's also unprecedented for a president to take all this classified information and put him in a country club. OK, and how, how long is the government going to uh, try to get that back? You know, they jawbone for a year. They were deceived on the voluntary uh, actions taken. Uh, they then went and got a subpoena. They were deceived on that. Uh, they feel and the record, the facts are starting to show that they were being jerked around. And, and so how long, you know, how long do they wait? Garland doesn't like getting jerked around, especially at the Olive Garden. Uh, more breadsticks, please. All right, I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. Uh, well, 
Fox News is lousy, period, as well as lousy with pundits who insist Donald Trump declassified all those documents at Mar-a-Lago. That's all you hear if you're foolish enough to watch Fox News. Everybody over at Fox News says it doesn't matter. He's the president. He can declassify those documents. Not true. And here is former Attorney General Barr setting Fox viewers straight on Fox News. Is there any legitimate reason for those materials to be in the president, former president's possession? Uh, no, I, I can't think of a, of a legitimate reason why they, they should have been could be taken out of the uh, government, away from the government, if they're classified. I frankly am skeptical of this claim that I declassified everything, you know, because frankly, I think it's highly improbable. Uh, and second, if in fact he sort of stood over uh, scores of boxes, not really knowing what was in them, and said, I hereby declassify everything in here, that would be such an abuse uh and uh that uh, and shows such recklessness that it's almost worse than taking the document so that today is the eighth day that the 150,000 residents of jackson mississippi are going without tap water last monday a, was a week ago a storm destroyed the city's main treatment plant water coming through the tap has uh, been deemed unsafe for drinking Residents are being advised to shower with their mouths shut. Some residents are seeing their water come back on, but others are relying on the National Guard and the Salvation Army to distribute water at specific distribution centers, which are impossible for people who are old or don't have a car to get to. Before the shutdown last week of the treatment plant, Residents of Jackson, Mississippi, were already being told to boil their water. Jackson is a heavily African-American city. Funds, I talked about this on Friday, funds from the Biden administration have been available to Jackson, Mississippi for more than a year to help them upgrade their water treatment. But the Republican-controlled state government has slow walked the application process why we'll find out but you can be certain it's because of ideological grounds partly racism and partly mississippi doesn't like the federal government mississippi as i pointed out on friday doesn't take medicaid expansion under obamacare mississippi is a strong proponent of states rights meaning it wants nothing to do with the federal government including Believe it or not, it's money. Record heat today in Los Angeles, which hit 110 degrees. The city of Fresno, which is a little to the north and to the east, is expected to hit 113 degrees. 40 million Americans living in the West are under an excessive heat alert. In Arizona, Phoenix hit 115 degrees, so it's cooling off. California is asking residents not to use their electrical appliances as the use of air conditioning is putting a strain on the grid. California is asking people not to charge their electric vehicles between 4 and 9 p.m. when demand is the highest. Excessive heat is now the number one cause of death from climate change. It is estimated that 1,500 Americans will die this year from excessive heat. This is far higher from climate change related floodings and tornadoes. People die in flooding and tornadoes, but excessive heat is the number one cause of death from climate change here in America, and it's going to get worse. California fire officials say the mill fire in Northern California, which has burned through 4,254 acres, is only 25% contained. In the city of Weed, California, the mill fire raced through the town, killing two. Weed, California, was believed to be one of the few historically intact African-American communities 
that represented the great migration to California from Louisiana in the early 1900s. It was one of the few cities where you could go and look at the history of the, of the migration, uh, at the great migration of African Americans leaving the Jim Crow South uh, and moving to California to, to work in the lumber industry, that town as of today, no longer exists. Liz Truss. Oh, I'm going to honor Liz Truss by tightening my truss. Hang on. I, I wear a truss in honor of Liz Truss. Let me just tighten my truss. There we go. Okay. In honor of Liz Truss, I'm really tightening my truss. Liz Truss. All right, I won't do that. Liz Truss was voted to lead Great Britain's conservative. <laughs> the whole camera is shaking. Uh, you think I'm proud that I wear a truss? I did a lot of heavy lifting as a child. Uh, I don't even know what a truss is. I think it's for a hernia. I think men wear trusses for hernias, I think. Liz Truss was voted to lead Great Britain's conservative government, and she is expected to be the next prime minister. Truss beat former finance minister Rishi Sunak by 57% to 43% in the final runoff. Truss is 47 years old. She served as foreign secretary, and, and she campaigned on a promise to cut taxes while calling herself anti-woke. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. <laughs> and I will deliver on the National Health Service. That's a lot of delivering. She's starting to sound like Jeff Bezos because she's pretty much the same as Jeff Bezos. A piece of shit. Uh, well, anyway, former, she would be the third female prime minister of Great Britain. That's a, that's a real, anyway, I won't say it. Former president of Brazil and now candidate in October's election for president, Lula warned today of violence in the lead up to the elections. This after a Brazilian in Argentina pointed a loaded gun at the face of Argentinian Vice President Cristina Fernandez. This was in Buenos Aires over the weekend. The gun jammed, didn't fire, and she survived. Lula in Brazil represents the Workers' Party, that party's treasurer, Marcelo de Arruda, and I think I pronounced that properly. I think I pronounced that correct. Uh, the party's treasurer, Marcelo de Arruda, was shot to death during his 50th birthday party two months ago after one of President Bolsonaro's fans fired three bullets into him. Before dying, Aruda shot back and that assassin was taken to the hospital. In true Trumpian fashion, Bolsonaro, after the assassination, immediately posted a series of tweets accusing Lula's party of committing acts of violence against the right wing. This is why they call Bolsonaro, the current president of Brazil, the Trump of the tropics. You can't argue with fascists. You have to defeat them. And that's why I hope you're all registered to vote. U.S. midterms are only 63 days away. Howie Klein is coming up at 7 o'clock. And the midterms are 63 days away here in the United States. On Friday, a Rasmussen generic congressional vote poll shows Republicans leading by five points. In other words, in terms of the popular vote, you don't take into effect you know, gerry gerrymandering, but just a congressional popular vote, Republicans are leading by five points. On Thursday, the Wall Street Journal showed Democrats leading by three. 
The Wall Street Journal also says that if the presidential election were held today between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Biden would win by six points. The New York Times reported over the weekend that since Roe was overturned, women are registering to vote at record numbers. This election might be remembered as the Roe wave. The Republicans have pretty much, by the way, given up on taking back the Senate. This is really important. Mitch McConnell, the Senate minority leader, is reportedly furious with the leader of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. That would be Florida's idiot Senator Rick Scott, who reportedly blew through $172 million, using it to raise more money through online ads. He had $172 million. He hired some Trump consultants, and he said, let's spend $172 million advertising on Facebook and Google in order to raise more money. And of course, the consultants, when they make ad buys, get a cut of the $172 million. And now he only has $8.8 million left because he's an effing idiot. Rick Scott is an effing idiot. You understand what he did? He had $172 million as leader of the National Republic Senatorial Committee, spent $172 million on advertising to make more money, and now they're broke. They, they have something like $8 million left, and Mitch McConnell is said to be furious with Florida Senator Rick Scott. If you remember, Rick Scott turned to politics after the healthcare company he ran was found guilty of committing $1.7 billion of Medicare fraud. Rick Scott's healthcare company reached two settlements with the Justice Department, one for $840 million back in 2000, and in 2002, another settlement for $881 million. During Rick Scott's, that would be Senator Rick Scott's deposition, he pleaded the fifth 75 times. Well, like I said, women are registering to vote, some think at record numbers, we don't know yet, because of Roe. And Congressman Tom Emmer is in charge of the Republican Congressional Committee. Rick Scott is in charge of the Republic, Republican Senate Committee. Tom Emmer is in charge of the Republican Congressional Committee. And he thinks the Democrats are making a huge mistake appealing to women. Here he was yesterday. Uh, if Democrats want to make abortion the main issue, when every poll we have seen says that the economy and the cost of uh, living is the number one issue, uh, good luck to them trying to defend their extreme position. Every one of them voted for what I call the Chinese genocide bill, which would allow abortion up to moments before a child takes its first breath. I think uh, our candidates know how to message that and they'll be just fine in the midterms. Yes, the Democrats are extremists, which is why I voted for the, what, what is it, the, the Chinese killing baby what, bill, whatever. I, but uh, see, women know you're lying about abortion, killing babies uh, right before they're born. Late-term abortions are practically non-existent, and women know that. And so this could spell trouble for the Republicans. I hope this election, I believe, is ultimately about abortion because abortion is an economic issue, right? We know that. Women get pregnant, they can't work. Daycare is too expensive. Uh, women get pregnant, if they're not allowed to get an abortion, they stay home. And if they live in Texas, good chance of starving to death. Uh, well, this election, like I said, is about abortion. In 1992, 
women turned out to vote in record numbers because of Clarence Thomas. He was approved to sit on the Supreme Court a year before by a Senate Judiciary Committee that didn't have a single woman sitting on it. Because of that, 1992 became the year of the women. Women voted and we had new senators sent to Washington. Barbara Boxer was sent to uh, Washington in 1992. That was the year of the woman thanks to Clarence Thomas. 30 years later, once again, thanks to Clarence Thomas, partly thanks to Clarence Thomas, he wrote the concurrent opinion overturning Roe in which he said, let's not stop there. Let's get rid of same-sex marriage, contraception, gay sex, right? Uh, thanks to Clarence Thomas, once again, 1992 will repeat itself in 2022, 30 years later, we'll also be seeing the year of the woman. Women are going to vote. And why would they vote for the Republicans, a party that has revealed itself to be the exemplars of misogyny? They, they don't believe in sexual harassment. They trivialize sexual assault and they're opposed to abortion. Well, on Thursday, there you go, Joe Biden delivered a speech warning that MAGA Republicans are semi-fascist. That's not true. They are fascists. He called them semi-fascists. And Republicans, especially who identify as Trump supporters, were deeply offended at the president calling them fascists. Jonna Winter over at Yahoo reports that MAGA was so offended by being called semi-fascist, they took to online forums and called for the assassination of Joe Biden because that's what people who don't like being called fascists do. And then the online forums were filled with calls for a civil war because he called us a fascist, called us fascists. We're not fascists. And so they want to assassinate Joe Biden and start a civil war. And the online forums were also overflowing with suggestions that somebody should target for killing Jewish members of Biden's cabinet, like Attorney General Merrick Garland, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and Homeland Secretary Alexandra Mayorkas. How dare you call us fascist? Just for that, we're going to kill some Jews and wage a civil war because we don't like being called fascists. That's offensive to us. Jamie Raskin defended Biden's speech. Raskin, who sits, Congressman Jamie Raskin, who sits on the January 6th committee, said in an interview over the weekend that one of the hallmarks from the fascist playbook is election denial coupled with celebrating political violence. That's a fact. I was reading Jason Stanley's book over the weekend about fascism, and what he pointed out is fascism isn't monolithic. Hitler's version of fascism, he said, was different from Mussolini's, but fascism is also politics. And the politics, the running for office and seizing control of that office is not is monolithic they all work the same playbook to gain power what they do with that power it's up to individual authoritarians uh he says that Victor Orban is a different authoritarian than uh, Erdogan in Turkey and you know uh Mussolini was different from Hitler but in the seizure of power. They rely on nationalism, racism, othering people, 
lying about election results and uh, oppression of women and uh, violence, the threat of violence. So whether or not we're going to turn into Nazi Germany or Italy under Mussolini or Hungary under Orban, the, the, the playbook, the political playbook is all the same. We, we are witnessing that right now, and it's undeniable. And uh, you should read Jason Stanley. Monica Crowley was going to serve as Donald Trump's deputy national security advisor, but she had a little problem. She had a little problem. She stole other people's ideas in writing. It was learned just when she was going to be approved deputy national security advisor. She had plagiarized significant chunks of her 2012 book entitled What the Bleep Just Happened. So she's back on Fox and no plagiarist she. Monica Crowley is an original thinker, always with an original take. Here is her unplagiarized original take on Joe Biden's speech from Thursday night. Yeah, the imagery there was almost satanic with that blood red uh, lighting and the two Marines behind him. It was just insane. Yep, her days of plagiarizing are over. That was an original take. However, Trump's former UN Secretary Nikki Haley was on Fox earlier that day, and she said this. The only threat was the man at that podium with a backdrop of hell sitting there lecturing Americans on the road that we're going down. Well, mediocre minds think alike. And I'm being generous by calling those mediocre minds. Nobody says it better. And I do mean this. Now, you just heard Nikki Haley and Monica Crowley saying the same thing. But take a look at Trump. No matter what you think of him, here he is, uh, Saturday night at Wilkes Bear. That I don't know how to Wilkes Bar, Wilkes Bear Township, Pennsylvania, Wilkes Barre, Wilkie's Township. Uh, here he is in Pennsylvania campaigning for Dr. Oz. And compare what Monica Crowley and Nikki Haley said to how brilliantly Donald Trump said it. How'd you like the red lighting behind him like the devil? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, he would make such a great, I, I, I he would make a stand, a, 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 I could never be as funny a stand-up comic as Donald Trump. He is brilliant. He is. He's funny. But Republicans don't like being called fascists. They talk tough, but they're thin skinned. Ben Shapiro says facts don't care about your feelings. He loves to say facts don't care about your feelings. That's what Republicans say. Facts don't care about your feelings. Now, Joe Biden called MAGA Republicans fascists, and that's a fact that doesn't care about your feelings. Fascists use nationalism, racism, lies, and political violence to get elected. That's a fact. A fact that doesn't care about your feelings, Republicans. That's who you are. And these facts are hurting your feelings. Here's Nikki Haley once again. The idea that he condemned us was worse than Hillary calling us deplorables, was worse than Obama calling us extremists. He basically called us bad people. Oh my God. Uh, no, he called you fascists is what he called you. And fascists, yes, are bad people. You are bad. You're bad. You're deplorable. You're extremists. You're racist. You're homophobic. You hate Jews. You hate Arabs, Muslims, Hispanics. You're hateful, hateful people. 
Speaking of hateful, hateful people, Charlie Kirk from Turning Points, he's the 29-year-old who runs Turning Points, gets all his money from millionaires and uh, all his talking points from billionaires. Charlie Kirk was incensed that Joe Biden called him a fascist. And, uh, you know, this is Charlie Kirk who says uh, racism doesn't exist. He trivializes, if not celebrates, January 6th and other forms of violence. Of course, he's a nationalist, says uh, America is a Christian nation. In other words, he's a fascist. And apparently these facts hurt his feelings, even though facts don't care about your feelings. Here is Charlie Kirk. Democrats in control. Every time you hear democracy, you should just say, oh, you mean Democrats exactly in control? Right. Because if they actually meant representative government, that's the MAGA movement. It is grassroots. It is people centered. It is school boards. It's city council meetings. It's small dollar donations. We don't have kleptocratic billionaires behind us. We have welders, police officers, teachers and moms building the parents party. We don't have kleptocratic billionaires behind us. Now, MAGA, make America great again. Who started that? That would be that would be Donald Trump. And Charlie Kirk is saying MAGA doesn't have kleptocratic billionaires. And he's right because Donald Trump isn't a billionaire, but he's a kleptocrat. So you're right about that. He says it's all about representative government. And yet they are all about voter suppression. They pass one law after another, scrubbing the voter rolls, making it harder for people of color, poor people to vote, but it's about representative government. Okay, You're, you you read your talking points from the Koch brothers uh, correctly. What else, so what did you say? We don't have kleptocratic billionaires behind us. Right, okay, we got that. What else? What else is MAGA? What else is it? It's small dollar donations. We don't have kleptocratic billionaires behind us. We have welders, police small officers, teachers, dollar. and moms building the parents' party. It's small dollar donations. Uh, that would be nice to believe if it were true, but it's just astroturf. It's just money donated, dark, dark money donated by billionaires. The Tea Party didn't come from small party donations, small people donations, small dollar donations. That's just a lie. Turning points doesn't come from small dollar donations. All millions. Uh, Charlie Kirk's turning points makes millions and millions of dollars from millions and millions of millionaires. Millionaires pay Charlie Kirk. He doesn't get his money from small dollar donations. That is a lie. That is a lie. Well, fascism, fascism. Donald Trump is a fascist. And here he is telling us who the real enemy in America is. Uh, he called Joe Biden an enemy of the state and called called the FBI raid uh, one of the most hateful things ever done by a president. And here he is talking about Biden's speech. Joe Biden came to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to give the most vicious, hateful and divisive speech ever delivered by an American president Apparently, Donald Trump doesn't listen when he talks. He, no, it wasn't the most uh, divisive speech ever given by uh, an American president. I think a president who calls for a ban on Muslims or Arabs, uh, I think that's uh, the most divisive speech uh, ever given by a, a president, at least in modern history. But the people at the Trump rally this Saturday believe every word every lie that comes out of his mouth he knows that 
We won with poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. He loves the poorly educated. That's why that's, he loves the poorly educated. That's why he was flanked by his sons when he made that statement. That was back in 2016 when Donald Trump was bragging about how he appeals to the poorly educated. So what is November? What are the midterms about? Apparently, it's about Obama. He's so popular. They say he's so handsome. Oh, Obama's so handsome. He's such a great speaker. What does he say? He says nothing. Right. <laughs> he's talking like Obama. Uh, Joe Biden makes a lot of mistakes. Uh, some would say uh, he's a little febrile. Feb febrile. Uh, I think I'm febrile. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Here is Donald Trump telling his supporters that he is still president. He's still living in the White House. And Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook, came and visited him last week. Last week, weirdo, he's a weirdo, Mark Zuckerberg came to the White House, kissed my ass. <laughs> kissed my ass. Sir, I'd love to have dinner. Sir, I'd love to have dinner. I'd love to bring my lovely wife. All right, Mark, come on in. Sir, you're number one on Facebook. I'd like to congratulate you. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate it. Now, maybe it was a mistake that Trump, I mean, listen to this again. Listen to this. Last week, weirdo, he's a weirdo, Mark Zuckerberg came to the White House, kissed my ass. <laughs> kissed my ass. I mean, Sir, I'd love that. last week he came to the White House. There are people in that rally who think he's still president, that he's still in the White House. I don't know. I, maybe he's trying to convince people that he's still the president and he's still in the White House. I love the poorly educated. Yeah, I know. That's everybody who, who's voting for you. Well, because most of your supporters are poorly educated and stupid, they'll believe whatever you tell them, because you hosted The Apprentice. Here he is breaking down Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which he says costs $4 trillion, not even close. Can you imagine that that was approved, that they allowed that to get through? And all Mitch McConnell had to do is waive the debt ceiling. I'm not approving anything having to do with debt ceiling unless See, you this drop is why this. this is why I think he's attacking Mitch McConnell. He's been going after McConnell's wife, Elaine Cho. This is why I think the Republicans are going to stay home for the midterms. He's very divisive. A divisive person is divisive, not just uh, in the country. He's divisive in his own party. And I'm hoping uh, he will, in fact, destroy it. Uh, please continue. Can you imagine that that was approved, that they allowed that to get through? And all Mitch McConnell had to do is waive the debt ceiling. I'm not approving anything having to do with debt ceiling unless you drop all this crap, $4 trillion worth, because Manchin folded like a dog. You saw that. And I always said he would. I told you he would. He did. And West Virginia, which voted for me, 45 points. I was up 45 points. West Virginia is not happy with Joe Manchin because he killed coal and they put taxes on coal. Clean, beautiful coal. <laughs> he killed it. I can't imagine he's going to do well. I don't know what the hell got to him. Clean, beautiful coal. <laughs> Clean, beautiful coal. Well, Pennsylvania, parts of Pennsylvania used to be coal country. Nobody works the coal mines anymore. And if they do, uh, they don't want to. Coal is filthy. There's no way to make it clean. And nobody wants to work the coal mines. They just want to send people down there to get rich. But uh, he loves beautiful, clean coal. And because uh, he's a clean freak. He loves things are, that are clean. This guy's a disaster. He comes in with a sweatsuit on. I've never seen him wear a suit. A dirty, dirty, dirty sweatsuit. It's really disgusting. 
You know, I'm a clean freak. <laughs> I'm a clean freak, Oz. I don't like those dirty sweatsuits. They're disgusting. Yes, uh, Fetterman is running for uh, Senate against Dr. Oz, and he wears a, uh, a sweatsuit. And Donald Trump doesn't like sweatsuits. Uh, obviously, you can tell he's never worn one himself. He's And he's a clean freak because a sweatsuit implies that you were sweaty and uh, he's a clean freak he loves beautiful clean coal and he doesn't want anybody wearing a, a sweatsuit and you know that nobody at that rally was in a sweatsuit nobody they were all wearing suits just like Donald Trump right then the former president maybe he is the president he, he said Zuckerberg visited him last week in the White House I don't know you know uh Donald Trump went after wind energy now you got to remember he's campaigning for Dr Oz and Mastriano in Pennsylvania and this is fracking country although Pennsylvanians are beginning to realize that much like coal fracking causes lung cancer and it's just bad it's just bad but he doesn't you know he thinks windmills wind turbines are evil that's what he's selling to the people of Pennsylvania if you want to see a dead bird cemetery go under a windmill sometime it's not a pretty sight it's also the single most expensive form of energy no it's not you You're can lying. get and I'm... all of those big giant turbines are built in China and Germany to a lesser extent. Well, he is, see, this is, you gotta love him. Cause he's, you know, watch what he did. This, this was funny. Look at the timing. This is self-awareness. I, I, I gotta hand it to him. China and Germany to a lesser extent. If only he used that evil for good so yeah then he name drops and talks about all the great leaders he's met all the strong men all the authoritarians and how the, the the fake news media lies and insists that he thinks uh Putin and she the head of China uh are smart right but then he says Putin and she are smart first he says the media lies about my calling Putin and she smart and then he says they're smart oh you know I got to know a lot of the foreign leaders and let me tell you uh unlike our leader uh, they're at the top of their game these are like central casting there's nobody that could play the role in Hollywood all of Hollywood nobody can play the role of President Xi of China nobody could play the role he's a fierce person Putin fierce is smart you know a lot of times I'll say somebody's smart and the fake news will go he called President Xi smart he rules with an iron fist 1.5 billion people yeah I'd say he's smart wouldn't you say he's smart he loves his authoritarian dictators and he thinks authoritarian dictators are smart because they can rule their people with an iron fist it's very telling by the way fascism this is fascism the idea that uh, a strong man literally that is what fascism is all about a a, a straw man and they listen to him and they think yeah that sounds about right I love the poorly educated. He does. He really does. You you can only be poorly educated to uh, show up for a Trump rally. There's just simply not trying to be cruel, not trying to be a snob, but only the poorly educated could uh, vote for Trump, Dr. Oz or Mastriano. Only the poorly educated uh, well, anyway, and racists. You can be you can be educated and still be a racist and a bigot. So, Donald Trump praising Xi, China praising Putin, Russia. He is a man of peace. He never got us 
into a war, right? He killed Soleimani. There were some airstrikes in Syria, but he really, four years, he really didn't get us into a major war. He says he never would be, uh, Putin never would have invaded Ukraine if Trump were still president. He He's belligerent towards China, but, you know, he's not calling for war with China. Who is our enemy, right? A fascist has to find an enemy. Tell us who the biggest threat is to America, Donald Trump. Despite great outside dangers, our biggest threat remains the sick, sinister, and evil people from within our own country. We, we should hear that again. That's who our enemy is. There's no outside force that we have to be afraid of. There are people within our own ranks who we have to weed out. This is fascism. Despite great outside dangers, our biggest threat remains the sick, sinister, and evil people from within our own country. Sick, sinister, evil people within our own country are a bigger threat to us. That is, that's the fascist political playbook. Like Jason Stanley writes in the book, fascism, when you're governing as a fascist, it's not monolithic. But when you're politicking as a fascist, it is monolithic. It is playing the same exact notes over and over again. Despite great outside dangers, our biggest threat remains the sick, sinister, and evil people from within our own country. And he just decides, the Republicans, there's always a new sick and sinister evil person within our own country that needs to be demonized. Arabs, Muslims, marauding Hispanics, people of color from Haiti or Guatemala, storming our border, the LGBTQ community, transgender children who uh, want to use the wrong bathroom, uh, different, different evil, sinister enemy every day. This is, this is by definition, fascism. Despite great outside dangers, our biggest threat remains the sick, sinister and evil people from within our own country. Part of the fascist playbook is to create an alternative universe, uh, to confuse the people uh, who follow you and not uh, make it so they can't think straight. It's not just lying, it's purposely confusing so you are then able to create your own myths about yourself and about America. Here he is attacking Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman, who's running for Senate. And uh, here's uh, what he says about inherited money. Donald Trump. He is a spoiled and entitled socialist loser who leached off his parents money you know he lives on the parents money so fetterman slept on his parents couch he wasn't given a quarter of a billion dollars by his father and then blew it all like trump but he's creating an alternative universe this is right out of the fascist playbook somebody is coaching him i, I think it's steve bannon this is right out of the playbook. Karl Rove taught Republicans, you win by identifying your opponent's strength and then destroying their strength. So John Kerry in 2004 was uh, won, I think he won, uh, was awarded a Purple Heart in Vietnam. The problem was for Bush in 2004, George Bush was AWOL. He was in the Champagne Unit, National Guard, hiding out, didn't want to fight in Vietnam. Big problem for George W. Bush. He was a draft dodger. Not only that, he was AWOL. 
was running against John Kerry, who served in Vietnam and came back and criticized the war and returned his medals. But he was a, a veteran, a real veteran. Karl Rove taught Republicans attack his strength. And he swift, they call it swift boating, John Kerry. By, by the time the election poll, uh, by the time uh, November came about, uh, enough Americans believed that John Kerry was not a hero in Vietnam. And, uh, uh, you know, and lied about his service. That's the Rove. Uh, that's how Rove does it. It's go after their strength. Trump, a little different. What is my weakness? Accuse the opponent of my weakness. So you end up accusing Fetterman of leeching off his parents. He is a spoiled and entitled socialist loser who leached off his parents money and you know, he lives on the parents money amazing uh so here you have donald trump saying it's wrong to live off your parents money obviously he wants to uh double the estate tax right he's against inherited money is that what is that the message then he calls fetterman a drug addict decriminalization of illegal drugs including heroin cocaine crystal meth and ultra lethal fentanyl and by the way he takes them himself he says fetterman takes those drugs himself and he knows this for a fact because don jr claims he sold those drugs to him uh well the midterms are in 63 days and that was Donald Trump campaigning Saturday in Pennsylvania for Dr. Oz and Mastriano. Uh, Mastriano was running for governor. We'll get to him in a second. But Dr. Oz is a scientist. He's a heart surgeon. And he is making fun of his opponent, Fetterman, for having a stroke. He made some jokes about he should have tried some vegetables. He doesn't eat properly. And now he's taunting Fetterman because Fetterman doesn't want to debate him. And here he is. Uh, here's Oz. Look at the woman behind him as he makes light of Fetterman's stroke. Watch the woman behind Dr. Oz. John Fetterman. <laughs> challenged Mr. Fetterman to a debate. You've been following all the news on this. I'm empathetic. I'm a doctor. I understand how sure, difficult it is sure. when you've had a stroke. Sure, yeah. I've asked him to work with us to find out some way for him to answer questions, but he hasn't come forth and wanted to talk about it. And I think for democracy to work, you have to answer questions, right? Here's a question. Why are you such an asshole? Uh, well, Oz is anti-stroke. Uh, watch the woman, and this is why I think this is going to be the year of the woman. This election, why it's to our to his left, our right. Watch her reaction when he brings up the stroke. Women, I mean, to traffic in stereotypes, women identify bullies. They they know uh, mean men and frauds. And watch this woman, her reaction when he brings up the stroke. It, it takes like a second or two for, realize, for her to realize what Dr. Oz said, because let's face it, she's at a Trump rally. <laughs> Things take a little while for it to sink in. There's that little delay. Uh, so give her a second to, to actually realize what Dr. Oz just said and watch her reaction. I understand how difficult it is when you've had a stroke. I've asked him to work with us to find out some way for him to answer questions, but he hasn't come forth and wanted to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, she, she's like, oh my God. This is why I think women, they humor their boyfriends and show up to these Trump rallies. They know who Trump is. 
they know exactly they know how dangerous and they know who Dr. Oz is he's he's got an ice cold speculum well Dr. Oz despite that woman uh being appalled was doing pretty well uh it was going really well for him watch and then he then he said something to the poorly educated and it did not look good So your homework assignment. By the way, uh, it's still going. That's not frozen. That that is literally Dr. Oz realizing he just said the dumbest thing possible to the dumbest people possible. He used the words homework assignment. That's him. This is it's still rolling. That's just him frozen, realizing he just lost the election. Uh, yeah so Pennsylvania there is a a trial going on right now it's hard to believe but it's been four years since the uh the synagogue in Pennsylvania was shot up uh someone with a an AR-15 no surprise and three handguns shouting anti-semitic slurs open fire inside a synagogue in Pittsburgh and he killed 11 people 11 Jews wounded four police officers and two others this rampage has been described as the deadliest attack against the Jewish community ever in the United States and that trial is going on now it's been four years his trial is going on we're talking about the tree of life synagogue right and uh they're doing uh they're picking the jury right now attorneys this is from the uh Pittsburgh uh, I don't know the name of the paper I apologize this is from a Pittsburgh paper attorneys for the man accused of killing 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill nearly four years ago want permission to ask potential jurors about their religious affiliation uh partly because uh they want Catholics on the on the jury because Catholics do not believe in the death penalty we're talking about the Tree of Life synagogue shooting the worst attack ever on the Jewish community any Jewish community in American history Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania has uh someone running for governor named Shapiro and uh he's running against someone named Mastriano that's the governor's race Mastriano was at the January 6 uh insurrection and we'll get to him in a second but again this is MAGA this is what fascists do here is Marjorie Taylor Greene who spoke at the rally in Pennsylvania she opened for Dr Oz Marjorie Taylor Greene is a self-avowed Christian nationalist and I say it proudly we should be Christian nationalists right maybe you didn't hear that so I'm going to play it again because these are what are called anti-semitic dog whistles uh this is her I believe this was her at CPAC saying it was about a month ago saying that the Republican Party should identify as the party of Christian nationalists uh, we need to be the party of nationalism and I'm a Christian and I say it proudly we should be Christian nationalists and that is something you're not supposed to get caught saying you, you keep that secret but she said it out loud she believes the Republican Party should be the party of Christian nationalists in other words if you're a Muslim a Jew a Buddhist Hindu Sikh uh, Shinto whatever uh, not your country at least not your party that's what she repeatedly says and a lot of people at CPAC and turning points said the Constitution was written by Christians this is a Christian nation 
So these are dog whistles. Lee Atwater, in his deathbed confession, talked about this. He said, you know, you can't use the N-word anymore. Lee Atwater was a right wing. He got George Herbert Walker Bush elected president using the Willie Horton ads, which very racist. He said, times have changed. We can't use the N-word anymore. So what we say is busing, uh, things like that. But it's still playing. It's a dog whistle that play, that plays to racists. They know what you're saying. We can't say it, but we know what you're saying. So remember, all this as the Tree of Life synagogue, synagogue trial is going on. This is the dog whistles that uh, that the Republicans are employing, deploying in Pennsylvania, where Pittsburgh is. Andrew Torba is the founder of Gab. It's uh, an online, kind of like Twitter for racists. The shooter uh, at the Tree of Life, the guy who shot up the Tree of Life, was on Gab. He explained himself uh, why he was killing all these Jews on Gab. And it has very lax policies uh, uh, when it comes to racism, homophobia, misogyny. It is the platform for neo-Nazis, white nationalists, uh, the alt-right. Here is one of his tweets. This is Andrew Torba on June 4th. Good morning. Reminder that we are going to deprogram 150 years of Zionist theological and cultural indoctrination and do our own indoctrinating of the next generation at the same time. What has been started cannot be stopped. Uh, God wins. God wins. Here he is. Uh, here is Andrew Torba who are atheists. We don't want people who are Jewish. This is an explicitly Christian movement because this is an explicitly Christian country. So no, we don't want people who are atheists. We don't want people who are Jewish. This is an explicitly Christian movement because this is an explicitly Christian country. Okay, so that's Andrew Torba. He is... Uh, he started Gab, and he says things like, quote, this is a Christian nation. This is how he deploys dog whistles uh, to spew anti-Semitism. He, he has said, quote, this was in July of this year. This is a Christian nation. Christians outnumber you by a lot, a lot. And we're not going to listen to 2%, right? 2%, he's not talking about milk. He's talking about Jews. Jews make up 2%. That's a dog whistle, right? We're not going to listen to 2%. You represent 2% of the country, okay? We're not bending the knee to the 2% anymore. Okay. Let's talk about Pennsylvania uh, candidate for Senate, uh, uh, for governor, Doug Mastriano. His Gab account, he shut down last month, right? He was on Gab, and he paid the Gab guy, Torba, $5,000 for consulting services. And uh, again, this is the website used by Robert Bowers, who is right on trial right now in Pennsylvania for killing 11 uh Jewish Americans at the Tree of Life Synagogue four years ago. The trial's going on right now, right? And uh, here is Doug Mastriano, right? Hired this guy from Gab. Here he is speaking about uh, Health and Human Services, Dr. Levine, uh, a Jew, last name Levine, also a transgender person. A lot of you have probably seen her picture. And uh, Doug Mastriano uh, brings up Levine and everybody seems to know who Dr. Levine is because Dr. Levine is 
a transgender uh, person. So here he is talking about Levine. Levine. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> Levine. Levine sent the sick back into homes, killing thousands of our elderly. Found out that was a bad idea and stuck mommy out while our moms and dads were left to die alone. They don't want to talk about Shapiro. Right? Levine and Shapiro. This was at the Trump rally. Levine and Shapiro. These are dog whistles. Putting the name Levine up against Shapiro. He's running against the Attorney General Shapiro. Who did nothing, who didn't lift a finger to help your loved ones. You know, my opponent has been the Attorney General for six years and the guy's a big failure. On his watch, crime has gone up 37%. Murders has doubled. We're the 12th worst homicides in the nation. Fentanyl deaths, number four worst in the nation. Shame on him. He ignores the horrors of sex, tra sex trafficking while he advances his own political fortunes. Fortunes. He wants to roll back 50 years of women achievements in sports by having men dominate girls' teams. That's extreme. Like the elitist that he is, Shapiro elitist for school choice for himself, but not for us. He's like that guy in, uh, at Seinfeld, you know, no soup for you, no school choice for you. Uh, he sued, soup. Shapiro yeah, okay. sued. So MAGA hates black people. It hates uh, the Chinese. It hates the LGBTQ community, it hates Muslims, it hates women, and it hates the Jews. Classic, classic fascist politicking. Classic. Marjorie Taylor Greene spoke. Now, she's the Christian nationalist. And notice what she does here. She talks about Fetterman, who is running against Dr. Oz, right? Is Fetterman Jewish? I don't know. Fetterman kind of sounds like it's a Jewish last name. Not, not certain about it. Shapiro, we know, is a Jewish last name, but Shapiro is running against uh, uh, Mastriano for governor. Uh, she's there to uh, drum up support for Dr. Oz. So she uses, uh, look how she uses anti-Semitic dog whistles. You can't send a man to the Senate named Fetterman that loves Bernie Sanders communist policies. Oh no, he will destroy this country. You have to elect a governor, Doug Mastriano, to protect Pennsylvania. Right, you bring up, you bring up Bernie, right? Shapiro, all dog whistles. Bernie is a, is a, a dog whistle, right? Doug Mastriano? Levine. Back to you. Yeah. This is classic politicking from the fascist playbook. Also speaking at the Donald Trump rally was Cynthia Hughes. She is the leader of a support group for January 6th defendants. And Donald Trump has said that he will pardon everybody who invaded the Capitol on January 6th, and he's going to give them money, right? Uh, here is Cynthia Hughes. She is the leader of a support group uh, for January 6th defendants. Here she is talking about her, her nephew. He went to the nation's capital to hear his president speak. He dressed in a suit and tie and his favorite hat. Tim wanted to take part in what he thought was going to be a historical event. Instead, he witnessed a horror show. Hmm, very sweet woman. And everybody deserves habeas corpus. And Timothy Hale Cusinelli has not been released and it's unfair. He's been held for almost two years and uh, a Trump elected judge is keeping her nephew 
in jail for his activities on January 6. Uh, this is Judge Trevor uh, McFadden, and this is what he said, uh, why he's keeping him, uh, her nephew, uh, Cynthia Hughes's nephew, behind bars until his trial. This is a Trump-appointed judge. I'm very concerned about the statements after January 6, suggesting that the defendant is looking forward to a civil war. Uh, every judge, he went on to say, is afraid of releasing somebody who then goes crazy. Well, after the rally on Saturday, the Justice Department released a picture of Cynthia Hughes's nephew, Timothy Hale Cusinelli, who uh, was arrested at uh, the January 6 insurrection. And this is what he looks like. These are pictures of Timothy Hale Cusinelli, uh, who seemed, I guess he's young. And, you know, when I was young, uh, I couldn't grow a, a, a real mustache. Apparently, he can only. <laughs> only grow a, a a Charlie Chaplin mustache underneath his nose. That's him uh, making uh, Nazi uh, hand gestures with his uh, Adolf Hitler mustache. Uh, that's MAGA. That's MAGA. That's who they are. They hate the Jews. They spread conspiracy theories about the Jews, about Islam, about the gay mafia, and they end up getting people killed. It's politicking. This is how they politic. And what MAGA does, what Trump and the Republicans do, once they get into office, I don't know how they rule. I don't know if they're Orban, I don't know if they're Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Orban in Hungary, I don't know if they're Mussolini, God forbid, Hitler, but the politicking is straight from the fascist playbook, and it gets people killed. For this kind of politicking to go on while the trial for the gentleman who shot 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill near Pittsburgh, for this to be going on, for the Republicans to be doing these kind of dog whistles in the state of Pennsylvania, they are the enemy. They really are the enemy, and they are fascists. And Joe Biden was wrong for calling them semi-fascists. They are full-blown fascists. They're violent. They are violent white Christian nationalists, and they're getting people killed. You are listening to The David Feldman Show. I hope you vote. I hope everybody, especially women, I hope women vote come midterms, because this party hates women, and you know it. So even if you're in a relationship with a MAGA or a Republican, keep it to yourself. Don't tell it that you're voting for a Democrat, but these people are the worst of the worst. Please welcome, from show business, Dave Cyrus. Hello, Dave Cyrus. Sorry to keep you waiting. I, I, I know you were very busy. Yes. You were very busy talking. Yes, and we uh, don't have guests. No, so. and that's why I'm glad we didn't use my intro. But here's the thing. Uh, women, uh, MAGA does not hate women. They don't hate black people. They don't hate Jews. They only hate women, black people, or Jewish people who care about other black women or Jewish people. <laughs> if you're willing to not care about the rest of them, they will embrace you with open arms. It's the quickest way to get on TV. Right. Uh, is to become right. a MAGA Jewish woman or black person because they're just desperate for, you know, more uh, diversity as long as those people are anti-diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, this is what's happening right 
right now. I didn't give you a good. We've seen years this kind of stretch, kind of like probing. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're 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 breaking up. Let me give you a proper. Okay. Dave Cyrus is an Emmy winning comedy writer. Movies. He writes movies. SNL. He is the guy you call in Hollywood when you cannot get. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Anyway, um, so what I'm saying is that uh, basically what MAGA people have done for the last few years is they're like a toddler pressing boundaries. And, you know, it started out with everyone flocking around Trump because like, oh, someone finally said what we were thinking about Muslims and Latino people. And it was like they were so excited. Oh, I thought even the worst right wing politicians would even say that. But this one represents represents me just like we saw in that kentucky district that posted about jews you know the one i'm talking about where uh the kentucky uh, republican party in a t- kentucky city posted that the jewish junta so they just came out and said it because that was the whole point and that's what they're doing here is they're really just sort of testing and seeing how far we'll be able to get you know it's like that in the show the boys the superhero show that became a sort of trump metaphor this season where you know they basically show the supervillains thinking they had to hide the fact that they're supervillains and then come to the realization like Trump did like, oh, wait, I can you'll just accept me for whatever I do, <laughs> anything, right, anything I do. And it's a very interesting thing how that kind of happens where they always overestimated the morality of their fans. And so like Marjorie Taylor Greene, you'll notice how she wasn't as good at it as Mastriano because she's not as bright. Mastriano is using the name like oh, I didn't I don't know if it's a Jewish name or not. I just like saying the name where she says actually will say something like with a name like Fetterman. <laughs> and it's like, you're not smart enough to do this, honey. Right. That's like that's right. No, there's no other explanation of why you would have said it that way. Also, by the way, Fetterman, as far as I understand, I thought I read that he was Christian. It's one of yeah. those names that could be either way, uh, though. Wayne Fetterman, uh, who I do like the guy, does kind if he is Jewish, he does look like someone who just pretended to be Jewish to find out where our meetings are. Uh, I love Wayne Fetterman, but that's 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 part of what's great about him. It's like he looks like a it's John Fetterman. You're talking about Wayne Fetterman. (laughs) Sorry, I'm I know Wayne Fetterman. I I don't know why my brain did that. Sorry. Yes, John Fetterman. I kept saying that's that's really funny. Um no Wayne Fetterman, fantastic comedian. Sorry. But no, John Fetterman, I mean it's great because John Fetterman looks like he's in the Hells Angels, and Wayne Fetterman looks like your you know, your podiatrist. Wayne, fantastic. Uh, and, and that's what she was playing with when she said, you can't elect somebody named Fetterman. Yeah. Which, well, what, but, she did, but she didn't say Shapiro. Well, she, no, Shapiro is like another, it, you know, one of those famous Jewishish names. Right. So um, Fetterman, she was, she could, she could, she, it was safe. But then she brings in Bernie. Right. Right. I mean, look, it's not exclusively about them being Jewish. I think they're just it's, playing. They're playing with the the way that they know that crowd will react because they don't want to go too far because the last thing they want is to just say you guys hate the jews right because then they would actually cheer some a lot Mm -hmm. would they have to just make it everything about maga is always about playing with reality to the point that it's like i could say something a certain way where you can't legally say i said this but everyone i want to hear one thing will hear it Right. And it's just a very lazy kind of cowardly way of getting your ideas across. But that's what it is. And, you know, people are really angry at Jews and women and Latinos and uh, Middle Eastern people and gay people. Like, they're just mad at everyone who makes them feel, one, like they're not special, but also like they have something to be sorry for. And that's the weird thing about, like, this anti-critical race theory, anti every kind of wokeness. It's just this weird thing where it's like, you know what? I'm a white man. I don't hate myself because I accept that certain things are the way they are and that their privileges exist and that we live in a certain kind of country. I don't know why they're so sensitive that they can't hold in their brain the idea that white people have certain privileges. We have a country that's not 100% fair, but also that doesn't mean that you personally are a monster. Or that anyone thinks you're a monster. You can just like you can just accept, hey, 
maybe you got a little bit a little bit more than you deserved at some point. It's not a reason to jump off a building. It's like, why are they such babies about this? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and also, as we said many times, it's because people who don't have anything, who are poor, who have been maligned by a system that, let's be fair, uh, isn't that great to poor white people either. If you're if you're not a have, if you're a have not, you know, it's not a great country. There's some advantages, but, you know, your life could very well suck, too. And they hate the idea that there was any head start because th right. that means you got a head start. You still lost the race. But, you know, being born poor is not easy in this country, no matter who you are. Right. And when you're born, uh, when, when you're suffering financially, you are taught who to hate as the right. song goes. You need to be taught who to hate in a very simplistic, very easy to understand mm -hmm. way. They don't want to deal with things that are because, look, the real answers to those questions are impossibly complex and no one wants to deal with that. They want to have a very simple way of thinking. It's the minorities or it's the Democrats or it's people who look oh, this way, look that way. It's just not that many people are equipped to live in the complexity of the world we have right now. And that kind of sucks. And I feel bad for them because, you know, a it's, lot of MAGA is about it, fascism it, because it's the, it's the simplest way to think. Fascism right. is just the simplest way to try to process reality. What is the connection? Because you've studied this stuff way years before QAnon, you were fascinated with conspiracy theories. Yes, absolutely. What is the connection between fascism and conspiracy theories and racism, misogyny, Islamophobia? Okay. In, in my opinion, because I'm not an expert, I'm just someone who's been into this for many years. I think the connection between fascism and conspiracy theories is that they both seek to put an artificial sense of order on a world that is chaotic and right. that has that is filled right. with things you cannot know. So right. both fascism and conspiracy seek to put very, very simple answers to all of life's questions. And they usually dovetail because fascism uses conspiracy. Fascism is based around the idea that the majority is being persecuted by a minority. It's a very sort of dumb kind of ideology that just relies on the idea of if you could just tell most people to hate a small number of people, you just won over most people right. and you made the majority, which fantasizes about being a persecuted minority for some reason, uh, feel like they're the victim and they love and everyone wants to be a victim these days, right. uh, you know, especially people in power. They want to act like they're victims. So I think and so conspiracies do the same thing where they tell you that the way that they tell you that, well, all these bad things you're afraid of, they don't have complicated answers. It's the Jews or the Rothschilds, or uh, George Soros, whatever word you want to use because you're afraid of saying Jew. Right. Or it's black people that mm -hmm. the Jews are putting in your jobs, or that, or the Jews are bringing people from Mexico and Guatemala to take your job, or, they're, or they want to turn your kids trans. Like, basically, it's everything that you could imagine if someone was, as, was trying to figure out how the world works as quickly as possible, what they might come up with. And it's, it's for the purpose of relaxing one's brain to let them simply think, oh, I don't have to think about this. It's so simple. I feel like a genius now because I figured it out. But all these idiots, and that's the other thing about conspiracies. A conspiracy theory is a way to make someone in five minutes think they're smarter than someone with a doctorate. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they could spend five minutes learning about something, and as long as they make themselves believe that this is information that the educated don't have, they suddenly get to feel superior to people that they've always hated they feel inferior to. Exactly. It's, it's a way of living in a false reality that makes you feel better than other people, so which good. which is another way that fascism works, because we talk about fascism in a literal sense. We say, well, Trump didn't literally kill everyone and take over by force. Right. But he used the fascism playbook in terms mm -hmm. of how to run for office. There's a yeah. lot of things about fascism that aren't just having power that you took it. And it is very interesting how it's such a cynically childish ideology to say, I'm going to find a way of getting the majority of people to hate a group of people we don't have to worry about, a group of people small enough that if we killed them all, it wouldn't stop society from functioning. They're simply nothing more than an expendable target because we need someone to hit here. Right. Right. Not to discount. I mean, I think Hitler genuinely, I mean, I'm not making a joke here. Uh, 
I think Hitler genuinely <laughs> hated the Jews. And he I, did. Think, I think Trump is a poser. I think I think he's just yes. hateful. No, that's true. He doesn't. Um, I don't I think, think he likes the Jews. I don't think he likes. But I don't think he cares that much. Right. He just wants to make money, which is why fascism, as you just said, is what you use. To, it's a playbook for gaining power and keeping power, but not yes. necessarily the ends. It is the means for for power and keeping power. But then whatever you decide to do with the power, it's up to you. Yeah. Hitler did hate the Jews, but Hitler was also very deranged. Hitler, uh, for a lot of things. As opposed to Trump, who is the picture of mental health. I think it's different kinds of crazy. I think Trump, I think Hitler was probably a more of a schizophrenic, paranoid type. And Trump is clearly a malignant narcissist, probably bipolar. And um, unlike Trump, Hitler knew something about architecture. Yeah. Well, Hitler, you know, and by the way, if there, I don't like to praise Hitler a lot, but if there's one thing that I think his fans should have learned from him, it's that don't grow the mustache unless you can grow the mustache. Not that many people can grow the center of that hair right there. Right. And the number of Hitler wannabes who just settle for having two tiny strips on either side of their of their nose. Guys, I know you're Hitler fans, but have a little dignity. Now, how easily do you get scared? There are one of the conversations I had with an old boss who was a racist, didn't know it, uh, a bigot. Uh, I said, have you ever been scared for how you were born? And he said, I don't know what that means. I said, exactly. Well, I mean, for Jews, sorry about that. There's some construction uh, for the Jews. I think we have a sort of historical fear. You know, we have a fear that comes from history more so than other minorities of today, because like a Jew, like like an Irishman, you have the ability to hide for the most part. Sorry, hold on. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. He Sorry. just he just disappeared. Uh, Sorry, someone in the other room. I'm uh, reading sorry. a book about Crystal Knocked right now. Mm hmm. You know, I went to a, I went to I went to high school with a girl with that name. Crystal Knocked. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what her. I, I honestly think her parents didn't realize it, and 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 she broke the glass ceiling. I understand. Yeah, uh, but yeah, Crystal knocked. Um, I'm. I actually. Well, Crystal knocked. I'm not as much of an expert as as the light. The night of long knives, just because of I recently read about that, and that I didn't know how much that was about gay people. That the light of the night of the long knives was basically about getting the gay people out of government in Germany, because before World War II, it was the best place in the world to be gay. Exactly. Craziest thing. It's unbelievable. I, I was. I'll send you a paper I read. I'd love about, to read this. It's really about er, Ernst Rome, yeah. who was openly gay, had no problem being gay, and Hitler would visit him, and Hitler had no problem with homosexuals, and then all of a Not sudden, at all. He was his best friend. Yeah. I actually recently read a screenplay by a friend of mine uh, about that Ernst, Ernst Rome. Rome. It's the. It honestly, it's one of the best screenplays I've ever read. I swear I, to you, I read. I've been trying to get it made because it's I, so funny. It is one of the funniest things. And I, I would love to. I don't want to give away anything about it, but it is genius. I what swear he, to you, I read. I, I thought the same. I thought this would make Ernst Rome's life would make such an amazing. I wanna, I'll send you the screenplay because I was so impressed by it. It's from a friend of mine who's never written professionally. Uh, yet, and I want so badly for her to get this made. It well, why don't we just put our names on it? And insanely we, funny script. Why don't we just steal it from her? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure Hollywood would let us. Yeah, why don't we just put our names on it? They'll yeah. say, you didn't write anything in the script. I go, I wrote my name on it. Yeah, that That's is how it works. Quickly, uh, I, we, we have to go UFC very quickly. I know, I know you like, I know you don't, you know, you're not a big fan of the UFC. Now, I want to be fair. I don't like Dana White. I don't I agree with you about I hate the way they monopolize the way that they want everyone to spend thousands of dollars a year to watch their fights. You know, I don't like I'm not going to pay $100 to watch a fight. I'll go to a bar and have dinner, you know, so so I can just pay for the dinner and watch it or something. But here's the thing, David, I fully support the fighting sports. I fully believe in combat sports for a very specific reason. It's a freedom thing to me. I don't want people forced to fight anyone. And I don't want people fighting in bars, fighting strangers. I think there are certain people in this world who are born to fight. 
I think there are certain people in this world who, if they lived in a different century, would have been gladiators, would have been giant stars in their world. And I think that, you know, if you're the kind of person who that's what your drive is, that's what your, that's what your passion is. And you and another person want to sign a piece of paper that says, these are the rules. This is what we're going to do. This is, we know exactly what we're going into. I honestly, I don't have a problem with it. I think that boxing or jujitsu or mixed martial arts are noble because they're people who maybe weren't going to be doctors, maybe weren't going to be executives. Maybe this is what they truly want in life. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I want people to have to do this to get out of poverty or, you know, anything like that. I'm just saying that I, I fought, you know, I I've trained in fighting. I thought it was exciting. I never wanted to actually fight like professionally or, or like get punched in the face by someone who's trying to kill me. But I just thought, no, this is, this is interesting. I'm interested in the sport. This is, you know, it's life and death. It goes back millions of years. And uh, I know you were talking about the Paulo Costa, Luke Rockhold fight where Luke Rockhold, who was bleeding profusely out of his face after three rounds of getting the crap beaten out of him, finally got on top of Paulo Costa and proceeded to wipe his bloody face all over Paulo's face. Now, here's the important point that you forgot about that. If you watch that fight, Paulo is laughing. He was laughing about the fact that Luke was that doing makes, this. That makes it even worse. <laughs> and I'll tell you why he was laughing, because that was Luke Rockhold's final fight ever. That was his retirement fight. He's a former champion and he was getting destroyed. He was getting completely tooled out there. And in the last few seconds of that fight, he had the upper hand and he says, I know I'm not going to win this fight. I know I'm not going to be able to walk out of here a champion again but I'm going to rub my bloody face all over yours, your pretty goddamn face. And it was like, look, it wasn't classy, but it was between the two of them. I, I think. Paul so you're understood. a bad person. So you yes. are. A bad I thought it was you're fun. immoral. I thought it was kind of funny. You're immoral. You're no, I mean, when I was a little kid, I liked wrestling. And when That's I realized fake. That's fake was, violence. right when I was a little kid and then when I got older, I liked mixed. I liked martial arts. I was in, I, I practiced it. And then when I got a little bit older, that's when but, mixed but martial, mixed arts, martial arts, but mixed martial arts. I practiced both. Yeah. You don't and think you don't think it's human cockfighting? Absolutely not. No, no. Mm. I think that it is a very complex sport. Uh, there's a reason it has so many rules and there's a reason that it's so predictable by the athletes because these are not people just killing each other. And also, and, there's no, and, there, and, and the papers that my listeners are sending me uh, showing evidence of CTE. You know what? I don't want to lose. I already lost one guest and you were doing so well. Right. No, it's like, look, we're not losing anything here. Look, I absolutely believe that boxers, football players and mixed martial artists will have uh, evidence of CTE at some point. So you're I, a I horrible totally human being. That. You're a horrible no. human being. Here's the thing about UFC. Someone dies boxing every year, right? No one's ever died in the UFC. No one's even ever had a permanent debilitating injury. The worst injuries you see in the UFC are shin breaks, which are disgusting, but the person usually walks a year later. And personally, we'll if I was a fighter, I would not throw leg kicks. I don't want anyone to die, but it's like, at some point, we have to say, how much are we going to stop people from, Should, from engaging? Do you in, think in, you know, what they what they choose to? to make here's what we'll do. You'll come back and we'll, we'll argue this uh, like gentlemen yeah, with I, our fists, with our yeah. fists. Yes. That's, Marcus of Queensberry. But I want to uh, like this. I, I'm, I'm going to call Howie Klein while I'm doing that. Brag to me about all the great things that are going on in your life. Oh, I wish I could. Um, but I will say this. I oh. think that, you know, I, I was more of a jujitsu guy. I believe in grappling. And grappling is the more gentlemanly of the sport, I'd say. What is grappling? Grappling is wrestling with choking and uh, locks. It was the locks? joint locks. Did you say locks? Yes. Joint locks were created uh, centuries ago as a way of combating people in armor. When okay. you had we armor, have to wrap, we have to wrap. Someone was wearing armor that could not be pierced with a weapon. They learned how to break their bones in their armor okay. as a, a part of war. All right. I Dave, just, follow Dave. I want to throw you off the show. For okay. Support, just because it will feel good. 
Okay. You'll come back next week. Are you, you're always working. I am. It's, it's a lot. I hate your success for so many reasons. That Dave means a lot. Cyrus, follow him on, on Twitter. And what should we plug? There's so much to plug. I don't know. Dave Cyrus, S-I-R-U-S is my social media. Watch his movie, The King of Staten Island. And there are all these other shows that they're, I don't even know where to begin. Yes. Look up Triumph the Insult Comic Dog on your wherever you get podcasts. Yes. Thank you, Dave Cyrus. All right. Thank you. Let us now go to Hollywood, California, where Howie Klein. Hollywood. Not, I don't live in Hollywood. Let's go to San Diego, California, where Howie. Los Feliz. <laughs> or all Los Angeles. Los Feliz or Los Angeles. Your choice. Let's go to Los Feliz, California, where yes. Howie Klein is standing by. He's back. He writes the Down with Tyranny column. Everybody should read him over Down with Tyranny. And he is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for left wing candidates around America. Welcome, sir. So great to hear you. Oh, good. Well, I was back last week. I know, but it's always great to hear you. (laughs) Can we talk about Chile uh, and what happened? because it was looking good for a while. They had a billionaire uh, president, I think his name was Pinheiro, and there was, they took to the streets two years ago. It was people power and everyone agreed that there would be a new uh, constitutional convention and the people who went to the convention were not professional politicians. It was young people and a lot of leftists and they came up with a beautiful people's convention that, that shook off the Pinochet era convention. And it was, you write, resoundingly defeated. It was more like a, something that you would expect from like a student union or, or just like a college uh, exercise in writing a convention. It wasn't, unfortunately, what they didn't do was bring along the grassroots. I mean, this new president who's a left winger was an activist. Where was the activism? Where was the organizing? They didn't do it. So they, they had all of these, you know, hard, in some cases, hard to understand for just a normal middle class person where they were going with some of this stuff. Some of it was easy to understand, like Medicare for all. They, you know, they did a, their version of that. But a lot of it was, uh, was, was too weird. Now, it wasn't in reality too weird, but it, was, it, it sounded too weird. And they didn't bring the population, they didn't bring half the population along with them. So it was defeated. It was defeated about about 60, 40, a little more than 60, a little less than 40. So a terrible defeat. It wasn't unexpected. All of the polling showed it was going to be defeated. And yet the left uh, didn't do the right thing. And and the reason I wrote about it, by the way, is because there is, a. I mean, first of all, I like to follow Chile and write about things like about that have to do with Chile, but there's more to it than that. And that was the next post that I, that, I, that went up after this post. And that post is about how the right, especially the right, is advo- is not just advocating, but agitating for a constitutional convention because they want to, God knows what they want to do. I mean, Santorum is carrying on. We've got to go back to the original founders' um, uh, values, which I hope he doesn't, he's not including slavery mm-hmm. or women not being able to vote, but oh, God only knows what he's, what he's including. And, and some on the left, are thinking, well, we want to have a constitutional convention so we can outlaw handguns or, or all guns and so that we can uh, get rid of the Senate. You know, Chile got rid of their Senate, too, for the same reasons that we want to get rid of our Senate. It didn't work there, and I don't see it working here either. I, would I like to see the Senate gone? You bet I would. Uh, is that going to happen? No. It's much more. What would much be much more likely to happen would be a really dangerous right-wing takeover uh, with them – trying to institute their own agenda. And in the U.S., it's not the same thing as in, um, as in Chile. There, once they came up with their, uh, their new constitution, there was a plebiscite. That's not the way it works here. They come up with their, uh, their some crazy new constitution, and then they, they have a, w- a way of passing it uh, between the state legislatures, which is, a, I assume, assume, the way they would tr- uh, try to do it. So very, very dangerous. And all states are equal 
in the United States. So it's like, I think it's two thirds of the state have to approve of uh, a new constitution. I'm not sure. I know it is with amendments. Right. So California counts as, as, as the right. same as uh, Wyoming. Right. Even though, you know, Wyoming has fewer people in my neighborhood. Right. We're stuck with this constitution, aren't we? Because if well, we had a what, constitution. What, what Russ Feingold wrote, wrote about is that there are ways to, uh, you know, to make it better. And that we should, that's what we should concentrate on. Not, a, not having a constitutional convention, but trying to make the constitution better, uh, you know, for example, with uh, amendments to the constitution. Right. I, do I see that happening? No, I don't. Right. right. But you know what? What I use as an example of how we can all work together, maybe not Republican leadership, but Republican voters. Uh, um, so the question was, was asked, uh, do you think that um, the federal government should enforce wage uh, time time uh, time and a half wages, overtime wages, in other words, and uh, you know just gigantic gigantic majorities of Democrats and Republicans agree that yes we should. So we should you know maybe a way to start is to look to things where we where we have something in common, not to just go to to where you know there's complete disagreement and and it'll be so hard to get through. Like in other words, if we try to pass a constitutional amendment on gun control, that, that's a no starter. It's not gonna happen. You know, it's a, it's a great thing and we love it and it's fabulous and let's do it, but it can't happen. Whereas maybe something that has to do with, with things that they like as well, maybe even we can convince them that some of the good things that we're for, they would like too. But we've got to do that work. It's, it's not going to be just passed because we want it to pass and because, you know, people who are on the left want it to pass. We have to, we, it has to happen because the whole country agrees with it. Now, when I say the whole country, I don't mean the, the you know, the crazy ideological extremists. I'm not talking about that. But we still have to have a big, solid chunk of Republicans. I, I don't have the post in front of me. Maybe you do. Mm -hmm. But what was the percentage of Republicans who wanted to see uh, overtime pay uh, uh, enshrined in law? Let me uh, bring it up. Hang it's on. at the very it's at the very bottom of the post. My uh, and it was I, it was like nearly seventy percent or something, right? Um, let me. Change is the oxygen of a vibrant democracy. It is also a double-edged sword. Let me go to the bottom. Uh, yes. bum, 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 bum. Uh, the chart. Yes, Republicans, fifty-six percent. Or no, no that, that's that's what feel strongly about it. But but there's oh, another 70, twenty-nine percent. Seventy-six percent. Seventy-six percent. Right. No, no. Eighty, eighty-five percent of Republicans agree. So that, and, and only nine percent of Republicans disagree. So we're never going to get that nine percent on anything. They're never going to. They're never going to come along, uh, and to hell with them. You know, they, you can't convince them. They're out of their minds. But on the other hand, look at this. Eighty-five percent of Republicans agree with ninety-one percent of Democrats. Because we've also got 5% of Democrats that don't agree. I don't know why they have D next to their names. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you'll have to explain that to me sometime. So if... Did you listen to Biden's speech today? Did I listen to who? Biden's speech today. Biden had another speech today? Yes, this was, this was very scary. He was, he was speaking, unless they were showing a rerun of something or, uh, you know, or, or just, just like trying to like be insane. But it was, he was... I don't know, whatever he, whatever they did to make him seem alive and vibrant the other night when he called the Republicans fascists, whatever that was that he was on, he should have been on that today. He was in, in Pittsburgh doing a Labor Day speech in front of a bunch of union workers. And wow, is he boring? I mean, he, he kept promising, he, I'm not going to go on much longer. And then he kept on going on much mm -hmm. longer. But at one point he slipped up and he said, you know, when I was in Delaware, the reason I joined the Democrats, it was a Southern, it was a Southern Democrats. <laughs> He's going on about, what? The, about, yes, I mean, he was slipping up. I mean, he was telling the truth, but that's not what he meant to say. I mean, he started talking about how he joined the Democrats because he was active in civil rights. What he didn't say is that his activity in civil rights was to be against them. <laughs> right, right. It was such a bad speech. It was so terrible. 
But that's that's what we're, that's what we're stuck with. So you have a and, and I, I had dinner the other night with um, a guy who's the head of uh, PDA, uh, Progressive Democrats of America, and Alan and Minsky. Him, Alan Minsky. Oh yeah, Alan. You know Alan? Of course. On the show yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. So I said to Alan, "Do we have a candidate, a viable candidate for uh, president in 2024?" And he just looked at me and he said, "No." But we've. I'm old enough to have heard that, you know, uh, every election cycle. When I said viable, I meant progressives, by the way. I didn't mean Democrats. I oh, meant okay. progressives. But, but they do emerge. If, you know, if uh, Clyburn and Obama and the Clintons don't put their thumb on the scale and we have an actual... Well, what do you mean if they don't? Of course they will. But, I mean, what happened in 2020... That's what they do. <laughs> but that was because of what, COVID. That's what the Clintons... And- no, it's because that's what they do, because that's who they are. They are conservatives. They don't want a progressive, and they will not accept a progressive. So it's a, it's a, and, you know, the, the, I know one progressive who's going to run for president, whether Biden runs or not, and that's Marianne Williamson. I mean, that, that she's got a very, very steep uh, hill to climb to, to, you know, for even for the media to take her seriously. They don't want to, and she's going to have to prove it. Before they do, I know you love her, and what- I do. I love I love Marianne. She's fantastic, and she's been going around to not just to Iowa and New Hampshire, but to other states as well, and in, introducing herself to the uh, to Democrats, uh, you know, Democratic leaders and and committee men and people like that. And you know, I, I it's going to be very 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 hard for her uh, to uh, to get past a media that refuses to take her, her seriously and at every instance uh, tries to, uh, you know, insinuate that she's crazy and she's just about uh, yoga and incense. And that's, that's none of that's true. I mean, her, she was a Bernie surrogate. That's more true than, than that she's running around with beads. Bernie, highest favorability, I heard, highest favorability, of any politician in America. Could that and be- that's been the case year after year after year after year. So is he? Here's what I'm thinking. As I'm- no, he's, he's too old. He's not going to do it. He may be teasing it a little bit now, but he just in the end, he's just not going to do it. I, I wish it was otherwise. So Biden needs... But I hope I'm wrong. Biden needs Trump to stay out of prison so he doesn't get... A primary challenge. It would be considered unseemly to challenge Joe Biden with the threat of Donald Trump's reemergence, correct? There's a bunch of different ways uh, to look at that. But Biden has said himself that the, the what's, it, that what's pushing him to run for another term is the danger of Trump. But, you know, th- you know what doesn't make sense about that? You know, it doesn't take a lot to figure out that DeSantis is maybe more dangerous than Trump. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you think? You think this DeSantis is more dangerous than Trump? Well, let me, I was gonna, just going to ask you a similar question that I'd rather have you answer. If you get rid of Trump, does the fever break? Even with DeSantis, does this fever break within the Republican? No, it no. I mean, what, 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 no, they're not... Uh, you know, DeSantis is appealing to the same uh, kind of ignoramusy. Is that a word? I think it's well, ignorance. So maybe ignorance. I just call them <laughs> just call them Republicans. It's uh, okay. Uh, so he's appealing to the same kind of uh, backward, ignorant, uh, you know, uh, Marjorie Trader Green kind of perspective. You know that Marjorie Trader Green is now Trump's. Uh, opening act everywhere he goes. Yeah, she she goes to all of his shows, and she is the opening act. And they love her. They love her. Does I can that... imagine that she can run as vice president under uh, DeSantis. The the danger I run into is I ignore Trump. I try to ignore Trump on this show because everybody else is talking about him. At some point, though. It's like living in Italy and ignoring Mussolini or living in Hungary and ignoring Orban. It, it, you do have to recognize that he is, is he the worst threat to, politically speaking, the worst threat 
to our country? Or was it well, Nixon? Well, that's what I asked you. Or, or, well, he's much worse than Nixon. Or, 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 but what about DeSantis? I mean, what they say is, is that DeSantis is every bit as, as, uh, uh, as, as bad as, or as fascist as Trump. But he's got a he's got a uh, a brain or an IQ or or whatever you want to say it. Trump is stupid. He doesn't know. I mean, he's stupid in certain ways and he's canny in other ways. But basically, when it comes to politics, Trump's an, an idiot. And and DeSantis, even though I don't agree with him on anything, he's not stupid. I mean, Trump basically didn't go to school. I mean, all that lie about uh, Wharton that's just all bullshit. Right. Whereas uh, whereas DeSantis uh, did go to school and did well. Trump is an ignorant, an ignoramus who didn't go to school. Uh, is he corrupt, DeSantis? Who is DeSantis corrupt? Yeah, the monoclonal. My assumption would, my assumption would be he is as corrupt as he has to be. The monoclonal. I, I mean, no, no one is, no one is corrupt as Trump. That that, that can't exist. Every every breath he takes is corruption. There's never been anyone as corrupt as Trump in American politics ever, and there never will be anyone. As corrupt as Trump, it's impossible. What happens if he declares his candidacy within the next month? Uh, it's going to be harder to prosecute him. So, well, you know, because there are a bunch of, can I use the word pussies? That's what they are in, in the Justice Department and in the Biden administration. There's no rule that says they can't prosecute him, there's no rule that says they can't go and arrest him tomorrow. There's none. They can do they can do that, but they, right. but they're pussy. Right. right. They say it's a bad I, precedent. Yeah. Donald Trump. It's yeah, a bad yeah, precedent. It's a bad. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is breaking every precedent imaginable, but they don't right. want to break it. Right. It has the first first day in the White House. What happens if uh, I, I want to be delicate here? God does his patriotic duty with Trump. How about some some individual? No, 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 no. We can't talk that way. But let's just. No, we can. No, no, we can't. But I'm not going to advocate it. No, 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 no. Please, please, don't, don't. What is? What is? No, 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 no. All right, let's let's not talk about that. I can't. I cannot. What if someone went to went to went to Hitler? In 1925, and shot him between the eyes. In 1925? Yeah. I believe in law and the rules, and we have to... Yeah, so... so <laughs> no, that no! Put that person in jail. The person who did it, he's no, in jail. Stop. I don't want to get visited upon. All right, all right. Okay. Let's not talk. And it's, and it's my think, fault. Change the subject. But what, what, what would happen, though, if he said, folks, uh, I'm done? Yes, I, that's, I, my theory is that that's what this whole so-called prosecution is all about, to eventually make a deal with him that he's not going to run, right. which seems foolish because I think he'd be easier to beat than DeSantos. Okay. Uh, who, I mean, don't you think Trump would be easier to beat? I mean, you, if you look at the polls, he's not going to win. If you look at the polls, Biden is going to kick his ass. This is what we said in 2016. Like, you know, okay, so Malo- don't make it wrong. Your friend Maloney, who I know you love, the head of the DCCC, he's been bankrolling. Who, who, who's worse, Sean Patrick Maloney or uh, Hakeem Jeffries? <laughs> you tell me. The future speaker? I don't know. If I, if I knew, I would, I would tell you. They're both like they're both zero. You can't. You can't. So unless you want to go into the minus column, uh, you, you you can't say who's worse. Are the is 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 uh, Sean Maloney out of the DCCC admitting to funding MAGA in the Republican Party? Is he openly admitting that that's he doesn't use those he doesn't use those words, but but yes, he he does admit it. And don't... He, he says that they're that they're trying to set up weak candidates that Democrats can beat more easily than strong candidates. Right. So, is you know, that- one, of, one of the things that I uh, was uh, angry about all, all year is APAC. And we've talked about that on the show. Yeah. And one of, and one and APAC is funded by wealthy Republicans. That's where they get about 90 percent of their money. 
So I just saw for the first time, APAC has decided to jump into a Republican primary. This will be the first one for the entire year. All they've done was uh, go in against progressives for conservative Democrats, and they won almost all of them. They didn't win every one of them, but almost every one of them. So now, all of a sudden, they're in the New Hampshire primary, the last, the last primary, and they're trying to help this guy Morse, who is, you know, a hard, just a conservative. He's, he's an absolute Republican conservative all the way. But the guy he's running against is a Nazi, uh, Bulldog, Don Bulldog. And they, they're trying to help Morse win, win, the, uh, win the primary because Mor- Morse, they fig- figure, has a better chance to beat Maggie Hassan, the Democratic incumbent. Who I, I want, might add, add, since I have brought her name up just now. In New Ham- you're is, talking about New Hampshire. Is, yes, New Hampshire. Did I say something different? No, no, no. Okay, thank God. Anyway, uh, Maggie Hassan... I think is the worst Democrat running for re-election. She literally voted with the Republicans against the minimum wage. I I I can't get beyond that. I mean, she's bad on a lot of things. She's one she's one of the Democrats in the Senate who tends to vote with the Republicans. In fact, I just checked today. You you, you heard I'm sure about the um, this judge who who basically stopped the uh, the espionage investigation into Trump, right? With the special master. Right. It's not just that there's a special master. She told them no more. You can't investigate. You can't use any of that stuff anymore. So that's that. Unless they appeal it, which I hope they do. But so who who is she? You know, she she's she's a horrible, horrible person. Absolutely awful. And and good Democrats all voted against her confirmation. But Maggie Hassan didn't. Maggie Hassan, again, voted with the Republicans to confirm her. Anyway, I got off on a tangent there right. about Maggie Hassan, but I can't tell you how bad she is. What? And that was a tangent on a tangent. <laughs> right. How is the uh, Democratic Party looking in the House right now? Is it getting... It's 50-50. Unless you mean if they're, if, uh, how they're looking in terms of being... Keeping the uh, House. Nice people or horrible people. Oh, keeping the House. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah. All right. Yeah. Like I said, 50, 50. Okay. Tell me about our friend, Alan Grayson loss to a 25 year old. Uh, Again, when you, you, there is almost no one who can stand up to these billionaires uh, pushing money into their races. It, it's almost impossible. And that's what happened. All of a sudden out of nowhere, this uh, crypt, this conservative crypto billionaire, Sam Bankman fried uh, comes in with a million dollars. And, you know, that was it for Alan. Uh, so wh- what is this kid's name? He's 25. Uh, yeah, who, who, who cares? What Tucker name? Maxwell or something? What, what? I don't know. Yeah, Maxwell Alejandro something. Uh, let me get his name right. Hang on for one second. Mac, it's it's Mac, well, Maxwell Frost. So Maxwell, Maxwell Alejandro. Fa- right, right, Maxwell Frost. So the day that uh, he found out that uh, the, the billionaire is giving out money. That day, he started a cryptocurrency uh, advisory committee and put on a bunch of horrible assholes. That's, and that will tell you who Maxwell Frost is. doesn't matter what color T-shirt he's wearing. It doesn't matter uh, what he says about, you know, he's, you know, because what he says is like putting on a T-shirt. He'll say anything today, and, and then we'll see what happens when he gets into Congress. I hope I'm wrong about him, and it's possible that I am wrong about him. But he did call me twice to get a Blue America endorsement, and this was before Alan Grayson was in the race. And, uh, and I, li- I heard him out. I listened to what he said, and I, I walked away from both of those conversations saying, this guy is a complete phony. I know phonies. I've, been, I've run across them over and over and over again. I can tell when someone is full of crap, and he is full of crap. I think now, am I always right? No, let's see if, I, let's see, let's see, let's see in the future once he's sitting in a congressional seat and, and see what he's into, but already he's already hanging out with the bad end of the so-called progressives. He's already friends with uh, Richie Torres, who, who he put on his cryptocurrency uh, committee, a complete fraud and conservative and corrupt beyond belief. He's pals with Pocan. You can't get worse than that. I mean, so we'll see. We'll see. Before you go, 
We're talking with Howie Klein. He writes Down With Tyranny. Everybody should go to downwithtyranny.com. It oh, is, Alan must be listening. Is it possible people can be listening? I just got an email from Alan. Uh, can he be listening to yeah, us? I, I, on, uh, on YouTube. He could be watching us on YouTube. But uh, talk to me. It's Labor Day. And uh, there is, you write about New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and their new report on union drives this year. Do the Democrat, yes. do the Democrats get <laughs> any credit for the record number of applications for unions at the NLRB this year? It's not, uh, uh, no, Democrats get nothing. There are, there are some Democrats who get a, should get a lot of credit. But didn't I just tell you about Maggie Hassan? Yes. The parties that spent I'm, talking about Biden. On the race. I'm talking she about Biden. I'm talking about Biden. I'm talking about Biden. You think he's a sentient being? Uh, I love America. Is it wrong to love? Go watch, go watch his speech today, and you tell me if uh, Joe Biden is, is a sentient human being. Is it? Is it they wrong? Let him out on that, they let him out on the stage without, like, <laughs> I don't know what they do to make him seem like he's with it, but they didn't do it today. Is it wrong to root for my country? Is that is that no, is that all, foolish? Unless you're unless you we all accept the magazines, we all root for our country. Right. So is it wrong for me to root for Joe Biden, even though I wanted Bernie, even though I think Joe Biden is the worst man for the moment? Is it wrong for me to root for him? You can root for whoever you want, including root beer. <laughs> so you can if you want to root for Liz Truss, you can root for her. Is he is he doing? Is he, okay. There, there's. Do you like that guy? What's his name? Uh, uh, Pie. Pie. He he's an English, uh, I guess, comedian. I'm not certain he's a comedian, but he must be. But he um, he, he he works for the New York Times, and he writes this like absolutely hilarious stuff about about England. He's he's English. And he did, um, he did, he did one today on her. I, it, I have to send it to you. I mean, it's okay. just, uh, everyone who's listening should, should get it as well. Uh, it's not up on YouTube yet, but you can get it through the New York times. And the guy is just amazing. Lane. You, you would love him so much. He's like, you know, he's like you in a way. Okay. Lane, uh, who's going to be on later comes to us from CM England. He says, uh, it's Jonathan pie. So. Yes, Jonathan Pye, exactly. Speaking, what did I say? No, no, I, I don't think you mentioned his first name. Speaking of Pye, what are you making today for Labor Day? Ah, good question. So I'm <laughs> alone. Uh, you know, I got, a, I got an email today from someone who works for a campaign and who said his favorite part of, of the show is uh, when I talk about uh, recipes and food. I, I almost sent it to you, but I decided you probably have 20 people who write to you and tell, telling you don't let him talk about food no i no <laughs> i have anyway. no but no no it's it's the only i love talking about food with you it's just sometimes you just don't like it when i'm making it and and the sounds this, are going it through the gets phone, a right? little yes a little yeah well this is the thing roland is in uh new orleans eating at mother's uh you know fantastic uh, food he's just loving and i'm so i'm by myself so i'm just so there's a, a woman here called Marciella. And Marciella started uh, a vegan uh, butcher shop. That it, and it's not like that, like whatever that fake meat is, uh, yeah. the impossible meat. That, I wouldn't eat that if, if people paid me. I wouldn't eat that. So that stuff is garbage. She is a master. The stuff that she makes is so delicious. I could. Uh, what I'm going to eat tonight is a uh, pastrami sandwich. I could serve you a pastrami sandwich. And you would never, ever guess that it's completely plant-based. Really? You would never guess I wasn't serving you pastrami. Maciela is, Maciel's is in uh, Highland Park. And it's very far from where I live. It's a real schlep. And I go anyway because it's so amazing. Hang on. Uh, let me write this down because I want to tell my son about it. How do you spell it? Uh, M-A-C-I-E-L. Maciel. It's Maciel's Butcher Shop, I think they call it. And it's in Highland Park. Yeah. So it's a little, it's a little far, but it's, it's so good. It's just, it's worth the schlep. I mean, she has, she, has, she sells salami. 
She sells bacon. <laughs> you can buy packages of food to take home. And, wow. and no one's going to guess. You have a thing of salami, and you can hit someone over the head with it and then make a sandwich, <laughs> and they'll never guess it wasn't salami. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm, now I'm like salivating, thinking about the pastrami I'm going to eat in right. the oil. Before you go, how's the heat? It's so horrible. It's just absolutely horrible. Plus, we had a blackout for 20 hours. How about that? I, th so I didn't hear nothing. about that. Well, it wasn't the whole city, but um, we have, we have, if you look at the DWP map online, it shows all these little red spots all over the city. And one of those little red spots yesterday and the day before was my hill. And my hill was blacked out for 20 hours. Some people, they blacked out for three or four hours. Some people are still blacked out for more than 20 hours. So it's horrible. No AC, uh, no hot water. Uh, Did you loot? No, no lights. Did you Sorry. loot? No, I, I didn't loot. I went out to eat the fabulous restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I but I couldn't, go, I couldn't go by myself because my car was locked in my garage. Oi. Exactly. Oi. I love so, you. But, uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're uh, back. Friend, thank you. Uh, I am too. Should, yeah. we, should we have a guest? Yes. I, you know what? Here's, here's my, I promise you, I always say I'm going to call you. And I'm like the day after the show, I'm so exhausted. And I'm going to call you tomorrow and we'll talk and we'll set up some guests. But I don't want, did we have, I don't want to lose. We, did we or, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. Okay. Uh, you know, did we have, um, uh, now I can't remember his name. Never mind. We'll have we'll have good guests. Okay. There was some, you know, these are the people we're going to have on are the ones who already won their primaries and that are going up against Republicans, generally speaking, in um in November. In California, we have a little bit of a different situation because sometimes uh, there'll be two Democrats because they win in the primaries in the jungle primary, so there's no Republican at all. So we have we have a case like this with Angelica Duenas, who's very very interesting. She's on and the I show. Want to have her we, on. we had her on. But you brought her on. Very very. I bet, I bet I did. But something very very big is about to happen, which is a movie is going to come out that's going to be mind boggling. And I, what I want to do is time our uh, our uh, situation with uh, with Angelica for just when that movie is coming out. So our, our viewers can look at the movie and then they'll have Angelica to speak with. Fantastic. I will talk to you yes. tomorrow. Howie Klein. Good. We always say Howie, that. Howie, before you go, yes. this is David Cobb. I want to oh, also oh, encourage oh, you all to think about David. David Siegel in Rhode Island. Yes, he's, he's one of our candidates. By the way, David, let me introduce you again to Howie Klein because David didn't know your previous life as a ah. record uh, executive. Well, you know what? I'm in the middle of writing a memoir. And, and what I'm doing, I'm taking pages whenever I feel like it. Like I have one coming out tonight. I take the pages and I put them on my blog. So sometimes late at night, sometimes not that late. But, uh, and, and at the bottom, it, there, there are links. And, and if, if you click on the link that says Howie, you get all the pages. So, you know, like today, what did I write? I wrote about, uh, I wrote about a musical thing today. Uh, God, I Andy, just wrote, pa wrote Andy Paley is. No, that was, that was a few days ago. Andy Paley, cause that, and that comes from a, a Patti Smith song. She, in, in, he was in her, in her band when they played in 1976 in Sweden. And she's screaming, Andy Paley is a nigga in, in the song called rock and roll nigga. Anyway, uh, but today I wrote about, um, who would it? Who I wrote about another uh, music, musician that people were asking me about, uh, and I, wow, I can't remember it. This is what happens. I just spent like three hours <laughs> writing about this, and, and now I can't remember who it was. D David Cobb, tell Howie your connection to Howie. Well, I mean, it's not much of a connection because Howie uh, is clearly way more connected, but Howie. Uh, in the, uh, you remember late the 80s and early 90s, I actually served as a local uh, concert promoter and did a lot of shows in the uh, what would be considered alt music venue, basically, you know, uh, punk and the up and coming uh, uh that that genre right uh back in the the late 80s and early 90s so uh, i like it was it so like, rarely was comes up in my politics but what was, what was the venue 
uh, the venue in Houston, Texas was uh, Power Tools and Numbers uh, and the Vatican. Oh I, 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 not only do I know the place, I've been there many, many, many times. In <laughs> You're fact, kidding me. Houston, no, when we had bands playing in Houston, I always wanted to go uh, because right down the street from Numbers was that incredible art gallery. Yes, the Vanille. <laughs> Yes, and across the street from that, there was that chapel to, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, my God, the Rothko Chapel. The Rothko. My God, Howie, I just, I, I can't even believe we're having this Rothko Chapel. The Rothko Chapel. The Rothko chapel. Let me tell you, chapel. Howie, the first time I ever engaged in visual art in a meaningful way was at, in modern art, was at the Rothko Chapel. Uh, I was dating this woman who was like, she was super into it. And I was always eye rolly. She took me into the Rothko Chapel and she had prepared me in advance. She said, look, like I will be with you, but go in silently. And I'm just gonna ask you, cause I said, I've been in there. It's just black paint. Like it doesn't mean, like there's not even anything to see, <laughs> right? And she said, please go in. I'll stand next to you, but we're not gonna talk just find a place ideally at the corner of, of a painting and just look and stare at that place and Howie I did it and in my head I was like this is stupid this is stupid this is stupid and then literally somewhere in that moment I fell into the brush strokes of the painting and it kind of like one of those magic eye moments and it was the mo one of the most moving experiences with art I've ever had uh, up to that point or since. And at some point, I literally began to weep because it was so profoundly full of anguish and despair. And like before, all I had seen was just black uh, on canvas, which I thought was just stupid. And my literal mind couldn't wrap my head around it. But just by having somebody properly prepare me and suggest a technique for it i literally had a moving artistic experience well uh, i think that rothko is one of the greatest uh painters of our time and i think that chapel is the best thing in all in the whole city of houston and they never promote it so people are there all the time and they never even know it exists i mean you have to be told that it's there otherwise you don't know it's there so listen well, if you haven't been thing. lately because i haven't been uh back in a while but now, uh, in that same big uh, park at the Rothko Chapel, there is a 13th or 14th uh, fresco Byzantine uh, chapel, uh, the remnants, and they've hung them using light and plexiglass. If you go back, go to the Rothko Chapel, then find the Byzantine Chapel, and the Manila is always worth a, a visit. Okay, I, of course, I will. But did you did you by any chance uh, ever work with uh, one of my bands called Until December? That name is not familiar to me. Did you know uh, did Richard, out, Richard Tom Kama or Butler Hancock at BFD Productions? BFD Productions. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't doing the booking. It's just that that uh, that band Until December came out of Numbers. That's where that was like their home their home before they got signed to us. That's amazing. Uh, at some point, I would love to sort of circle back and because I haven't. Uh, I, it's just that's a long lost a bit of my path. I bet you know the the folks over at Rock and Roll Confidential, don't you? Well, I did. Well, I think they're now doing rock and rap. Uh, and but well, by the way, not, uh, was, those are good I'm lefties not into, too. I'm not really, oh, well, good. I'm not really into the music business at all anymore. Although I just thought of the band that I wrote about for tonight for tonight's uh, page of my memoir, which is uh, my my experiences with the Sex Pistols. Um, so it, so it's kind of a fun little piece, uh, and and you know people who are into music might want to read it. It's not about politics that much anyway, but I talk about how uh, uh, I don't want to give anything away, but I talk about their last concert and my role in it. And and you brought the Clash to America? No, <laughs> you brought the, the Clash with my pals, and I uh, certainly encouraged them to come to America, but I didn't bring them to America. But I will tell you a very very funny story. I know I'm eating into David's time, well, actually, but I'll try to make it. Keep going. What? 
Keep going. We okay. have time. I'll make it as quick as I can. So do you, do you, I don't, I'm not going to mention any names now, but I'm just going to describe the person and either you'll know who it is or not. But this woman was a Andy Warhol superstar. And in one of his movies, she throws a baby out of the window. So that's the woman we're talking about. She then went on to become the head of publicity for um, uh, Epic Records. The Clash record comes out. Epic has them signed. They look at this, they take a look at the first record and they said, no, we're not putting this out. And they didn't, uh, by the way, until after the second record. So meanwhile, I thought this was the greatest record in the world. I, I just like completely flipped out over it. I wrote about it in every magazine I could. And this woman also loved the record. And she calls me up one day and she says, how would you like to go on tour with The Clash? I said, I would love to go on tour with The Clash. She said, okay, it's on us. We're going to pay for you to go live in England for a month. All expenses paid. We'll pay for your, your uh, plane. Everything's on us. I said, great, I'm in. She said, but I need you to come to uh, New York first on the way there. I said, okay, see you in New York. Went to New York, and she says to me, um, I, want to, I want to meet Paul Simonon. So Paul Simonon was really, really hot-looking guy. And if you want to know what he looks like, you could look at um, Google his two sons. They're both models, uh, and uh, that's what he looked like at, in those days. Or just look at the Clash record. He, and, his, and that was his job with the Clash. He, he wasn't really a musician. Uh, he, he designed their uh, clothing and their look, and that, that's what he was about. In any case, she wanted me to go to England and get, go on tour with them for a month so that I would get to be friends with him so that I could introduce the two of them in a non-business way. So be friends with Paul and then introduce us. I said, fine, I'll do it. So a couple of years later, she calls me up. She says, so the class you're going to be in San Francisco next week. Are you doing anything with them? I said, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, having, I'm doing a few interviews with them on, on various stations and I'm hanging out with them. And she said, well, I want you to do something uh, that's going to, uh, you know, I want you to make sure that uh, uh, Paul and I get together. Can you do that for me? I said, yes, of course, I'll be happy to. So I invited, I was doing a midnight show on, on uh, the biggest radio station in the city. I invited uh, both Paul and this woman to come on the show. And we all the show was just about the two of them. And at one point I said to them, you know, this isn't TV, it's radio. No one knows what you guys look like. Can you describe each other? Can you describe each other? And that led to the two of them leaving and, and my part of the deal was finished. Hmm. Amazing. You think that's a good story? Absolutely. A, it, would be a, it would be a better story if I could like name, name the person, but I feel really terrible because she, you know, she had a long and fabulous career and now she's a Hasidic Jew. It's, I'm not, you think I'm telling a joke because you're a comedian, but I'm not telling a joke. I'm telling you that, that what happened. What happened to this woman? So I feel like I can't, I can't, I can't tell the story. You know, I mean, what if her grandchildren find out? But the Hasids are joyous. I'm being serious. It wasn't it a 19th century cult of dancing and community? Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think they're that joyous anymore. And, uh, you know, and I told a very, very uh, mild version of the story just now. <laughs> Bef- and I have pictures. You have, by pic- the way, I have pictures. David Cobb and Howie Klein. You both have a background in music and promotion and dealing with audiences, and you both gravitated to politics. I've asked Howie this, but let me ask Howie first, and then David, you answer this. What did you learn about politics from concert promotions? Look, I was in politics before uh, music. So so it's a a little bit backwards for me. When I was just a kid, my grandfather, who was a socialist from Russia, uh, you know, really taught me about politics. And that was before I was listening to music. And uh, I don't know if I learned anything. It was uh, to be against racism. You know, I'm talking about as a small child now. And in the mu- and the music industry is all about. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I, I learned a lot from my grandfather about politics. But when you related to the music business, it was about it was about not being racist. In fact, the very I was just trying to think of her name the other day. Um, the very first woman I ever kissed was Maxine Brown. I went to a show at the Brooklyn um, Paramount 
and she she was she was singing. You know, they would go on and they each act would do like you know two, three, four numbers, and and they would have a mix up you know of every kind of music all going on, and it was they were wonderful. The shows were incredible. I was just a little kid, but no one wanted to come to the shows with me. It was you know a long subway ride. And I would go by myself all the time. Anyway, Maxine Brown was singing. I thought she was the greatest. After she was done, I went, um, I couldn't get, in those days, I couldn't go backstage as a little kid. But I went, I went around to the alley where I knew the artists would leave. And I knew that she would, she would be coming out through that alley. And I waited for her there at the door and asked her if she'd give me an autograph. And she did. And then I asked her if she'd give me a kiss. And she did. <laughs> there you go. Rock's original sin is America's original sin. When what was Rock's original sin? In terms of how it treated African Americans. Ah, how white America treated African Americans. That's right. Yeah. Uh, David, would you like to respond? Boy, uh, it, it is interesting, right? So uh, I'm going to make a couple of points. Uh, and thank you, Howie. Uh, I'm really glad I tuned in a little bit early to get to be uh, a part of this. So, uh, I had Howie, because, I had uh, one, of, one of my one of my pals at uh, down at uh, 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 Blue America, Jackie, keeps saying you've got to get together with, with this guy who comes on after you. He's yes. amazing. I mean, she loves you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's so kind. Thank you. Uh, uh, and yeah, like I, again, I, I I typically only get the very tail end of uh, what y'all are talking about, and I'm always intrigued. Um, so, looky here. I'm going to say this, David. Uh, like. Howie, uh, I t dabbled in politics before I did uh, uh, the music biz, right? I remember I got uh, my first involvement with, with politics was in the anti-apartheid movement. To be clear, we weren't electing people. It wasn't electoral politics, but uh, like I learned a lot in the anti-apartheid movement at the University of Houston. Here's something I learned, for example, is if you just follow the rules as the ruling elite tell you, They'll let you go and have your like one or two minutes at the beginning of the Board of Regents meeting, uh, but you can't ever actually do anything. But if you're willing to be disruptive and actually shut down the, the meeting, you can actually exercise some power. And so from the anti-apartheid movement, as a young student activist, uh, I naturally fell into Jesse Jackson. And, you know, that's the, I'm, I'm almost 60. I'll, I'll be 60 in a couple of months, Howie. So I'm a little bit younger, maybe. But what I'm getting at is, my involvement with electoral politics began with Jesse Jackson, right? So I, I and I had the privilege of meeting in person the Reverend, you know, about a, you know, 15 years ago. And I laughed and I said, Reverend, you spoiled me because I thought electoral politics was always going to be about the fight for structural justice. And, you know, like, like, again, like that. So that was my experience. So I can't help it. I've had authentic left electoral politics and so now everything I engage with. And it was after that experience, Howie, that I started in uh, doing rock promotion and I kind of fell into it by accident. So I'm giving you that backstory to say, here is a lesson that I learned. When I was doing shows at, especially at the Vatican and Power Tools, which were punk scenes, the numbers was more uh, was, was a little bit different. But Definitely what I learned during the skinhead fights, right, between the, the Nazi skinheads and the, the liberation skinheads, and that's this. When white nationalists or actual Nazis and fascists show up at your venue, one of two things are always going to happen. One, they drive you out, or two, you drive them out, because fascists are not interested in nor capable of having discourse, debate, et cetera. Like the, the, it is an ideology that is evil, uh, that is, and they want to kill people like us, right? Uh, they are at their core uh, racist, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, uh, homophobes, like they're dangerous people. Here's the second thing that I want to touch on. And that is how we, uh, or pardon me, David Feldman, your point about white America's original uh, sin, is true, but may, as a Southerner, can I just say, may the goddess bless Greg Allman, who taught this white boy from the South 
what real tolerance could look like. And I'm getting a little choked up because I had the experience of actually coming to terms with the shame of being a white Southerner. And actually Greg Allman showed me that it was possible to be proud of being from the South and be tolerant and, and, and to actually understand uh, that black people are not only humans, but are actually capable of being our dear and cherished friends. And unless we come to terms with white supremacy at its core, we can never unite to defeat the right. Wow. That's what I learned. And now, and now we have, uh, what's his name? Jason uh, Aldean. Who? who? Jason Aldean, big, big news story in, in that world now. Uh, his wife, I mean, they're not racist per se. I mean, he's a MAGA guy, he's friends with Trump, he's a, you know, very, very rich. And his wife made a big fuss on uh, uh, around trans, uh, around uh, trans stuff, trans stuff, yeah, I, I, yeah, they were just horrible, crazy, evil people. No, there it, again, but here's the thing, Howie, like, what the other thing that I learned, uh, Feldo, and that is that we make a mistake on the left if we don't engage art and culture and comedy and humor. Like we have to actually, uh, uh, we have to mock the right as much as we fight the right. It can't merely come from a sense of moralism, right? We've actually got to engage people using art, culture, and humor. Well, Howie, uh, I love you, Howie. This is one of the best uh, segments we've had uh my question is are we in danger on the left of embracing through our consumerism the wrong art for being too forgiving of things we see uh, or hear in music or movies that come out you know it's funny i mentioned when, when um when we talked about numbers the club in uh, in Houston. I mentioned a band that got their start there uh, called Until December. One of the guys in the band emailed me yesterday. I haven't heard from him in, I don't know, 20 years. And yesterday I got an email from him because he read my thing on Jason Aldean. And he said, just before that happened, he was about to sign a seven figure deal partnership with Aldean and his brother-in-law. And when he saw what happened and he saw what uh, uh, MAGA fascists they are, he, he, and he's not that, he, this guy's not wealthy. And he, he, he said he just couldn't do it. He just would not, uh, you know, even for that much money, he would just not have anything to do with those people. So, you know, it depends on the person. It depends, uh, you know, some people will, will never buy a Jason L. Dean album again. And some people will rush out to get, to get one. I think people on the left are the ones in the first category. When and, we... and the guy's good, by the way. He, he's, he's, he's a good musician. His songs are good. Uh, you know, I hate to say that about someone with his politics, but it happens to be the case. Now, if you don't like country music, you're not going to like him anyway. But I do like country music. And, uh, you know, and this, guy, this guy's good. I'll never listen to him again. Uh, I'm certainly not going to buy any of his music. Not that I, buy, I bought any of it before, but I'm not, now I would never even put it on. Right. So I so I don't know the, I don't know the answer to your question, David. Okay. Well, Howie, thank you for this. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Howie Klein writes down with tyranny. Re I didn't even say goodbye to him. Uh, <laughs> that was fast. Uh, Howie Klein writes down with tyranny and read him there every day. And he is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. Joining us is Dr. Harriet Fraud. She is the host of Capitalism Hits Home, as well as It's Not Just In Your Head. We'll learn who your co-hosts are. We, we had scheduled a, an hour together. Uh, I thought, hang on for one second. Let me unmute you. There you go. Hello. I, I thought we were going to do this uh, a half hour ago. That was well, my. That's my problem. I forgot. <laughs> Me too. Good. Thank you for saying that. It's Labor Day. Yes. 
And this 15th Street Manifesto, now that I reread it after all these, it's almost, um, almost 20 years ago that we wrote this at our 15th Street apartment. Um, I was so happy to read that because things have progressed since then. So why don't we do this? So I, I'm going to lay low. Uh, Dwayne Allman played on lay low, not Greg Allman, right? That's right. And Layla. Uh, I want to ask you about Greg Allman uh, later. Uh, I'm going to lay low. David Cobb, set this up. Explain what you read and what you what you'd like. I, to I will. Thank you, Feldo, and thanks for thanks for being so generous with the time. And uh, Dr. Fraud, thank you for picking up on this. So, uh, to the listeners and those watching live on, uh, on YouTube viewers, let me set the stage. Last week, uh, I mentioned to Dr. Fraud that I had stumbled across this piece, uh, and I got really excited about it. Uh, and then uh, going deeper, I was like, oh my gosh, Dr. Fraud, you were a co-author of this piece. And to be clear, this piece that I'm referring to is called Manifesto for a Left Turn, an Open Letter to U.S. Radicals. Now, when I I first read it, it's because, look, I'm a voracious reader, and I, I also say all the time, I study theory and I study history, not so I can be a good movement trivial pursuit player. <laughs> I study theory and, and history because I want to win, because I, I describe myself as a serious revolutionary, because I believe that we have to restructure the entire social, political, and economic economy, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll give a hat tip to Trotsky and say, I don't think we need just a political revolution. We need a social revolution. We need to completely reorganize how social reproduction occurs, how needs are met. And it, it is not just the objective material economics of it, but it is the psychology of it. It is in all aspects. And that's, I think, what, without knowing Dr. Fraud's background, why she and I quickly developed a, a rapport yes. here on Feldo's show, because frankly, one Marxist to another, but also her constant uh, returning to the deeper uh, uh, understanding of therapy and uh, the, you know, feminism uh, and, and without it becoming just the health and healing crowd, right? So, and I am setting us up here because when I read this, I got super excited when I first started to read it because I thought this is exactly what we need. But very quickly, I was like, wait a minute, it's talking about Obama. Like, and then I had, I realized, oh, wait, this, this was written in 2008, y'all. But it's so prescient because I, uh, as, a, as a writing in 2008, it was incredibly astute. Yes, some things have advanced, but the basic call, Dr. Fraud, is I think still germane. And I'm going to, uh, now that I've set up why I got excited to talk to you about this is, Dr. Fraud, I want you, here's what I wanna do. Let's talk about 2008 and where the context of that manifesto came from, right. and then let's get to what lessons for the here and now. So Dr. Fraud, tell us about the Manifesto for a Left Turn that you and others co-wrote? Well, we were all activists and we were all thoughtful people. And we felt that the left was really degenerating into either do-goody kind of activities with no idea of a, trying to create a revolutionary change or abstraction and that we felt that they lost the commitment to change the everyday personal lives of human beings. Now, that's why. And we thought, well, we'll get together, we'll write something, we'll hope to inspire people, we'll invite all sorts of people to meetings and let's see where it goes. Well, we did, went nowhere. I mean, they liked coming, they liked listening to us, they liked going home. <laughs> and nothing developed, but it was fun writing it because we were trying to think why, what is wrong and what can we do? What excited me in rereading it 
is that the whole geopolitical situation of the United States has changed in the last 12, 14 years. That China has emerged as a countervailing power. That it's true the United States has the biggest gross national product, $21 trillion, but China has 15 now. And China came from nothing, was demolished in World War II. It was a feudal country. And there are different models there. The United States hegemony in South America is disintegrating. They called, you know, Biden called a meeting of the South American states. Only two showed up. Whoa, that's a big change. The whole configuration in South America has changed with Chile and Colombia just in the last couple of months. And uh, Brazil looks like it's coming along. Argentina is much more left. Bolivia, Ur I think Uruguay, I mean, really, it, Mexico, Obrador refused to come to that meeting. So Mexico is not the same client state. The world has changed. And also capitalism has gotten so much more savage since we wrote that, that blacks have been the shock absorbers for capitalism. The last hired, the first fired, the most oppressed. Now the whole blue collar workforce is a shock absorber and wages have flattened. We do mention that there, but wages have stayed flat since the seventies. And so that, and the working class family is dismembered. So people's emotional lives are transformed. And so that the whole configuration has changed. But the basic idea to have a left that's relevant to people's lives now and based on people's concerns is still crucial. And based on decommodifying people's basic needs for food, for clean water, for shelter, for temperature regulation, for health care, for um, all of the basic needs have been terribly assaulted. And everything is exaggerated, but people and the labor movement has its incipient rec recognition of class, which wasn't so 12 years ago. Or 14 years ago. So you, you've already begun to, to sort of do the compare and the contrast, right? Which, which uh, again, I'm eager to have this conversation, but I do want to uh, really curate the conversation a little bit for sure. listeners who may not have read the essay. Uh, and if you haven't, right. again, it's called Manifesto for a Left Turn, A Call to U.S. Radicals. It was written in, or published in 2008, but it is so incredibly on point and uh, again, uh, Dr. Fraud, I'm going to publicly say, if you would be interested in revisiting this, shortening a little bit, I mm. think that the moment is now. I, I do. And I, I'm sincere about this because one of the things that you and your colleagues, uh, comrades, I imagine, uh, uh, who wrote this really have a incredibly astute observation about the, the left and it's what passes for the left in the US now, basically subsumed within the Democratic Party. So a scathing critique about that, but also a stern warning to us not to go headlong into electoral party formations, right? And I think that, again, I'm a Green Party member, but as you know, like I believe truly in that by any means necessary. I worked with Democrats in, uh, uh, in California to pass public banking, right? Like, again, I am not like, I think it's a mistake to just try to vilify the Democratic Party because there is really... The, the Democratic Party writ large has the leadership, the neoliberals who are actually in control of the apparatus, but the, the great mass of Democratic Party members are infinitely more progressive and frankly could go left, genuinely yes. anti-capitalist left, if there were opportunities for it. So I guess what I want to ask is, 
like that section where y'all were learning from the history of the left decline, do you still agree with the Democratic Party as the graveyard uh, of the left and the graveyard for movements, if I'm, if I'm not being too bold? Yes, it is. Look, um, Citizens United was passed in 2010. Um, that was after we had our meetings, and that sort of cemented it. But I think the Democratic Party gives, has the verbiage of populism and connection to people's lives, but it's a totally capitalist party. And it's a party of, therefore, the party of the employer class. And although some things can be done with progressive Democrats, it is not our party. It is not anti-capitalist. Nancy Pelosi's, uh, when asked about socialism, said, what do you mean socialism? There's no alternative. This is all there is. And it's not all there is for us. We want a better world, not just a different candidate. So one thing, uh, so the Democratic Party in, in, your, in this manifesto for a left turn, there is the recognition that the Democratic Party is the party of capital, but you also are clear about the party of empire. Right. And yes. I don't want to lose sight of that. Right. Like it is both capitalism and imperialist foreign policy. And those are related. But the relation is in order to prop up the the the, the standard of living uh, that like American workers used to have and able to, it required the brutal subjugation uh, and, and uh, exploitation and genuine oppression of people in, uh, in the global South, obviously with black and brown skin. I, I, I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of that as part of the conversation. Look, and Clinton, sort of big liberal Clinton, he put another nail in the coffin of possibility for the Democratic Party by passing NAFTA, you know, and oppressing Mexicans terribly while depriving Americans of reasonable, decent, well-paid jobs. It epitomizes that. And it's- Dr. Fraud. Obrador opposes that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because I actually like to say, Bill Clinton turned me into a green. Uh, uh, because again, I, uh, I, in a couple of months, I'll be 60 years old, right? So I'm only 59, only 59. Like, but, but I'm just saying, so I came of age at a certain time, which is to say I got radicalized in electoral politics through the Jesse Jackson campaign and the Rainbow Coalition, although I've since learned Fred Hampton's Rainbow is much more appealing to me, right? Yes. But I'll just say Jesse Jackson in uh, 84 and then in 88. And remember, but for the incredibly stupid Heimetown, uh comment uh, pre-New York, I mean, Jesse, like we could have won the Democratic Party's nomination in, in, in 88. And I still, to this day, I'm just pained by that incredibly stupid and anti-Semitic comment um, uh, and what it represented. All I'm saying is Jesse in 84 and then in 88, I started off as a student volunteer in 84 because I came out of the anti-apartheid movement as a student activist and radical, then Jesse in 84, then 88, I came up. Some people that you and I probably know, Kevin Alexander Gray, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the folks at Progressive Democrats of America. Anyway, all to say in 92, it was Je uh, Jerry Brown. And all along the way, you know, what I was, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned as a white person how to put myself under the leadership of people of color. I learned about uh, the, making connections between organized labor and environmentalists. I learned about the women's movement. I learned about empire and Palestine. You know, I learned a lot. But you know what else I learned, Dr. Fraud? I learned that the Democratic Party's presidential primary process is where genuine progressive electoral politics goes to die because mm -hmm. all of the energy and the enthusiasm that the semblance of a true left anti-capitalist, uh, you know, genuinely feminist kind of orientation, it gets subsumed. And we're told you can't continue to push these militant ideas because it won't sell in the larger politics. And I think Learn from, you know, the, the learn from the revolutionary rehearsals of France in 68 or Portugal uh, in 74 or um, Chile in 72, 73. It's like 
we need to learn to engage electoral politics, but as a tactical strategic matter, not as the goal. We build movements where ordinary people live, work, play, and pray. We, we, we build movements where they actually live. That's the power of what I hear when I read Manifesto for a Left Turn. It is, and it's the power of the recent revolutionary election in Colombia, where he said, we are the party of ordinary people. We are, and talks about his vice president who cleaned houses and so on, and how important that is. And that we, that's what we represent and tried and brought together the indigenous people, the socialist people, the feminist people, the labor unions, the ecology and climate concerned, everyone to create another world, but not as splintered little lefty groups doing their specialty, but as people needing each other to transform the things they want to transform and cannot be transformed without everyone else. So the other thing that you observe in this manifesto for a left turn is learning from the history of the left's decline over the last 30 to 40 years, uh, was not just electoral politics and the, and the mm -hmm. challenges there, but you also talked about the bigger material conditions and why incremental change as a tactic was just no longer possible because of capital's next stages. And I'm wondering, do you still, uh, do you still believe that or do you feel like, uh, like what lessons about the object this moment? Are we in an epochal okay. changing moment? I think we are because I think the whole tenor of work in the United States has changed. That the four biggest employers all have scanners and use their workers, that's Walmart, Amazon, fast food and call centers, that they're all on the clock, like Emily Gindelsberger's book says. And they are, utterly alone and uh, appendages that are robotized and timed. I don't know if I've mentioned that two, two minutes and 33 seconds from the time somebody walks into the time they get their burger at McDonald's. And if you don't do that on, in that time, you get beeped and you get talked to, that you are constantly driven and you are in a dent, you are just one cipher in an algorithm that you've disappeared as a human being. And that's white people, black people, everybody. That's everybody at the Amazon warehouse. So the whole conditions of work have worsened. And the labor movement has recognized, as in the Amazon labor movement, and as Sarah Nelson said, that the AFL-CIO is not the vehicle for labor necessarily. Let's be clear, like we don't have time in this conversation, but let's just take a moment to remember the, the, the big struggle between the AFL and the CIO at the, CIO at the time. That right. like part of it was the difference between do you organize unions by the specialty of your trade in order to business unionism, right? right. Do you extract better concessions and deals from you? for your individual members or the CIO model that says an injury to one is an injury to all, and you're building a mass movement to actually restructure society. The difference, like a militant trade union movement is different than a business trade union movement. So totally. I think that's important. Very important. And also the ties of the AFL with the CIA and the, is another thing. Plus when this was written, we had lost Vietnam. We had lost Iraq, but we hadn't lost Afghanistan yet. The United right, it was, still, it was still waging. We were still waging imperialist wars that we lost, all of them. And everything is up for grabs now, but people are being oppressed on a level. So Dr. Fraud, we've got 15 yeah. minutes. So I want to make sure that one of the lessons that, that you draw is that and and like really so the objective conditions we just have to deal with right people right. may make revolution but not by according to the terms and conditions of our choosing we have to take the world as right. it is 
But what we, we do have agency on is whether we have an explicit anti-capitalist left. And you, frankly, really scathingly critique the collapse of a specifically anti-capitalist global left and its uh, transition into an acceptance of like, okay, well, we'll accept capitalism, we'll at least be anti-neoliberal, right? And mm -hmm. I wanna ask, do you still believe that critique is valid? Totally, totally. I think that we, you know, we, one, one of the beautiful changes, and I, it's true, I am optimistic, but still is that capitalism is now recognized as capitalism. It is not thought of as the natural world connoting that there's an alternative. And I still think that that is the unifying message that capitalism delivers oppression, division, poverty, sexism, racism, and it has to be changed. And now that's, before, that's the unifying possibility that the left needs and doesn't yet have. Not yet, but, and I'm going to try out something, Dr. Fraud, uh, and especially for Feldo uh, and uh, the listeners, viewers, because oftentimes uh, folks will present capitalism as either there is, there is no alternative, Tina, right? Uh, right? As Margaret Thatcher famously said, to which Dr. Fraud, I, to her Tina, I say, ta-ta, there are thousands of alternatives. There yeah. are so many different ways that actually, like this idea that there is only one or the other is, is, is ridiculous. But even deeper still, I, uh, we're taught that oh, economics are so complicated. Ordinary people can't really understand it. We have to leave it to the experts, right? Oh, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's nonsense. Watch what I'm gonna do, y'all. I'm going to break it down and I can take this into any pool hall or bowling alley uh, in this country and explain what capitalism uh, is by describing the, the characteristics. There are five basic characteristics that make up a capitalist economic system. The first is probably the most important and that is that the, the things are privately owned. You have the private ownership and if I'm in a pool hall or a bowling alley, I won't say the means of production. Instead, mm -hmm. I'll say the private ownership of those uh, businesses and ranches and farms and factories where, where the things are produced. So number one, private ownership of the means of production. Number two, that goods and services are produced as commodities instead of to be of human use. This is what Marx talked about, the difference between uh, use value uh, or surplus value, right? But it's commodity value. production is number two. Number three, that labor itself is just one more commodity that's bought and paid for, right? As opposed to the sacred uh, uh, expression of human activity, right? So number three is as uh, labor is commodity or wage labor. Number four is profit maximization. The only reason that you do any economics is to maximize uh, profit. And then the fifth one is everything is therefore allocated through the market, right? So those five basic characteristics are how you define capitalism. And here's the thing, Dr. Fraud, and anybody watching, go to Wikipedia, get online, get a, break out a macroeconomics textbook. I promise you the definition I just gave is what any economist, Alan Greenspan, like people would basically say, okay, yeah, that's, that's like they may try to say it in, in more uplifting and powerful mm -hmm. ways, but those are the basic characteristics. But here's the point, Dr. Fraud, when you put all of those together, it's the ideology of the cancer cell because it's gonna commodify earth faster than she can replenish herself. It ultimately treats labor as another commodity to be extracted. It is in fact, at its core, extractive, oppressive, dominating power over. This is the thing. I, like you, believe that we need to break it down without dumbing it down. Let's help people understand that capitalism is an economic system based on exploitation and oppression. Oh, and by the way, left uninterrupted, it's literally going to destroy the planet that we depend upon for life itself. We are in a battle now 
where if we don't restructure society, we're going to all die. And our great grandchildren, maybe even our grandchildren will curse us for not doing something. Right. Look, I know that you could explain this to anyone. Everyone understands nobody hires you unless they're making more money off you than they give you. Because that's not good business. So ripping off is good business. That doesn't sound so nice, you know? And everyone understands that. Everyone who wants to understands that. The idea is there isn't a vehicle for getting to people and talking to them about it in a way that is easy. And look, when I used to go on the subway all the time before they got so scary, I could I like to sit next to people and talk to them. And I could talk to anybody because, you know, first of all, it helps to be a woman, you're less threatening. And it, I could just talk to people. Anyone can understand this and anyone can understand it's just not nice. I mean, we learn in kindergarten, sharing is nice. That's not nice, taking other people's stuff. And people know they're ripped off, but the question is, where do you go from there? In a union, you know, there's these two classes, the employer class and the employed class, and you know which you are, and you know in a gut way that this is class war. They want to extract your labor and commodify it, not because they have anything personally against you, but because that's business. That's capitalist business. They're being good businessmen by ripping you off. And your interests are diametrically opposed to theirs in terms of pay and working conditions. So Dr. Frau, we got about 10 minutes left before the next guest is gonna come on. Uh, There's so many places that I could go, but I wanna make sure, again, manifesto for a left turn, uh, you and your colleagues and comrades lay out principles for a new left turn. And you have five principles that I wanna, I'm gonna read them out loud and then just ask you to reflect on them. Uh, One, you call for reorganizing the system of production democratically from the bottom up. Two, you call for advocating and experimenting with new forms of collective ownership. Three, to engage in the struggle against capital uh, and by producing new social and cultural spaces, particularly reviving a struggle over agricultural and urban land. Four, the founding of radical democratic institutions at the workplace and in communities and everyday social interactions, including the home. And five, helping to conduct aggressive reform struggles that decommodify essential services. So I'm going to ask you to just like, just reflect on that and explain why you chose uh, those particular five principles and and what lessons from that process? Well, these principles cover the basic needs human human beings have. The need to be connected, the need to have support, the need to make a living, and the need to be in an embracing world and not abandoned. And I see this, of course, with a psychological lens. But that, and decommodifying means that you are not a commodity either. Your labor is not a commodity. Your personage is not a commodity. You don't see people as means towards your own profit, but as human beings together with you. And you try to amplify that by creating a cooperative structure of ownership so that you have worker ownership. And you have mandatory meetings where you decide what to do. What do you produce? How do you produce it? What can you do? What kind of relationships do you have here? And that that goes all the way down, down into the home and personal life where no one has a chance to lord it over anyone else. And that there is a social and cultural space for that. And what it means on a nitty gritty level is that where you live is not a commodity privately owned and needs to be in recognition of collectivity. You know, I live in New York City and I live in Stytown, which has something, you know, has some of that. You have big collective spaces, 
you have big group activities, you have things organized so that people's collective work together and you have possibilities of co-housing where people who don't want kids but like to play with them can play with some of the kids and people can make decisions together and know that they are in charge. The basic thing is don't give up our authority over our own lives anywhere and that we are all connected and we have to recognize that and facilitate that instead of do the opposite. Yeah, it's no, it's, it's no accident that Occupy Wall Street started at Zuccotti Park, which is a very interesting privately owned public space, right? Like it's a, like, mm-hmm. like, like there's, there's so much in what you just said, uh, Dr. Fraud, but uh, because we are running out of time, I want to make sure to touch on what you and your comrades described as the problems of organization. Like, in other words, uh, I'm going to just ask, uh, if we know that we don't want a headlong rush into just electoralism, again, I'm a Green Party member uh, and, and I'm proud to be a Green Party member, but most of my work these days is incubating worker-owned cooperatives, helping build community land trust, I mean, democratizing economics. I still engage elections, uh, but, and I, I, but I also, I, like, I don't de- demonize Democrats. Uh, although I understand that Democratic Party is not ultimately going to be a liberating uh, formation. So I'm wondering uh, if you can say or two, a word or two about your thinking about the problems of how to organize uh, and cultivate uh, these five principles you've just articulated. I think you would need to have organizations where people address them from their own lives and make policy together make principles together. What are the issues in your own life? What does that lead to? And how do they relate? And welcome everyone's ideas in a very grassroots way till you get a program and you fight for it together. With I think all it's, the it's, ideas you have. I, what I love about this is what you're, you're, you're helping to make the distinction between individualism versus genuine individuality, right? Uh, individualism, like you're saying, collectively, we come together and that lets us fully express ourselves genuinely rather than hyper-focus what's in it for me. Exactly. And hyper-conform to try to get ahead competing with the people around you. I learned a lot from being in the women's movement. One of the the best things that came out of the women's movement was that we got our program through consciousness raising. And we had a principle, which I articulated and I still stand by, which is everyone is welcome, except if they know everything we have to do, then they have to leave immediately. (laughs) So that we could talk about what are we going through? What does this mean? What can we do to make our lives better? And people can speak and be heard and respected. And From that, try out, okay, what about this? What about that action? What do we do to fight for it? Dr. Farah, the other thing that you and your comrades in this manifesto for a left turn calls for is an extended period of research, discussion, uh, and and study, but not merely intellectual study. I'm no anti-intellectual, but you make a distinction between like studying, but also studying based on the practice, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not merely study group. Exactly. It's not just to entertain yourself. It's because you have a purpose together. And the purpose is making a better world for all of us and knowing we need each other for that project. And so you study and come up with ideas and combine them with the ideas you have about what you experience and what can be changed to change that experience. And you get a, co- a program which can always be questioned because people have to be able to ask questions as long as they're genuine questions. And I think that makes enormous bonds between people, much more than a hierarchical organization would have. And so I think that that is an excellent method. And it would start, you know, when, when the women's movement, at least for me, started because I heard about it in New York and I thought, we've got to do this here. 
So I called together people from the committees to end the war in Vietnam that were with me and five of them showed up. And we decided, okay, we're women's liberation and reached out to other people because people were ready. And as a movement person who's been a movement person since high school, I, I can feel when people are ready to make a change and people in America are ready to make a change. That's why the union movement with its incipient recognition of the unity that we have to have to change the class dimension of our lives is, is a wildfire in the United States. And we can build on that because I think it is an important moment. You know, I, I thank you for saying that because uh, uh, in addition to your own intuition, and I, I would say I share that in like, like we are in uh, a Gramscian conjuncture moment, yeah. right? A and uh, I think that this is true objectively, right? In other words, like whether we like it or not, folks, the entire social, political, economic institutions are about to be transformed. They are being transformed. They're crumbling. Like uh, so, so new systems. And I do want to say this, like fascism is emerging again globally not because this current breed of capitalists are just meaner than the ones who had been in charge the last 30 or 40 years. Objectively, it's presenting itself because the systems are failing and new systems are, like new things are going to have to come up. Hello, Ethan. Uh, I know we're eating into your time, so we're gonna, uh, Dr. Fraud. Right, take your time, take your time. Well, thank, thank you, you. You're, you're, you're gracious. Folks, fascism is rising now because systems are failing. I'm gonna take a, all the conversation Dr. Fraud and I have just had, I'm gonna take a big step back from the tapestry and point out some big patterns. Epoch changing moments, right? Not just individual policies, not just uh, you know one political party or one particular candidate. Global humanity epochs go like this. Human beings existed uh, as hunter-gatherer gardeners, right? This idea of hunter-gatherers, we always involved in some level uh, of gardening, but there was a difference whenever humans' whole worldview was that we were part of the ecosystem. It was an earth-centric, you followed patterns of nature, we were part of it. Uh, and so that way of being had economics, right? Like, like, like it's just the management of the household. That's what the word economics means uh, taken from the Attic Greek. But the big, big epochal change was when we moved into an agrarian society and uh, like surplus value uh, uh, began and, and commodities began. So what I'm getting at is the change from a, a hunter-gatherer gardener type to agriculture and agrarian society was- and property, which- uh, Yes, exactly, right? Very but important. But the point is all, everything got restructured. Then, and that took basically almost a thousand years for that change to happen. The next big epoch level changing uh, is basically the rise of the nation state, feudalism and so forth, right? Uh, uh, and so the enclosure movement and the real the advance of property in the modern concept uh, was very powerful. Then you have the beginnings in the mercantilist movement, feudalism to mercantilism, industrialism, which is where the industrial age begins. So the entire way things are had heretofore been organized were shifted. That only takes two, three hundred years, right? Notice how much more quickly the epoch leveling things are changing. My point is this, Dr. Fraud, just as surely as fascism emerged when we shifted from an agrarian society to a true industrial one and everything was really up in the air, as we are changing from industrial society, whether you call it a knowledge base uh, or uh, you know, uh, uh, in the information age, but the way like automation, robotics, et cetera, the, the, the production and distribution of goods and services are being fundamentally changed away from industrial and even finance capitalism. Something different is going to emerge and everybody senses it. 
fascism for all its horror is still a philosophical idea about how to organize society. And it well, has it to do with capitalism as it is. It preserves, absolutely. And it appeals to a certain sector by saying, we'll take care of you. You're going to be okay. The state is going to, like, you get to be part of the bundle of sticks together, right? The, the, that's where the word fascism literally comes from, the, the, the strength of the bundle of sticks. Like, you subsume yourself into that. Fascism is emerging now objectively because it has to. I genuinely believe that eco-socialism or some version of that uh, is the path forward, uh, and it's the only path forward. We're not going to get there through neoliberalism or the Democratic Party's efforts to make uh, capitalism kinder and gentler. We have to embrace a, a peaceful, loving, revolutionary new movement. And Ethan, I'm going to say thank you. That was a full five minutes of your time we, uh, we ate in. Thank you, Ethan. Why oh, hello, hello. Let's, let's, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, why don't we do this again next week? 7.30, because then I'll, I'll remember. Then you'll remember this time, Dr. Frog? I hope so. I'm writing it in. Here's what I learned. Listening. It was great. Great job, David Cobb. Great job, Dr. Harriet Frog. I learned capitalism is private ownership, commodity production, labor as a commodity, profit maximization, and five, the market. That's what I learned from David Cobb. Simple definition of capitalism. What I learned from Dr. Harriet Fraud and her manifesto for left turn, you, uh, one, reorganize the systems of production from the bottom up. Two, collective ownership. Three, social and cultural spaces. Four, more democratic communities and uh, reform and decommodify essential services. So I learned through repetition. I think we can keep hammering these points. And uh, I see no, go ahead. So I'm going to actually ask this, Dr. Fraud, one of our, uh, one of our common dear friends and comrades, I'm wondering, we, what if I reached out to Kali Akuno at, at Cooperation Jackson and said, join me and Dr. Fraud on the Feldman show so we can talk about the water crisis happening yes. in context oh and talk yes. about, because what Cooperation Jackson is doing from my perspective is a lived example of everything that you just laid out. Absolutely it is. Absol that's a wonderful idea. And you know, the parts of this manifesto that have to do with the transformation of personal life were mainly my influence because that's also the whole point is to rescue people on a personal level as well, because loneliness kills. You know, one of the things that I've realized that I'm not gonna go into the whole DNA thing, but that when people are afraid and in capitalism, we are afraid. You're always afraid you're gonna lose your job. Everything is precarious. Relationships break down. Your body, gets ready for an emergency. It's either fight, flight, for men, it's fight or flight, for its women, it's fight or connect. But at any rate, your brain and body excrete cortisol, which represses your immune system. And if you're always tense, you're going to get cancer, you're going to get heart disease, you're going to get diabetes, you're gonna get all the things that plague this society because capitalism kills. Well said. That should be there too. Capitalism kills. Our, we'll talk about our life expectancy decreasing. It goes down every year. Every That's year. right. Dr. Harry Frott is the host of Capitalism Hits Home and it's not just in your head. Who are your co-hosts? My co-hosts are Liam in for Capitalism. It's not just in your head. Is Liam and um, Ikoi Hero. Liam Tate and Ikoi Hero. Fantastic. David Thank Cobb. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. What would you like to plug? I'd like to plug the Green Eco Socialist Network, where we're trying to bring together folks with an explicit anti capitalist lens to build towards eco socialism. It's eco socialism.org. And if anybody wants to reach out to me personally, uh, I'm on Twitter at David K. Cobb or on Facebook, what Kali Akuno calls old people social media at David Keith Cobb. Fantastic. Happy if late. If you want to reach me, H-F-R-A-A-D at gmail.com or my website, HarrietFraud.com. Thank you so much. Solid. Thank you. Thank you. Until Thank next you. week at 730. Yes. Happy Labor Day. You too. Oh, oh, this was a Labor Day. This is a Labor Day well spent. A labor, a labor of love. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Well, joining us is Ethan Hershenfeld. His book is Today Is Now, written by his alter ego, Dr. Samuel Benjamin. And he's joining us today. Where are you joining us, Dr. Samuel? I'm, I'm, I'm in Cape Cod. I'm uh here beneath uh, one of my partner's paintings. And uh, and when you say partner, you're in business with somebody? We sell trousers. <laughs> Sl and you're slacks, in slacks and dungarees. Trousers, <laughs> slacks and dungarees. <laughs> It's 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 quite a partnership. It's the tr it's the it's the trifecta. It's the trinity of lower suit wear, the dungaree slack, and the, well pantaloons. We used to also carry pantaloons, but th they went out of fashion. Yeah. Okay, so you're and, and you live together with your partner. yeah, but I don't say wife because we're not married, and I don't say girlfriend because that sounds puerile. Partner. Yeah. Partner, I just say partner, but I know it's not exactly right. But what do we say? My, you can't say like the, like my lover. That sounds very disturbing. How about, how about my lady? My lady, my lady, and she calls me my lord. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm entitled to the droit seigneur, I believe. Yeah, droit de seigneur. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Chicken, fish. Chicken, fish. Droit de seigneur. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most disturbing flight attendant in history. <laughs> warm nuts, warm nuts, warm nuts. Droit de seigneur. <laughs> that that would be uh, first class walking through coverage. Yeah, right. Yeah. Warm <laughs> towel, warm towel, warm towel. Droit de seigneur. <laughs> Explain, remind us what oh. what that is. Oh, if you're... Is my sound okay? Because I, I had to turn the air conditioner. No, it sounds really good. It sounds really good. It's a little cold in here. I wish you'd turn it down. But, okay. Uh, no. Um, senor. That's back in the day. In feudal times, if you were a serf or you were working for the, for the Lord, uh, he had a right to sleep with your wife just because you were part of his feudal uh, setup. You were just part of his whole... Rec his, the whole world was there for his recreation, right. including your wife. Right. I had an idea for a sketch for Saturday Night Live for Alec Baldwin, <laughs> where he was the Lord, and he was coming to the wedding. Perfect. For, for the drug yeah. senor, but everybody knew he was impotent. Oh. So that they would just, the peasants <laughs> would taunt the Lord of the Manor. Uh, it's very good casting. That is the right... Right. That's the right guy for that part. Yeah. So everybody's just making, like, teasing him. Oh, you get first dibs. I bet <laughs> yeah. you're going to have fun with her tonight. And uh, I think there were all these sort of uh, avant garde. Well, in the 60s, they were avant garde. But in Germany, all the opera directors would, would update. They still do it. It's 60 years later, but they're still doing. But the, that's exactly the kind of thing they would have done with Don Giovanni, because Don Giovanni and. Uh, um, Rather, Marriage of Figaro. In the Marriage of Figaro, it's the Count who, that's the whole, it's the whole story. The Count is horning in on this new couple. Figaro yeah. is marrying, yeah, Figaro is marrying this beautiful young Susanna. And there, in the opening scene, he's measuring the bed. And then it, it quickly, the anxiety he has that the, 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 the Count is just going to come sleep with his fiance. It's, that's part of what, what uh, drives the, stor the story. Um, so how does it turn out? Oh, what I was going to say, 
is Is that that, um, Figaro 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 comes from no that's the other that's the Rossini Figaro it's the same character but from a different composer same playwright basically Beaumarchais who says Figaro 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 the the, that's Figaro the barber yeah yeah but he's he's impersonating all the people who are always um hawking him to do this do that do that so he's he's in that moment in that aria he's saying I'm going crazy here everyone's calling out for me because he's the factotum of the city he does everything for everybody he's the barber but he's also the you know the shoemaker he does it all he'll do your taxes he'll fix your <laughs> engine he can, he can clean out your carburetor um, no um what I was gonna say was I'm sure that in one of those German avant-garde productions they made the count impotent just like in your in your Alec Baldwin sketch that idea is certainly in uh, it had to have made the rounds yeah. yeah because in in the opera we don't do they consummate or don't no they? no um yeah uh, oh what happens well it's a comedy so in the end it's a happy marriage I, I wouldn't I would be it would be hard for me even when I was in these operas it would have been hard for me in fact it was when people would say so what happens in the opera <laughs> I was terrible at giving the plot summary <laughs> like I, I subscribe to why doesn't he sleep with her um I've uh I don't know I can't remember I'm, I play my my role is like the old guy in that opera like in a lot of the operas Don Bartolo he's uh he's like a music teacher or like a and, an old party daddy remember of the music the music oh well I can remember like you know yeah I know a lot of that opera because there was a lot of also if you were a bass like I was if you were a, a bass with a slightly higher voice you could sing the role of Figaro that's sort of a bass baritone role I couldn't really sing that part but I was relegated to singing the old this old character who has one one funny aria uh in uh in the opera um about spreading rumors and how effective that can be oh no 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 that's the barber of seville see i'm i'm mix, mixing it all up um, how many years were you in opera it's been, <laughs> according to this interview about two how many years were you a professional opera singer? well i did it for a good 20 years uh i started taking lessons in the mid 90s early or late like 94 93 no 92 I started taking lessons and then I was singing until 2017 I guess so well I guess 25 years I did it but my first professional solo gig was in 98 so I had 20 years of solo uh, gigs yeah. were you doing stand-up also I did some stand-up in the late 90s and then I started pursuing the stand-up again 10 years ago and that was part of why I stopped singing because I couldn't do the stand-up and act and sing I sort of decided what, what two would, horses yes three horses no right but what would compel a young man to use <laughs> opera it's it's very <laughs> it's I have no idea it's uh it's uh I'll tell you what happened I mean I was now by, by the way you were going to yeshiva Robbie Benson I believe played you <laughs> go to your father uh, leaving the yeshiva to go sing opera. Asher, is that Asher Lev my name is Asher okay. Lev is that, yeah. um no I did theater you, in college and then I was doing what will you wake up one morning and say I'm I woke up I was like no <laughs> <laughs> I started I yawned I was like no um I uh I was doing some musical theater what I did some musical theater in college and then I got some jobs after college singing in musical theater like summer stock and then I was doing voice lessons and teacher said you know you should study opera because your voice is better suited to that because sorry I yelled into the mic people that's oh, it's a loud art form opera um I'm trying yeah, that was what Pavarotti actually said. He said, "You yeah, first you you yell very very loud, and then you make it beautiful." <laughs> That's he, that was his explanation of how to sing opera. You studied voice. Yeah, with a few different teachers privately. The last guy I studied with is an amazing guy named Armin Boyajan. Boyajan, he still teaches. He's uh, he's not young. Uh, when I started with him, he was he was younger, but. Uh, 
just an incredible teacher and I worked with him for yeah for about 20 of those years yeah for 20 years and what kind of training goes into it because you're not using microphones right right no microphones uh, a lot of mirrors though uh, a lot of, no I'm kidding. Um, the, the push a lot of push-ups and squats and the clean and jerk and no the exercises are um, vocalizing like you would uh, you know work on the different vowels and uh, then work on agility and work on give me an example of working on the vowels and then give me an example of agility I can't do agility that was never my thing that was something I had to work to I'd like to sing Handel's Messiah for example that takes a bunch of it's called coloratura it's where you're moving very fast between the notes on a, on a single vowel and so that I was able to do that with a lot of training with the help of this teacher but some people have that naturally. But so for the vowels, like my first teacher was this great guy. He was an Italian tenor, an amazing guy named Franco Corelli. If you want to hear some great operatic singing, go on YouTube, get his CDs, Corelli, C-O-R-E-L-L-I, Franco. I studied with him in, in the, around 94, 95. And he had me doing an exercise that just sounded like this. For the, very, for the first few weeks, I would see him once a week. And the exercise was like this. It goes like this. Ma, ma, ma. Ma, ma, ma. Ma, ma. You get it. It's very boring. It's the word mama. And it's just a descending triad and then moving up through the scale. Very Oedipal. <laughs> it's very Oedipal. And I was very impatient. And I said to him, probably week four, I said, how long are we going to do this? You know, I was eager. I until I get to say da da. <laughs> yeah, or in any case, he, I said, you know, I'm enough with the mama. He said, I did the mama for six months in the conservatory. <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> no, he basically, he was like, you got to, if you, if you can't do this perfectly, then we're not moving on. It was that sort of approach. And every day you practiced yeah but i was very undisciplined i did not i could have probably gotten better the results. first opera you landed the first thing i sang in solo was uh, a production of la boheme at an incre incredible place called the amato opera which was down on the bowery it's no longer there they knocked it down but this guy tony amato from the bronx he actually dug the orchestra pit like with a shovel dug out the dirt he had this little put some, put some people in it covered <laughs> it and said all right now let's do an opera sing loud so they can't hear, hear the screams huh sing loud so they can't hear the screams <laughs> um no he had this place the amato opera for like 40 or 50 years it was a, a converted tenement building on the bowery which he painted white and it had the black lettering and everything he made a theater there so i got to sing a few things there and then i went to then i went to the aspen music festival in school that summer in the summer 96 and two years later i had my first solo gig which was a, a magic flute it was a tour in sweden i was just telling my dad about that the other day it was terrifying because they, this, there was a Polish base that I was replacing. They, he couldn't get a visa. So um, I had auditioned for these people a few months before. They called me. They said, so they got me a flight. I flew to, to, to Sweden. And I got to the hotel. And they met me. And it was a touring company from Switzerland. And the woman said to me, okay, so welcome. Here's your breakfast. So the show tonight is at, and I said, the what? And she said, the show. I said, when's rehearsal? She said, no, 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 the show is tonight. So it's I was stepping, I have it was a nightmare. It was the actor's nightmare. Not only that, but I had been learning. I knew the role, but the mon like the dialogue parts of it, it's a Mozart opera with some hefty dialogue. I knew my dialogue, but in English. So I had to, on the plane, learn my dialogue in German. Do you have a cue card guy? There's no cue card guy, but there was a guy in the chorus who knew this part very well. So he could kind of like, he was, he could kind of help me out a little bit. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't need it, but it was very, it was terrifying. It was a terrifying experience. And also, I hadn't gotten to walk on the stage, so what I didn't know was this grand entrance. Since it was a touring opera, so the sets were like two by fours. It was very chintzy. And we went to like 12 different cities in Sweden and a couple in Norway. And so when I made my first grand entrance, this guy's like a big priest character. I make a big grand entrance with the robes on, stepping 
with great grace and power. I tripped over a two by four that was on the ground that was holding the doorway. So that was my entrance. I was backstage um, in between numbers, really plotting my escape. I was thinking, can I get a taxi to the airport right now and fly back to New York? This is this was a this was How like long did it last? baptism by fire. It was like two and a half weeks, the tour. It was March of 98. And, and by the end? I wasn't tripping and I was feeling okay about it. You were feeling okay about it. This is such an alien yeah. concept. The idea well, it was that, alien to me, it was, and I was doing it. You I can't imagine you being so funny and brilliant, wanting to be an opera singer, and then landing gig. Did you think this was going to last? What did, where'd you, how'd you think it was going to play out? Well, I was very ambitious and I thought, okay, I have to sing at the Met. I have to sing at the Met Metropolitan Opera. But I, you know, along the way, I started to get some jobs in Europe and I had an agent in Italy. So I got a lot of jobs there. I liked being in Italy. I liked singing over there. But it was weird. I, I think my most, the most fun I would have was when I would do an audition and then get, get hired. I didn't love a lot of the work itself, um, but I was very careerist. Like I was very ambitious. So part of what was sustaining it was, oh my God, I'm getting better gigs. I'm getting to sing in better theaters. I'm getting better roles. It was also the joy of working with that teacher. That was a great experience because he was, you know, but it was hard. It's like, like stand wood. up, stand up. Like I know where it's leading. You get a, a deal for a sitcom oh. and it never happens. And then you remain bitter for the rest of your life. Right. That's, that's the path I know. W so, where are we going with opera singer? I wasn't. What's the end game here? What, what, what? You know, like, I guess like Mao had a five year plan. Stalin had a seven year plan. I had like a three year plan. I think I, I didn't have I didn't I wasn't really thinking that far ahead. I, I, I just really wanted to to get re get really good at it and get more successful at it. And for a while there, I made an OK living at it. That was exciting. Was there like a Robin Williams of opera who you could say, <clears throat> if only I could be this person well there was a guy who studied actually with my teacher a guy named samuel ramey who was the great base of the second half of the 20th century studied with my teacher an american guy incredible singer but i never really had a realistic expectation of being able to sing like the guy he had a god-given just swore so huge i got walk to into it like robin he could walk into an opera and bump you and saying we're doing the magic flute tonight <laughs> They didn't, luckily, they did not have that. Don't get bumped yeah. in, a, in an opera house? No, but you can get bumped by your throat. Like, I got a very good gig singing that same role in Stuttgart in Germany. Very good opera house. It was very exciting for me. It was 2005. I thought, this is a big moment. They're, they're inviting me over as a guest for a week to sing three performances in this lead role in this opera. That was a big deal. I got freaking bronchitis. So I was then there seeing a doctor in Stuttgart trying to quickly knock this thing out. I only had like three rehearsals. Didn't knock it out. Tried one performance. My throat, I was a mess. Had to cancel the second two performances. Nightmare. So it was, there's a lot of pressure in that business. Your voice has to be right on. So, yeah. But I wanted to say, I did get to sing with that guy, Samuel Ramey, once in Genoa in a production of Billy Budd. He played the villain, this guy Clagger. Did you play? I was... I think I told you this once. I was uh, Lieutenant Ratcliffe, not Radcliffe, Ratcliffe, one of the three officers who does the tribunal that sends Billy Budd to his death. By the way, it's an incredible story. It's it's a Melville uh, uh, masterpiece. How erotic, as I remember. It's very hot. Yeah, it's very. Yeah, it's very gay. Um, Carmela, or Carmela and the Sopranos couldn't believe that it was homoerotic did you ever see that episode no oh okay oh it's, it's um revisiting oh that's funny yeah. oh i did once see uh billy budd in munich at the opera house the bavarian state opera and this was what i was talking about with those ridiculous avant-garde in quotes productions they had all the sailors for the entire show wearing regular men's uh sailor outfits like you would but they were all wearing pumps and assless chaps. No, but they were all wearing pumps. The entire opera, they were wearing women's shoes. This was the director's great concept to underline the homoerotic uh, subtext. Right. Anyhow. Do you yeah. call it, when you're part of it, do you call it Billy? Bud? I'm doing Bud tomorrow. I'm doing Billy? 
doing BB. Let's call it Billy Bud. But yeah, there were those sort of abbreviations. Billy yeah. Bud. So yeah. They should do like the, they should do it at the Grand Old Opry and call it Billy Bud. Is the Grand Old Opry an opera Ooh. house or an Opry house? And what's the difference between an Opry house and an opera house? And why don't we do Billy Bud at the Grand Old Opry? It's very. It's not very tuneful. It's uh, Benjamin Britten. It can kind of twist your ear. Uh, mm -hmm. It grows on you. That's the thing with some of the good. That was the interesting thing I learned when I got hired to sing contemporary music. The it always most contemporary music, uh, which would be anything after like you know, nineteen twenty. Most of those operas sounded like a headache when you first listen to them. The good ones, after a few weeks of rehearsing, they start to sound good. The bad ones remain sounding like a headache. That was my experience. Hey, Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom. Yes, sir. Are we doing the quiz? Are we going to do it with Lane? What's the schedule look like? Um, I I am scheduled for 9 o'clock. I have a quiz ready. Um, if you're tight on time, we could save it for Thursday. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I like to humiliate my guests. And, and when is Lane from CM coming on? Um, he is scheduled for 9.30. Who's scheduled between 9 and 9.30? Me. Ah. Oh. And, and do we have Professor Marianne? Aha. Uh -huh. I don't think so. Hmm. Uh, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we talk a little more with Opera Guy? Formerly get to the bottom of this and then why don't i challenge lane from cm and ethan hershenfeld to uh be humiliated by me sounds great so there's lane from cm and we'll talk about liz truss oh my god that pim by the way the, the guy mentioned that new york just times op-ed for one second no no just do that with the eye line just do the whole interview like that <laughs> just stay stay with us like that just good that's good <laughs> do you know wayne i do i'm a i'm a fan he is, he is i'm a fan man. of his art and his music he is a uh one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Seriously. Go so okay, just uh <laughs> so let's go back to opera. Do you listen okay. to opera when you're alone? Do you turn on the opera? I do not. No. Did you watch opera when you, did you did your father and mother take you to the opera as no. a kid? No, they did not. No. In, there was in, no in, good explanation. there was no good explanation, David. I I uh I got into it through the singing and a teacher, and then I was interested in it. It was it attracted me the way I think people get attracted to like jujitsu or uh, woodworking, where it's like here's a, a thing I have some ability with, and it seems very difficult, and I'm going to practice it for years and get good at it. It had that satisfaction. Did you ever see the movie Pretty Woman? I have to say, I, I saw it with a member of my family, and we both walked out. We thought this is. Okay. Some of the worst trash in history. Richard, uh, I, I, yes, falls yeah. in love with a hewer played. Hey. <laughs> and, Roberts. I know he he sheds a tear at the opera, which is I know I uh, an ex of mine. She pointed out that in every opera, when they want to signal that a man is sensitive, they have a scene where he's at the opera and he sheds a tear. So he says to this hewer, "Is that <laughs> what Julie Roberts? Am I going to get?" It's Labor Day. Give no, me she's a, that's correct. That is a correct job description. <laughs> she, he fell in love with a prostitute who had no pimp, right? Pimpless? Huh? He was pimpless? She was no, pimpless? She was pimpless. It was like a, you know, it was an adorable life for her. Right. And, which very uh, good... <laughs> Good idea to portray that lifestyle. Yeah, freelance. Yeah, she's a gig worker. Yeah. And uh, he says you he says the opera, you either get it or you don't. 
and he takes her to the opera for the first time and, and she, she really gets it and i didn't get it and i walked out of the movie <laughs> like what, what the, i don't get this you know thing. one of the most beloved operas of all time is la traviata by, by verdi and that's about a who uh, a guy who falls so, in love with let's, let, I, I, You know what? I, I shouldn't be doing that. Tears of a clown. He falls in love with a hooker. She's called a courtesan. It's a very nice word in French. Yes. She's a courtesan. And he falls in love with her. But she falls ill with tuberculosis. She and falls in love with tuberculosis. He, it's a love triangle between the tenor, the soprano, and tuberculosis. Ah. Yeah. So yeah. He, hold it. Isn't... Who's the clown? That's Pagliacci. That's a whole other thing. That's another opera. Yeah. But... The No More Rice Krispies song. I remember that ad. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a tenor. I couldn't, I Did shouldn't have even that tried that. Did they turn the No More Rice Krispies ad into an opera? Well, that's funny. That's where that comes from. I actually have never seen that opera, and I know nothing about it because there's really no bass in it. I, if there was no role in an opera for me, I, I just ignored it because I was just in it for the jobs. Mm -hmm. How bright are the opera audiences? Eh. No, I think, uh, you know. But it's like if, if you take a, like the New York Jets audience, like that, that would be a little bit probably less bright, but like, like, a, like a TED Talk audience would probably be a little brighter. I don't know. What do I know? I don't know. Are you getting the best of the best in an opera house? Are these the most? Because it's it's to me it's so elite, and I just think. The I don't know. I think it has that um, stink about it in America, but in Europe, you can really get a cheap ticket. And people in a lot of towns, especially in Germany, every city has its own opera house, and people go to it. So it has a much more, uh, much more populist vibe. You get rich being an opera singer. Oh yeah, you can if you're if you're right at the upper. But you can make a. Let me put it this way, as a a working opera singer you can make a much better living than just a working stand-up in other words like the t if you're getting hired as a soloist in a decent opera house you're making a good fee for the show whereas as a as a good comic in a comedy club they could still be giving you 25 bucks really you can make you get that <laughs> what's the what do you have the email for that booker where are you performing stand-up next? So Saturday night, I'm at a private party in Ardsley. They, these people in Westchester, they saw me at the comic strip, and they hired me to perform at their party, which is very nice. And then... Yardsley is a very fancy place. Ardsley, it's, uh, it should be a little schmancy. Yeah, I Yardsley. like it. I, yeah. Yes, that's near, uh, whatchamacallit, Dobbs oh. Ferry. Yeah, it's up there, yeah. Um, Oh, October, uh, November 5th, I'm, I'm going to plug this in more detail coming up, but some guy is producing what he's calling the vegan comedy show. All the comedians, I think. Okay. All right. So I'm already repeating myself. But plug it. Okay. There it was. November 5th, vegan comedy show. I got to get the details. I screwed up. I was supposed to get you the details. Also, new book by Dr. Benjamin in the works. Today, everybody has to go by right now, Today is Now, by Dr. Samuel Benjamin, that is written by Ethan's alter ego. We love yes. Ethan. He is the, so funny. <clears throat> Support. <clears throat> I got something in my throat. Let me... Uh, Remember, <clears throat> both the vocal pedagogy, vocal pedagogy, they would tell you just swallow instead of going, <clears throat> go like this. Let me try this. <laughs> no, didn't didn't do it. Uh, right. Okay, that that did. Oh, Feldman University, that's amazing. Look at that. Uh, uh, 
Hey, that let, let me try something else. Let me just, let me clear my throat. Wow. Yeah, that's better. I uh, joy. So uh, Lane from CM and Ethan Hershenfeld. Let me introduce Lane. Hey, Lane. Lane. Hi, Ethan. Cheers. Hi, Feldo. Hi, Feldo. Now you're wearing Feldman University Church of what? Christ. Christ. Yeah. Oh my God. I forgot that you had that hat. I'm, I made this about oh two years ago. Wow. Well, I didn't actually make the hat. You know, I had it done. And, and you're you're in, you're in Great Britain. I'm That's looking up. I'm looking up Seam. You're on the beach, it looks like. Yes. Oh, yes. It's rather lovely here. Wow. And you have yeah. a new, you're going to have a new prime minister named Truss. And I'm wearing my Truss real tight in honor of your new prime minister. I'm squeezing my hernia real tight. <laughs> oh, my Truss. You know what? You know what? She wouldn't have gone on this path if only her mother had given her my little pony. And um, took her on walks or something. That's all right. That's what she says. She went. She used to get dragged around peace marches and stuff. Um, um by her mother, and she went. I didn't get my little ponies. And she said this in a speech, and she was almost in tears. I was like, oh god. So you know, just a one my little pony from my mother would have not. Brought this about so is not. she worse than Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher? How bad? It's, is she? it's quite difficult to tell because Thatcher was an ideologue and she was very intelligent, so she was really bad. Theresa May wasn't really an ideologue, it was also very intelligent, it was very bad. Liz Truss is literally just listening to think tanks. Right. She has no real opinion of her own, but she hates her mummy and daddy for <laughs> making her into right. a hippie, basically. So it's like, it's scary. She's quite dangerous, I think. Yeah, I, I want to get one of those gigs, like Charlie Kirk from Turning Points, where they just give you a loose leaf binder filled with talking points. And, and, you, and you do sound smart. Well, she point. doesn't. She doesn't even sound smart. That's the weird thing. But that's where we are, and it's going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be interesting to see how Labour respond, basically, because. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? Quizmaster Dan Frankenberger is here. Well, let's talk British politics after I humiliate you. Excellent. Okay, so I'm all for a bit of humiliation. I'm British. Okay. We pay good money for that stuff, and uh, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, 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 okay. Just I'm to... not sticking around for this humiliation, am I? Yeah, of course you are. You prepare to oh. be humiliated, Ethan. Oh dear. Oh yeah. dear. Yes. Shall we talk? <laughs> shall we talk like uh, early twentieth century thespians for the rest of the proceedings? Here, yeah, yeah. here. Tell yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, let's talk like okay. lesbians. So. Right then. Right then. Carry on, carry on. Yes. Please welcome our quiz master, Dan Frankenberger. <laughs> hello, hello. Yes, hello, Daniel. How are you? This David, can you put some money in the posh. kitty? This is very posh, Dan. It's 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 going to be very. Yes. Okay. You want? You have the hat of a peasant, Dan. Okay. You have I'm a peasant's gonna... hat. Let me put some money in the kitty. Ooh, we're paying. We're playing for a lot of money. Okay. On September fourth, eighteen eighty-eight, an American inventor, industrialist, and philanthropist patented his product and trademarked his company name. He invented a dry plate process and established a factory in Rochester, New York. And was one of the first firms in America to establish a plant for large-scale production of a standardized products, and to maintain a fine chemical laboratory. This person was George Eastman of the Eastman oh, Kodak Company. Right. And today's Kodak. quiz is on cameras. Cameras. And I believe he committed suicide. I don't know. I, I believe he did. I, I, I think he did. 
Mm. We have six questions. Found out his granddaughter was marrying Paul McCartney. <clears throat> different. Is it Eastman. the same family? Is it the same ones? No, different Eastman. All right, there you go. Feldo, you swine. So we have six questions, and we're going to go with uh, Lane first, then Ethan, then David. And they're Lane, all multiple choice. Ethan, and David. And I believe that is correct. And I get five points. David is in the lead. Here we go. Question number one. Kodak produced a basic box camera from 1900 until the 1960s. What was its name? Is it the Kodak Scout, the Kodak Brownie, the Kodak Guide, or the Kodak Kodak Bobodak Banana Fana Fofodak? <laughs> <laughs> it was the Kodak Brownie or the Box Brownie. Yes. Lane says uh, Brownie. How about you, Ethan? I concur. Yes. Well done, Ethan. Yeah. Good show. Well done. Very, very good. Good show. Good show. Yeah. I, I think uh, Lane is right. The correct answer is the brownie. That is correct. Good. Well played. Yeah, bravo. Bravo. All. So Lane gets one point. Ethan gets one point. And I believe I get it. Five points. <laughs> it's, it's tied. Question number two. Ethan is first. What is a nuki? Is it a close-up attachment designed to fit a screw mount like a camera? Is it a technique for taking photographs in a challenging light condition? Is it a now obsolete type of color film that preceded Technicolor? Or is it something we don't talk about in family quizzes? It's the one. It's the first one. It's that mount. Close-up mm. attachment designed to fit a screw mount camera. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Feldman. I'm going to agree just because I don't know the answer. Okay. Lane from CM. I'm going to be a complete and utter dullard and agree as well. Uh, the correct answer is uh, A. You're all correct. No key. Then well done. I merely guess. Nookie. Little Nookie. Is that because three. when you have a nookie, there's an attachment, there's a moment where you attach? Yeah, sorry. Um, um, I, see yeah. Where you go. I see where you're going. There. Mm -hmm. Question number three, David is first. Which Get hit the fuck up, you lazy bastard. Sorry. <laughs> Which Hitchcock film masterpiece featured a photographer who used his camera to look into the lives of his neighbors, then began to suspect the woman had been murdered? Was it Notorious, North by Northwest, Rear Window, or Peekaboo ICU? Peekaboo ICU. That's where you go after a <laughs> hide and go seek accident, and you go to the Peekaboo ICU. Peekaboo ICU is when you've been. That's a tough one. Let me think. Let me. Th I'm going to take a wild guess. What are they again? What, what, what are the choices here? Notorious, mm. North by Northwest, mm. Rear Window, or Peekaboo ICU. I'm going to just take a wild guess here. I'm going to say Rear Window. Lane from CM. Oh, uh, well, I, I, you see, I'm, I'm going to see Wild Rear Window too. So, uh, yeah, wild, Rear Window. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a fantastic adult film over the weekend called Rear Widow. <laughs> <laughs> About a Calipidian. Which, but no, I'm, I'm going to agree. Did I'm going to agree. A nookie when they were it. It's Rear Window. Uh, the correct answer, made in 1954, James Stewart played a photographer, and it was Rear Window. <laughs> and who's the bad guy now? The guy with the camera? Oh, Lee J. Cobb. Raymond Burr. Oh, Raymond Burr. <laughs> Raymond Burr. All right. And there was an opera singer in it. Oh, in one of the apartments? Yeah. Wow. Grace Kelly. Hmm. She was an opera singer. Yeah. 
That's right. Question number four, Lane is first. Oh, well, hang on, it's tied one, one, one. What, what question is this? This is question number four. Four. Hold it, I only have, I haven't been keeping score. But we've all been keeping everything no right. No one, everyone's gotten everything right. So we're all at even, Steven. Let me just turn my brain on. My brain is, okay, I'm just getting, getting the old. The noggin. Yeah, the noggin isn't, here we go. It's hot in here. That's not my brain. All right. Dan, where are you located? Rochester. Oh, nice. Oh, that's the, the Eastman. Okay, got Hey-do. it. All right. Lane, the film speed refers to how long it takes to develop film, how fast film moves through the film transport system, how sensitive the film is to light, or a movie about a bus that might explode. It is it. Well, light export. I'm going to say the exposure. What? No. Go through it again. Uh, the film speed refers to how long it takes to develop film, how fast yes. film moves through no. a film transport system, uh-huh. how sensitive the film is to light, or a movie about a bus that might explode. Sensitive to light. How sensitive the film is to light. Ethan. That is correct. Yes, that is correct. You are all correct. You guys are on fire. So it's just tied up. No one's wrong. Hmm. You're the best around. There's nothing ever going to keep you down. You're the best. Okay. Question number five, Mr. And Lane, Lane, can you open your mouth for one second? <laughs> That's the only way I could you know. <laughs> I it's t- I thought I was gonna destroy these people, Dan. <laughs> this is humiliating. You got two questions left, but Ethan is first. By the way, Ethan. I think it's very rude to come on my show. And Sorry. Try to beat me. <laughs> okay. Ethan, in photography, what controls the exposure? Is it the tripod and lens cap, the shutter speed and aperture, the carrying case and strap, or the flash and the trench coat? <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, shutter speed and aperture, according to someone in the chat. So I'm going to oh! go. Oh. oh my god no wonder everyone's getting everything right this here. is this is corruption on the order of no no no. i'm kidding i knew that i knew that I, that's not yeah, I was just, yeah, yeah. it's john as, hayes he's ruining everything as an addendum to my answer i said as i see in the chat typical bloody american this is lane this is a cheating scandal <laughs> this is like payola hang on yeah. and ethan, ethan? Open your mouth. <laughs> oh boy. Now I thought it was a flushing sound, but now I hear what it is. That's horrific. <laughs> this is So David, what is your what is your answer? What controls the exposure? Uh, Tripod and lens cap, shutter speed and aperture, carrying case and strap, or the flash and the trench coat? The same thing that controls my morning constitutional, the aperture. Oh. Mr. Lane. It's the aperture, the yes. Yeah. You're yeah. all correct again. Yeah. What's the answer? You're all correct. Shutter speed mm. aperture. I know. Yeah. All right, final, final question. Yeah, hang on. I have to the chat room. I apologize, but this I I have to go to the chat room and straighten these people out because they are feeding answers. They're trying to disrupt the show. I'll be right back. I'm gonna let me hold my breath. We're gonna castigate them. I'm going into the chat room. Oh my god, you people are disgusting. 
Knock it off. What's that smell? Knock the bloody dog up. Stop interrupting my show. Stop with this cheating. People are. Let me go into. Dan, I'm going into the kitchenette. These people are grotesque. All right, I'm leaving. It's, I, oh, man. Are I you need, okay? I need to take a shower. Hang on. <laughs> Ethan, uh, you know, they call radio the theater of the mind. <laughs> this is theater of the ass. The better man. <laughs> the better man. I had him on the show. No, hang on. I had Mr. Methane on my show. Oh, wow. Yes. Seven years ago. Yes, uh, I remember that. You do remember. I had Mr. Yes. Meath on the show. Yeah, man. Is he still around? Not got a clue. Okay. Not got a clue. Mr. Methane. All right, come on. Last question. Let's do oh, this. Oh, so, what, what do you have to hear in Cape Cod? I have stuff I have to eat. I mean, do. I have stuff I have to do. Last question. David is first. Almost from the time they first came about, cameras have been used for military purposes. In 1905, the U.S. Army experimented with aerial photographs. What kind of aircraft was used? Was it what year? What year is this? 1905. 1905. Was it a hot air balloon, a kite, a hydrogen blimp, or a mouse-ridden air shaft? <laughs> Nineteen oh five. Let me think. Uh, a kite. A blimp. A blimp. I don't think they had bl blimps. What are the choices again? I'll just check them off here first. Hot air. Hot air balloon. Kite. Hot air balloon. Hot air blimp. balloon could be, but it's for the military, right? Correct. Hot air balloon could be recognized. So I'm going to say no to that. I remember that from F Troop. Remember E.T.'s balloon? And they got identified. So the balloon's a bad idea. So you got balloon, kite, and plane, right? I'm going to go with Blimp. kite. I'm going to go with kite. Lane? Mr. Airplane, not to you. Doesn't even know. Because it's American. I don't get a stop. Only joke. Um, I don't know, but I'm going to say balloon. Oh, so we're going to have a winner tonight. Yeah. Or you're at least going to have a loser. Yeah. All of us. Well, I know the Navy used kites, but I don't know if it's the whole using a camera thing, so I'm not sure. So, again, it's kite, blimp, or what? Balloon. Or Droite Senor. I thought a blimp is a balloon. But I'm going to go with balloon. Balloon. The correct answer is a kite. <laughs> In all fairness. I won. I defeated Lane and Ethan. Now, in you all win at least one. Oh, I do. In, in all fairness, Dan gives me the answers before the show starts. However, I'm old, and it's a, you know for me to remember what the end. How does you that deserve feel? to win? You deserve all the victories. Yeah, yeah just take it. Take a victory yeah. lap. Well, Be humble. Um, because you came in second, Lane. Open your mouth. I'm not opening my mouth. Ah. I refuse to take part in this ridiculous charade. And Ethan, uh, bend over to tie your shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. God. It's so much more civilized in this room on Thursday nights. <laughs> Jesus, what's going on here? The quiz is over, gentlemen. The quiz is over. Great job, Dan Frankenberger. This well is played. Great. Well played, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Thank you, and God bless. And uh, nice to see you over there, Lane. Bye, bye, Ethan. Peace. You're a scholar and a gent. That's You're a scholar and a gentleman. Thank you. Dan has something on the barbecue that he has to get to. Peace.
Thank you. Thank you. Lane from Sam, thank you for joining us. Let's Wait. let's talk about British politics. So the the Queen of England, when does she sprinkle the, the fairy dust on Liz Truss and say, give me a government? I'm not altogether sure. It should be tomorrow, but that, it's going to involve uh, trips and all the way to Scotland. By, ooh, people can. Usually, is she, um, hmm? is she at Balmoral's? Does she make yeah. it? Yeah. She's about to pop her clogs. Well, she, I, I, don't, I don't know if she's that ill, but she just can't be asked. So she's up there. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not recuperating. Something like that. But anyhow, so Liz has got to go up to Balmoral, which is just near Aberdeen, right in the northeast of Scotland. And do what you, whatever you do with all that. Probably yeah. get a left nipple out and pull her right leg up or something. I don't know. Yeah. And she is filling out Boris Johnson's term. Or how do you know yeah. when to call an election in Great Britain? We've got a, every five years, we have an election. Unless there's something like, it's up to the, the government itself, like the Tories could call an election. I never but understand why do, if you're in charge and you got a nice thing going, you're, you know, you're, you're the Tories, you're ruining Great Britain, you got your friends getting rich, you're going to destroy the NIH. Why do you agree to a, like a no confidence vote or why do you hold a new election and with the threat of losing power? Well, sometimes it's used as a means of suppressing power. They did, they did that with Corbyn in 2017 and then uh, 2019. Um, partly because of Brexit as well, though. Because Brexit was stagnating and there was no real vision. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also a means of, we've got, to, we've got to nip this lad in the bud. That's why in the 2017 election, because he came so close, their asses fell out. So, like, as much as he was demonized before 2017, between 2017 and 2019, the next election, which the Tories called, um, the entire British establishment jumped on his head, tried to stomp him down. But before he's... that, he was sort of seen as a not to be taken that seriously and he would never win type of thing. But he sneaked up. Is there a buyer's remorse? with Brexit. Yes. Is it well deserved? In other words, did everything fall apart as we as we're beginning cuz it is now you are in a state of Brexit. Is that correct? Yes, but the sort of, they've got a get out clause the both the Brexit lot and the remain lot actually because of COVID. Uh, the, the, the Brexit lot are saying, well, you can't blame everything on Brexit because COVID screwed everything up. Right. And the remain, the fundamentalist remain lot, the, what you'd call, if you, if, you wanted, if you went on Twitter and typed in hashtag FBPE, Fox, Lord, Bravo, Papa, Echo, um, they're the like, fundamentalist remainers who just like, Gen generally, generally centrists who don't give a shit about the poor and think every, think every single person who voted Brexit was racist. And right. they weren't. But all the racists did. <laughs> I anyway, see. But, but um, so they, they use... They say, oh, it's not COVID, it was Brexit. So every, every failure that we've had in the last couple of years... The Brexit lot have blamed on COVID and every failure we've had in the last couple of years. The fundamentalist remainers have blamed on Brexit. So it sort of balances it, itself out. It, ultimately, both sides, the lot that are totally entrenched in it, are just arseholes. Now, before the show started, you were telling me that you believe Boris Johnson invented COVID, so he would have something to blame Brexit. Yeah, he, still yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, he did. No. I didn't say that, fellow. I know. I'm just teasing. <laughs> but it wouldn't surprise us. <laughs> when do we find out? 
do we have to wait uh, until COVID is over 100 years from now to, to learn whether or not it's a bad idea? Or is it just generally a bad idea to want to keep immigrants out and not? Well, want to... certain things have came into place that they're, they are a visible response to Brexit. Things like um, at the moment, our exports and as a result, our imports. But our exports are taken. Now, let me get this straight, because it's always confusing in Great Britain. Your imports are our exports, and our exports are your imports. It's, it's, like, it's, it's so backwards, but like you si drive on the wrong side of the road, and I like you call uh, American bananas imports. We but they're actually we call them exports i don't know what you have a, you remember w bush or you, or you played with that huh w did that didn't he he said yeah. most of our exports go abroad did he say that <laughs> not all of them you know you the export things in germany apparently in america i don't get that anyway um but um so most of our exports are failing to leave because now instead of under free movement through the Channel Tunnel, things just went, and on on the ferries and stuff, yeah, they just went because it was free movement. But now it's taken like a long time for things to leave. So products getting onto the continent from Britain are like, if the time critical, like food and stuff, it's wasted. And equally, because they they're pissed off, they they have refused to sell and. It's apparently, it's quicker for us to have things imported marginally, mm -hmm. but but at the same time, because it's everything's a trade, uh, where you're getting less things like fruit and stuff, but also you've got the COVID, the the regulations around that sort of hampered everything, and now of course with all the floods and the fires and shit, so you can't. It's it's difficult to Can it's difficult to tear apart. Right. What Our... the problems are. Are people blaming Brexit for inflation? Again, right? People, people. Some people are. Right. It's the same. It's the same argument. Um, <laughs> most people don't care anymore. It's it's a bit like the own and the libs thing. Um, most of the hard Brexiters, I mean, they just as they wanted to just they'll they'll stick with Brexit no matter what. They could literally be stood on fire. <laughs> right. And it's by a guy saying, this is because of Brexit. They're going, keep piling on the flames. It's like it's it's gone demented. But that's what's how, happened how, how across similar, the West, I think. How I think similar is trust to uh, the Republicans here in the United States? It, is she as vile? As, yeah. Really? Yeah. More, I'd say, more vile, oddly than Boris. No, no, I'm, Boris, talking about, I'm talking about American Republicans, not Boris. I'm talking about like he, talking, he is an American Republican. Well, he is American. He was born in New York. Yeah, yeah, but they're not as vile as our Republican Party. Not really. openly, not openly, but they've got similar views on trans and stuff and. Um, so they're not not as open and brazen about it, but a Brit Britain's like that anyway. We've always been sort of like it's shadowy and it's stiff of a lip and all that stuff, and, and keeping the, cards close to your chest. And she says she's anti woke. Yes. So they've manufactured this in great britain as well it's an internet thing so it's global it's everywhere um the i've mentioned the chat earlier today because she's being promoted to all the right-wing arseholes the males especially are rubbing the noses of labor in it because this is the third female prime minister um uh, the Tories have had 
and Labour have yet to have even a female leader of the party, whether they were in power or not, which is a justifiable, you know, but it is a shameful thing. But the, 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 the no, the, they're trying to push it as a notion that we are more feminist than Yao. But they're not, because each fucking one of these women has been vehemently anti-single mum, um, pretty much em- impoverished single mothers trust will do the same. Um, and so, like, yeah, it's like a token feminism for what what that's what they'll use all the time against Labour. Um, call yourself liberal, call yourself woke, and they're also using it to sort of attack trans as well. Because saying you lot don't even know what a woman is, and because the the Tories are very much again the sort of divided behind the scenes, but openly, the current um, crew who are running things in the Tories are very much anti-trans. And Labour not saying anything, which is worse. They're not taking a position. Under Corbyn, they would have been pro-trans. In America, yeah. we're worried about fascism. You're already there. Yeah, yeah. We have been for a while, I think. Minus the military and stuff. Like, oh, thankfully, I keep saying this to you a lot every week. Um. We're lucky because we don't have guns on the streets everywhere. We have them, but not they're not as not just you kind of just pick them up in a shop. Um so it's a sort of um see what you've got to you've got to understand Britain's probably the most surveilled country. So like people pretty much people pretty paranoid. Surveilled the streets are surveilled, but they're not listening in on your phone calls. Mm, more than likely are but that that's uh, the daily mail listening to mm. Charles. no no more than likely are and they all date the mine and stuff if you look at cambridge analytica the data they got for brexit and stuff um they got da- data on everyone that was the whole thing about Dominic Cummins' as rise to prominence under Boris Johnson. Um, he was the data guy. Right, right. The data analyst. And they want to destroy NIH, the conservatives. They hate, they hate NIH, right? NIH. Your healthcare system. Oh, NHS. The National Health Service, yes. So says you. Here in America, we call your health care NIH. That's you where you're going wrong. You've got, to, you've got to get the term right first, and then... Yes, NHH. Right, uh, yes. The, it's, it's, been a, it's been a determination since the Tories got into power as soon as the NHS had been implemented. They were like, you should, we shouldn't have it. You should have it for a couple of years, and then, but they've eroded it for years and years and years. Thatcher was started the she didn't introduce privatization as much as started to underfund it a lot. So it started people started to moan about the NHS and the the waiting times got like astronomically long and stuff. But the good old Tony Blair from New Labour, he opened the door to privatization. He was he it's the Chomsky thing of, you know, um you defund a public service so that it runs badly. People get angry at it enough to the, the point where they accept private companies taking it over. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. And Blair opened the door for that. With them. Um, so, and the current incumbents, Keir Starmer's not, they're all very much in the Blair mold. They haven't gone as far as renaming the party than... Because Blair literally rebranded the entire party. It was no longer the Labour Party. It was called New Labour for a reason. It was a break free from the unions. He let the past. That's old school. He really, said he, he really said he wanted a break. From the grip of the unions, yeah. They had too much power in the party. Um, 
and we're finding right now because just about everybody's on strike in Britain now. It's like this far for me in a general strike. Um, and have the have the unions been as decimated? I can't imagine unions. They're not. They're not. They're still not huge. They're not like they should be. I don't know what the, the current figures are, but when I was a union rep, um, so thirty percent of the people in my company, at least, was there wasn't enough. 30 percent. We were see with a lot of people because you get advantages from the union anyway or across the board. They didn't feel the need to join. Like, oh, we're going to get the benefits anyway. It's like, well, yeah, but you're still right. Anyway. It's like but, France, um, France has low union membership because the country provides protections for labor yeah. in the government. Well, that's one thing the EU was, did. That was good. Brought in mandatory sick pay and um, mandatory maternity leave and stuff like that. But now, that's just up. It's on, it's on the fire, that stuff. You throw it on the bonfire. Yeah. All right. We should do this more often. We are. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. You're a brilliant man. Lane from Siam. Not a brilliant man. Hmm? Just, not a brilliant man, just a dude. Just a fella. Nah, you're more than that. Nah. All right. How do people contact you? Oh. Oh, yeah. I've never sold myself. I'm on Twitter at Lane, L A N E. Thomas, without the S, because it didn't fit on. Thomas Hewitt, so L-A-N-E-T-H-O-M-A-R-H-E-W-I-T-T, R being A. Um, and I'm on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, just my name. Okay. And Hewitt. That's it. Fantastic. I'll see you at office hours okay. for the fast lane. Life in the first lane. Oh, no, it's the Eagles. I get the Eagles. Oh. Hit the Eagles, man. Hello, Mike. All right. Thank you, Lane. Great. Bye. I'm going to go to bed now. It's like maybe three. I like listen to, I like listen to Steinel when I'm in bed. Okay. Nothing naughty. <laughs> Say hello to Coco. Uh, joining us is Professor Mike Steinel, who I believe is in Kansas. Yes, not, indeed, David. Can you hear me? You're not in Texas anymore, are you? No, no, okay. I came north. I came north. How's it's beautiful the, right now. It's like uh, 70 degrees. It's beautiful. Got some bugs. Not as bad. Was I up here a month ago about? We, yeah, you were wearing goggles and using different types oh, of tools. Yeah, I, still, I got a new one tonight. What is that? Oh, God, what is this called? It has a name. Um, it's me, a, it's a, uh, some sort of tool. I'm going to, I'm going to trim like some. It's like Liz Marital Aid. Can you hear it? Yeah. All right. I'm revving it up. Um, now I have to trim some, uh, we're getting, we got bed, new beds today in one of the rooms. And we By get the way, we, Ethan was talking about col cholera, color. Your wife is a. My wife at one time was the, one of the preeminent colorateurs in the world. I can say that. And if you don't believe me, all you got to do is go to YouTube, Beverly Hoke, H O C H. And watch the proc. I'm sorry. I'm not. P R A U C K, maybe proc theme and variations, a concert she did in Sweden. She th she sh she sang uh, Queen of the Night uh, all over the world, and because uh, it's got a really high part, and she recorded it with e on EMI, uh, one of the definitive recordings of of uh, Queen of the Night is from what? Um, shoot, um, Queen of the Night is the aria. It'll come to me in a second. These I'm old, old brain. Things have to bubble up. Hang on, hang on. let me just. Uh, You're gonna give me a bubble up sound. Yeah, hang on. This is uh, we're gonna go inside Professor Mike's brain. I 
don't know somebody. Ann Lee knows the name of the well, author. Like who what, what what happened to Professor Mike Steinell? <laughs> Where who are you? What did you do with him? You know what? If if somebody drives by, there's a little <laughs> traffic out here on the lake, and they see this, they're gonna go. They're, they're probably like, going to call the p- cops. I got my horn to make a little noise, too, you know. You look like you should be parting with Clay Shaw and David Ferry in Louisiana. Wait, I have, oh, is that, is, that a, is that a Kennedy reference? Yeah. Clay Shaw? Is yeah. that uh, um, – who's the other person? David Ferry. Okay. I have to watch that movie again. Yeah. I, can't, I don't have my glasses on. Everything is just blurry. You, you just, yeah, that, you look great. <laughs> I've been explore. I'm, you know what? I met I met the house we own, which was my mother my mother in law. By the way, house. hang on for one second. Yeah, we're talking with Professor Mike Steinell, author of the new book, Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. Go to savingcharlieparker dot com. There's also an audio version of it on Audible. Yes, uh, or go to. Uh, to MikeSteinel.com to find out all the different ways to uh, buy it and read it. And it has the Feldman guarantee. I think this is your look. <laughs> I do. I think this is how you should promote the book and, and make no reference to what now. What, what are you wearing right now? I don't know where this came. Look, I'm up here. We, we got carpet coming in day after tomorrow. So you have to clean. Basically, carpet is like moving, you know, because you got to clear everything out of the rooms. And I'm leaving them heavy furniture. I'll pay them to move that because I can't do it. But, you know, I'm just so many amazing things. And my mother-in-law, who's going to be 100 in, what, what, day, what day of the month is this? It will be on? September 5th. Yes. yes. On October 13th, we're going to be up here. We're going to celebrate her birthday, 100 years old. Wow. And so this house, she lived most of her life in this house. And uh, there's things that are, um, they moved in in 1946, she and her husband. And wow. uh, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. Remember these, David? Remember these? Those would be VHSs. No, eight tracks. Oh, eight tracks. Yes. You're too young to remember eight tracks. I remember I eight tracks. This is a... I, there's a whole bunch. Of, I'm like, what are we going to do with these? Let me see. Uh, here's Liberace. Hmm. And uh, Ferranti. Ferranti and Teicher. Teicher. Teicher lived in Anglewood, New Jersey. <laughs> gay. <laughs> Who was gay? Ferranti and Teicher had to be <coughs> gay. No, I, I knew the son. I went to elementary school with Teicher. No way. They weren't gay? No. Well, I mean, it, it, I, we can, did they have a child together? No, no. They ad- did they adopt? <laughs> uh, well, wait, now, what about Liberace? What are, you gonna, what are you trying to tell me about Liberace? Oh, he wasn't gay. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. He was a man's man. Yes, he was. <laughs> what a, what a, uh, an amazing, amazing thing. Um, Nobody, kind of, the, the, Liberace was a genius. And also, he, yeah, of course, he was brilliant pianist. Mm-hmm. And everybody, he, he was goofing on all those old ladies who had no idea. Was, yeah, he, he, he found his niche, that's for sure. And I thought Beyond the Candelabra. I never was, saw it. A, a little. It was over nice. the top. I, I, I didn't think they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't treat him nice. I don't think so. Well, you know, yeah. I a, remember hearing Michael Douglas is going to play Liberace, and I started laughing really hard because <laughs> I thought, "Oh, that's that's right." He did play. Matt him. Damon played Blue. That's, ex- that's why, exactly why I didn't watch it. You know, um, that just that seemed like that didn't seem right. It was funny but in a cruel way it was almost homophobic i found it a little homophobic yeah well it's a thin line i think yeah it's a thin line between um you know celebrating the freedom to do that and 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 being open to it and then but also you know 
making yeah. fun of it. So it's our thing. David, there's serious things going on in the world, and I need to talk about them. Okay. I, I think the world is great. Why? <laughs> Seriously. Well, I know you're I know you're worried about uh, mixed martial arts and UFC. I know you got that as as a kind of can, that the depravity of the society is getting lower and lower and lower. But the, the, the latest thing that really disturbs me, it's actually, they have their ads on your, uh, when you, when you watch your, your, uh, YouTube, uh, when you watch the David Feldman show on YouTube, there's an ad that comes on for this company called loom. You know about loom? No. Well, loom David is a full body deodorant. You can put it, anywhere on your body and there's one particular ad that goes into great detail about crotch odor and i just sorry. think that I'm sorry crotch odor crotch odor did you not get it yeah i crotch odor <laughs> crotch odor yeah and you know i think it's enough that i have to watch tv and i'm watching jeopardy and they do a peroni's disease commercial with my oh. mother-in-law sitting right there with the bent carrot you yeah. know now we got to talk about crotch odor in the middle of all this stuff you know and the thing is there's a there's a they, they get scientific david they the lady says if you just shower your crotch odor score might be between five and six but if you shower and use loom you'll be down to zero now that begs the question who came up with the, the, the crotch odor score, <laughs> you know, and how scientific is it? You know, what was the sample? How many crotches had to be, you know, sampled before mm -hmm. they could come up with that? I could find a picture. There is a job <laughs> at Procter & Gamble. Oh, God. Where they sniff people's armpits. Well, see, the, the, it's probably this. They probably using the same workers. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the question is how know, many, how many crotches to get a good sample? And the second is how many sniffers mm -hmm. to get, you know, like, and then what's the rubric? How do they come up with the, this is, I, I dealt with helping people through PhD uh, programs in music ed and there's a research component and it has to be strict, you know? So, you know, how many crotches and how many crotch sniffers? And what, first? Yeah. and what was the rubric? You got to have a rubric, you know, like what is a one? Because yeah. people have to agree, you know, what right. is one? Tuna salad? That one? Right. Hey, boss, I can't come in today. <laughs> I got a head cold. I'm going to be useless. <laughs> you are. <laughs> what, now, what, what would you rather, if you, if you had to do this for a living? <laughs> I would Arm, do it. An armpit sniffer? Oh, of course, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna stay north. I'm gonna stay north, north of with the my sniffing. Okay. You know, it's and it, you know, it's, uh, it's like what would what would God uh, if you what would be ten? I mean, what would how would they? Because they have to train the the people, you know, doing the the work, you know, like okay, here's a ten. Now, what would that be? I mean, we lost one. <laughs> call call <laughs> the partition. You know, this is kind of related. My dad told me this story, and I believe it's true. Uh, he was in the service, and he said one of the things they did in the service is part of the training as they were getting people ready to go to war was to expose you to um, at least tear gas. and. I don't think they, they did mustard gas because that was illegal, but they wanted you to know how to use a gas mask. And so <clears throat> they would put everybody in a big building. And if they were out of tear gas, they would just read Charlotte's Web. <laughs> right? I saw, I, I saw my father explained it to me. <laughs> oh, was, was your dad in WW2? Yeah. Yeah. He was in, he was in the Pacific. But he checked this out. He said that... Um, you know that my father. Yes. I can't do this joke. <laughs> it involves, well, then don't do it. It involves him killing 50, <laughs> but in California. <laughs> it's, it's, a, 
he killed <laughs> fifty. He killed fifty Japanese. Yeah, yeah, but it was. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, let me tell you the story. <laughs> so anyway, they they. <laughs> Did you? Is that an old joke? Is that an old joke? It was a joke that you can't say Germans because it it's not because they're not in California. They weren't living in Cal. Yeah, there isn't a specific. It's it's a horrible joke. It is a horrible joke. Horrible joke. But you know, you know in in Saving Charlie Parker, there's a little a little you know like one the character goes to uh, what they call Bronzeville in L.A., which became Bronzeville after they took all the uh, the Japanese out. It was Little Tokyo on uh, oh, uh, what's the street? Um, I can't remember the central off of Central Avenue. There's a song on the set website called Party on Central. And <clears throat> but uh, there was something like, uh, I, I don't know, um, 40,000 um, Japanese and they cleared them out. And then the they opened up the, um, you know, uh, African-Americans started coming in to work, work the factories. And and then it became a big hotbed for uh, jazz clubs anyway but my dad told me that that he had heard yes what's that tear gas yeah tear gas so they put you in the thing and then you, you they want you to put on the gas mask correctly and then they said just to give you like a little taste you know i was thinking about this when i was thinking about crotch snippers you know like what is not tan you and they got to give you a little taste of this you know like so you know what it is they they let they they open the valve just a little bit, and then you get it. And then they open the door and the gas, and everybody runs out and they're coughing and stuff like that. But supposedly Mel Torme, remember that guy, Mel Torme? Yeah. yeah. He and a friend opened it on purpose. <clears throat> they're both gone, so I can do this without getting sued. You know, you can you, you can you can say whatever you want about dead people, and they can't sue you. Um, really. Oh yeah, yeah. There's no defamation of character. You you, you can't be. <laughs> I better go kill a couple of people. <laughs> I'll be right back. That's really good. That's a good joke. <laughs> I just found out. Yeah, I just found out that you can't be sued if you say bad things about dead people. Excuse me, I got to go kill a couple. I think you can though. I, I think the estates or their family. No, nope, they cannot. I looked it up because I I have nope. I have I have people that lived. You know, in the book, I got Charlie Parker, and I was worried about that because I'm making stuff up about Charlie Parker, and a lot of it's factual. But but you know, I put him in the situation where I knew he was. Right. But anyway, Mel Torme and his friend opened it up, and they had a terrible reaction, and they were uh, got a medical discharge. So that's how they. Have, oh, know. so he did it on purpose. Yeah, and it it damaged his voice. You know, the velvet fog yeah it had that kind of raspy thing that's what the uh, velvet fog before he went in no no if you listen well he didn't get famous till afterwards but supposedly his tone was very clear and a high tenor his tone was a high tenor but uh it was interesting ethan i love talk uh, hearing him talk about opera my wife sort of feels the same way she she um opera is kind of like you're chosen for it because you have the gift and then, but a lot of people that do it don't really enjoy the operas. You know, it's more like a, a, a lot of times it's like a, like a, a sporting event. Beverly told me that there were some roles when she would play and she was a soprano. So she would get uh, starring roles. Um, and um, you know, it, 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 in some and, or, or the second, you know, the second role, Ethan was lucky as, as a as a bass baritone. You kind of get the bad guys, you know, and the and the old guys. So you have some some, but you know, Madame Butterfly sings through the whole thing. You know, now Beverly could never. She wasn't the right voice type for Madame Butterfly, but she could do other things. She did a lot of, uh, like I say, Queen of the Night, which is. But anyway, she she said that there are some roles where you can't even warm up. If you warm up, you'll be shot. Really. Yeah, 
it is, it's, it's sort of like a pitcher, a pitcher in, in major leagues. You know, they can't pitch every day. That's why if you look at the Met, they have different casts. If they're going to sh- – and, and they rotate. You know, you'll hear this opera on Wednesday, and then they'll do it again Saturday. And, and they'll do it again. Do you, do you age out? Is there a point where – Oh, yeah, especially for women. That's what happened to Beverly. I mean, she, you start to lose the, the top thing, and you just can't sing the role because, because, um, because, because the notes are too high, you know. And they it's, don't do it, auto, no auto tune. <laughs> no, but you know sometimes they'll actually take the arias down a half step. You know, um, no microphones. That's the thing. It's allowed. It's allowed art. I mean, she she has a beautiful voice still at her age, and and she, in, in her prime, I really think she was one of the greatest coloraturas ever. But she was not loud. So I think she, I may have this wrong. Uh, she'll kill me if I get this wrong, but she won the regional Met auditions, you know, but she was never programmed at the Met because the building, but she did well in Europe because the halls are smaller. Wow. You know, she did the, a bunch of the Fleeter Mouses, which is, uh, who is that? That's Strauss. That's uh, Richard Strauss. But anyway. What's it like to fight with her? We don't fight. We she never yells at you. What's that? You never yells at the top of her lungs at you. No, she never does. She's a very gentle person. We we seldom have words, and if it is, it's kidding. We're it's a lot of, you know, teasing. Yeah, it's very important for couples to to tease one another. Yeah, we laugh a lot. Yeah, you know, like you like. Know, the, but you know, to to make fun of one another. Oh, yeah. To mock them and roast them and humiliate them. And I'm kidding. I don't know. Uh, so what else are you uh, worried about? Uh, that's about it, David. Crotch <laughs> order. Crotch that's order. I'm worried about. No, I thought, I, I love your show today. First of all, I thought, I thought your news was really good. Thank you. I and your thing on fascism. I mean, it is the clips you played. It's, it's right out of the playbook. Oh. Did you get my song, the Ted Cruz Blues? Yes. Not Ted Cruz Blues. Uh, you were in the Ron middle. DeSantis. Hang on, hang on. You're in the middle of praising me, and your mind wandered. <laughs> I was hanging on your every word. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me back up. First, the, the news was really good. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. And, and you nailed it on the fascism. You know, and you know what the thing about the fascism is? It's almost for my listeners. This is what I'm discovering. For the people who listen to my show, it's hackneyed. Everybody knows, like I'm telling people what they already know. I feel like I have to remind people of what they already know. I'm amazed what people have forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that that he used the word, that he used the word, because it's... um, and then it was so funny. No, no you're fascist. You're oh, fascist. that was from last week. Uh, yeah. Kid from uh, Turning Points, Charlie Kirk. Yeah, you know, well, and it's, it's, it becomes very juvenile. But, but um, I, I think, I, you know, I, I listened Thursday to the um, professors in Marianne, and I did think that Biden may have done a very shrewd thing to drive a wedge into, you know, into the Republican Party, I think that maybe there's some some daylight there to kind of to do you know MAGA Republicans. You know, I I know that um, a lot of people thought that was kind of silly, but you know, uh, I think it could be. By the way, your voice is a lot like Bill Barr's. Do you realize that? Hey, really? Yeah, he's got a great voice. Listen to those clips. You could do him. You, your pace and your voice is is very similar. You just have to stop reading. <laughs> that he's, exactly. he's made a he's made an interesting turn in the last to go on Fox and say those things. What did, what think. what did he do? Well, you played the clips. Oh, oh okay. no! Didn't you play the clips? You know, he's basically you know saying, yeah, Trump Trump's in trouble. He could get charged. 
He said, no, whether they really will do it. Oh, you, know? oh, you said, I thought you were talking about Bill Barr. Did you say, I, I heard Bill Maher. No, Bill Barr. Oh, Bill Barr. Bill Barr. Okay. I thought you were. Our former attorney general. I think you said, yeah. Well, I look like him. No, you do not look like I, him. I don't have his physique. He's lost a little weight. He's lost a little weight, I noticed. He's looking yeah. a little svelter. Oh, you know what? I taped him standing up. This is Bill Barr. <laughs> this uh, is me. I want you to picture Bill Barr in a bathing suit on a very hot day, standing up from a leather recliner. This is what it sounds like. <laughs> That would be Bill Barr standing up. So you think it's dangerous for uh, him to go on Fox and, and say that Trump... not dangerous. It's good. It's good. It's interesting. The host, you know, the host, like the majority of Port Stead is a big thing on Fox and Friends. How those, like that trio is uh, the guy on the left, um, Ducey, is basically... Uh, you know, kind of like he's there's a crack in the armor there, you know. But um, these things, I think these things happen slowly and then they boom, then they explode. So I'm hoping some, I think they, uh, Trump got a little bit of a victory with the special master. Yeah. I, I just, uh, you didn't go with that story today, did you? No, it, it came on too late and, uh, I just don't see him ever going to prison or, or being. Well, Lawrence a O'Donnell brought up a really interesting point. Says, you know, if Trump goes to prison, his his Secret Service has to go to prison. He's got Secret Service for life. There's no prison that he could, you know. So he was saying house arrest. Well, somebody, somebody very smart said that they saw him maybe at some point in exile by the way i was driving around today and we we're talking didn't you think we'd we'd be done with this guy by now like no. didn't, in in december of 1920 uh, 2020 2020 didn't you think we'd be we'd be done talking about him he no, is I, I, he doesn't kept go. himself front and center that's amazing yeah he doesn't go away he is gifted you know Absolutely. That that last speech, I mean, it was, I mean, it's full of lies and everything, but he, he is, he's crafty. He's gifted. You know, you talked about self-awareness, making fun of himself. China. Yeah. Let me you know? play those clips to me. I mean, I, I, I hate him, but there's a little part of part of me that just thinks he's, I mean, the delivery here is where is it? it it was just so so brilliant hang on um i can't find it where is it damn it all right i guess i can't find it no but you're right he, he is he's like as stand up like doing crowd work or what did, would you call that crowd work? No, he doesn't really take responses from people. He, but. Has, he has this timing that is, here it is. I mean, to me, this is as good as it gets in terms of being entertaining. How'd you like the red lighting behind him like the devil? Back to you. <laughs> it's just so, <laughs> like the, the delivery, it's just so good. It's just so like the devil, the way he says it. He's just so yeah. gifted. Yeah. <laughs> like the devil. He's I don't so... think that. Uh, did you get the DeSantis song? Yes. You want to, should we play it? Well, let's talk about DeSantis. I had a little trouble writing this song. I did a little bit of it last week for you, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, when you run long, sometimes I just sit there and make notes about what you're talking about. But he's done horrible things he's got see see the thing about trump he has only one idea and that's how to get reelected, how to maintain power he doesn't have any ideas on really on how to make any moves in, in terms of policy but ron DeSantis has ideas you know his 
and and they're and they're the one that I tr was going to try to work into the song was the anti riot bill. You know about that? No. Well, see, a lot of what he's done is just he's just banging. You know, like he he there's a bill, and I'm I'm going to kind of butcher what it is, but it's basically one of the things is makes it illegal to reduce your police budget. Any city in the state cannot reduce your. It's like what? It's like well, how a how authoritarian is that? You cannot reduce your budget, you know? It's like NATO saying you have to spend 2% of your GDP on defense. At really? least, yeah. And then there's there's immunity, like if someone, um, you know, does something to a rioter, it's, it's written, I didn't read the whole thing, but there's a lot of provisions, but it's they're so convoluted, it's really hard to put it into a song, you know? It's better like um, he made that quote. This is the state where woke comes to die. That's another thing. How how rhetorically to take a word that has a positive thing and mm -hmm. just flip it, you know, flip it right away. You know, that is that is so amazing. You know, that is who is that uh, Breitbart? Is that uh, what's his face? You think figuring out how to do that? Oh, Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon. I think somebody's sitting him down and coaching him. I think there's a fascination, a secret fascination with Hitler. And I agree. Germany. And I agree. They're kind of like, they're kind of, if we do this, suppose we try this and yeah. do this and do that. I mean, this clip, and then I'll, I'll stop. But this clip was unbelievable. Um, where is it? This one was here, this. Despite great outside dangers, our biggest threat remains the sick, sinister, and evil people from within our own country. Wow. Is that amazing? David, I think at times you look sick and sinister and evil. I well, I no, am. you don't. You never do. You never. I, I think I'm sick and sinister. Sick and sinister. And sinister. I mean, that's that is that is a that's alliterative, isn't it? Sick mm -hmm. and sinister. I mean, that just he didn't write that. He did not write that. I tell you. Oh, he, I do you think he? I think he writes his own tweets. No, but that that phrase he did not come up with that. He's not smart enough to come up with that. He's gifted. It's. But that's that's been fed to him, you know. Probably uh, Stephen Miller, you know. Oh, that's true. That, that that's true. That could there more, more of this could be coming from Stephen Miller than anybody else, probably. Yeah. Bannon and Stephen Miller, boy, there's a trio. They don't wow. know. They don't know they're evil. They don't know that they're that they get people hurt. That's that's the amazing thing. It is. Yeah. DeSantis has ideas and seems to be able to work with his legislature to get them done. You know, he only won by 3,200 votes. Is that true? Yeah, but I, that, they had to do a recount. Don't you remember that? I completely forgot. Yeah, I read that in uh, the New York Times in an editorial, you know, um, won by a slim margin and rules as if he had or, or governs as if he had a, mar, a a mandate you know just like hitler that's exactly yeah, exactly exactly let's yeah. play the ron DeSantis blues yes. okay new music from professor mike steinel the ron DeSantis blues <laughs> If you're thinking about going south to the Sunshine State, I suggest that you may want to think twice. I suggest that you may want to wait. They got a man named Ron DeSantis. He's got a face like a praying mantis. I'm quite sure he ain't gonna grant us permission to say gay. So if you are a teacher, you better mind your P's and Q's. 
A lot of people down there got the wrong DeSantis blues. They say if Trump pulls out or if he goes to jail, DeSantis is the next man up. They say he might prevail. The man is on a mission to do everything he can to improve his position so he can be the man that moves into the White House up in Washington, D.C. If that gives you the willies, you better sing along with me. I got the wrong DeSantis blue. Santa's blue I got the wrong to Santa's blue I got the wrong to Santa's blue blues from my head down to my shoes you can bet your bottom dollar he's against the right to choose we can only guess what he might do to the lgbt and q we've all seen this playbook before civil rights will be out the door but if he don't win the election there may be a ray of hope but then again, the Republicans will just find some other dope. Don't forget about Sarah Palin, who's taking time to reload. The path to 2024 might be a crazy road. You know, it might behoove us to bring back that crazy doofus. I'm talking about the orange-haired goon with the tan silly raccoon but for now i'm following the news don't have no time to schmooze gotta keep my eye on ted cruz while i sing the wrong to santa's blues i got the wrong to santa's blues They loved it. They loved it. That's amazing. Ron DeSantis Blues, Professor Mike Steinel, Prang Mantis, Grantis. You like that? That's a pretty yeah, good one. Those are, that's a real challenge. Great oh, challenge. Oh, yeah. I, well, you know, you, you, you take one word and then you turn it, turn it into two. So that's like a, like a smell man. David Feldman. What's that smell, mm -hmm. man? That's <laughs> classic. I'm still going to work on that one. Now, I want you to play, before I go, I want you to play, because I think it's my best track yet, The Gentlewoman. Okay, I have and to I, download it. Is it. Unless I have it already. Did you read well, it? Well, I read, I read, I re-emailed it to you. But I, is it, okay, but I have it already. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you got it. Oh, right. okay. I, you didn't redo, okay, so hang on for one second. I didn't redo it. This but is... I'll tell you why it's my best thing. You want to know why? Why? Well, the trumpet, I think I really like my trumpet playing on this, but it's got a place where it kind of grooves. Groove is an interesting thing. You know, there's two kinds of music, pretty much um, music that grooves and music that doesn't groove. Classical music is not meant to groove. And it's interesting, most of the music that has a conductor is not meant to groove. It's okay because everybody follows the conductor. 
but groove music like rock and jazz and African music and Brazilian music and uh, you know music that doesn't have necessarily uh, that needs a conductor um, has to have in it some like a little bit of grind in terms of what 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 there's a fancy name for it. it's called participatory discrepancies wow and i think it's one of the things that makes shows like yours interesting when people don't quite agree they're kind of on the same like if if you were arguing with uh, ted cruz for six, six hours that would not be a good show mm -hmm. you know and those debates like trump and you know and hillary that was not that was not good. but when you get a little bit of a little bit of discrepancy and with the with i'm talking with the timing mainly it's with the timing where things somebody's ahead and somebody's behind they give the music a buoyancy like you know, the way keith moon played the drums where he, he well more like more like the way um the guy with the rolling stones watts mm -hmm. uh, played the drums i mean he 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 laid back on that so that 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 the thing about the Rolling stones is just such it's such a great groove you know that guy was a jazz drummer he did not like playing with the rolling stones right right you know i mean he i mean he liked doing it but that was not his main thing right. but if everybody's on top of the beat it rushes and if everybody's on the back of the beat it drags but if you get a little bit of thing now somehow for i think in this track and i'll point to it there's a place where the shaker starts and it just kind of it kind of locks in and locks in time wise and it's got a really good groove okay the gentlewoman the gentlewoman from casper <laughs> Pretty. I told her I watched it gavel to gavel. That's about the time that things began to unravel. I had a dream last night, and Liz Cheney was there. Right here it starts to get better looking at me kind of crazy and that hair was hanging over her eye then she said it kind of quiet and soft and low the committee stands and resets i'm ready to go i said i'm a little nervous can we have a muffin she said don't be scared little man they don't call me gentlewoman for nothing i had a dream last night ready to go she was hot to trot i was really kind of scared i was frozen on the spot she said all we need to do is put our politics aside then i can take you on that magic carpet ride i had a dream last night and live 
Miss Cheney was there. Mike Steinell is a jazz trumpeter, composer, educator, member of the University of North Texas Jazz Studies faculty from 1987 to 2019, author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary, and his latest is Running the Changes. His most recent Music release is Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet featuring Rosanna Eckert. It's out on Origin Records. And just all that going on in his life, he writes fiction. And his latest novel, Saving Charlie Parker, a novel published by Dorrance Books, is available by going to savingcharlieparker.com. He is a you're unbelievable you are i don't know i don't know where you find the time i really don't <laughs> hey uh, my band with rosanna eckert's going to be playing at the denton arts and jazz which is the first weekend in october we're playing on the saturday sh on the jazz stage saturday show at 2 30 wow. in, the, in the afternoon wow. it's a great event um we get about we really get about they say 250,000 people visiting Dent, Dent, visiting that event because wow. there's like there's there's like 12 stages. They got stages where the kids are dancing, the stages where the wow. the um, high school bands are playing. They got the the UNT stage and they got the jazz stage and they got the pop stage and it's really really a, a terrific thing. Um, so come on out and uh, I think you can listen to it on KNTU. On, on their stream if you if you can't if you can't get to denton texas you can listen i'll, I'll plug it again before we get there yeah yeah the, i was stream, stream music sounds pretty good you know yeah yeah we're gonna be playing music from saving charlie parker and song and dance at wow. that wow wow i wish i were there well come on I, down come I on down I, to texas i wish i was allowed to leave new york state <laughs> We probably wouldn't let you across the border. I know. I know. <laughs> you know, well, papers, please. We must see your papers. <laughs> Feldman, interesting name. <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing about the Fetterman name, that was hilarious. Well, that, but that, they'll, they'll do, they'll do anything. Unbelievable. It really is. Yeah, scary. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, man. I love you. Thank you. I love you too. I'll, I'll see you in a week. You didn't do the bit. I know, man. Should we All try right. it again? I love you. Okay. Love you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let us go. Why don't we go to Benji first? Because we haven't heard from him in a while. And then we'll wrap it all up with Rodrigo. We're going to move south. First, we'll go to Florida, and then we'll go to Mexico. We were just in Kansas. Hello, Benji. Florida man. David Mann, what's up, Kimisabi? <laughs> Hanging in there. Happy Labor Day. Yeah, man. Happy Labor Day. I just had another birthday last week, man. It's no. Oh. Man, it sucks getting old, man. I, I was yeah. at the drugstore yesterday, and young girl behind the counter, I said, I need some, and I kind of paused, and she said, preparation age? I was like, no, I was like, she goes, stool softeners? Like, no. <laughs> she said, little blue pills? I was like, no, will you stop fucking guessing? I was like, shit, it just sucks being old, man. <laughs> David, you ever stood in front of a mirror and uh, thought to yourself, man, I can't wear this out. It's too wrinkled. Didn't realize you're naked. <laughs> it sucks, man. And the day I find my first pubic hair, 
my first yeah. gray pubic hair. Yeah. What, what made it worse is I found it in my muffin. <laughs> but, or what most Republicans recognize as a chicken sandwich. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, man, some of these Republicans, man, they've lost their mind, dude. They're, they think if you're born in the back of a Jeep, you're part Cherokee. <laughs> it's crazy, man. I'm surrounded by some of these whack jobs, man. They keep you on your toes, though. Kind of like Lane at a urinal. <laughs> no. Gotta love Lane, man. He's never rude to anybody, but he's short with everybody. Oh. No. I'm just messing with you, Lane. You know I love you, brother. I'm just jealous, man. It's, Lane's a great artist. He's a great pilot. I just wish I had Lane's accent, man. My wife's a sucker for a British accent. She'd be on Lane like Chris Christie on a picnic camp. <laughs> Hey, speaking of Chris Christie, man, I saw him on uh, Meet the Press Sunday, man. He's got the profile of an ailing manatee, man. He, he, he needs some help, dude. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. No. <laughs> Making Chris Christie jokes. We're not allowed <laughs> anymore. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm on two's my limit. Uh, David, my neighbor told me he, was, uh, he makes love to his wife three times a week. Really? I said, only do that once a week. He said, only <laughs> once. He said only once. I thought your wife loves sex all the time. I was like, yeah, I thought we were still talking about your wife. <laughs> That's crazy, man. My wife said sex with me reminds her of Wally's gas station on the Andy Griffith show. How's that? Only two pumps. <laughs> <laughs> no, I made bad decisions, you know, half of my life and the other half, the same thing. <laughs> but, but hey, man, if you're not trying to enjoy life, bro, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Hey, Dave, before I go, man, hey, do you know the difference between confident and confidential? No. I know I'm curious, Father. I'm very confident, but I may be the father of the little girl next door, too. That's confidential. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, that's all I got, man. Y'all take her easy, brother. I'll see you Friday night. Great job. Thank you so much. That's Florida, man. That would be Benji in Florida. Great job. And now uh, let's go to Rodrigo in Mexico. How are you today, sir? I'm uh, sick, but I'll try to go fast. Um, you, is, your I wanted to, is, it, is it your ulcer? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what it is, but it's acting up today. I'm sorry to hear that. So I wanted to go a bit deep into plant obsolescence, but Noam Chomsky and BJ Prasad wrote a new book, and I wanted to disagree with them in a way I think is important. I might not have said anything, but I mentioned this before, and now that their book is coming out, it's probably a good time to rephrase it, considering their thesis. What do we mean when we say the United States is weak politically? Do we mean they're actually afraid of a populist, if not leftist, uprising that would strip the richest people of their political advantages? I submit that, historically, it's not fear but economy that is involved. Sometime a few decades ago, probably after World War II, the powers that be decided that the illusion of freedom, liberty and democracy were good for business and treating everyone like the poorest people were treated in dictatorships was bad for business. This thinking can be seen in one of the basic tenets of geopolitics, the soft power that Trump scoffed at because he didn't understand it, is the illusion sold, sold to the entire world by Hollywood that the United States is the good cop the maverick that shows up to save you when the world has given up on you. Any serious study of history will show you that the United States is in fact the corrupt cop that serves the key to the women's side of the prison. The bad guy behind every bad guy in the world that props people up based on how friendly they are to US business interests above all else. Am I saying anything fundamentally different than what B.A. Prasad and Noam Chomsky are saying, due to time constraints, all I will say is this. We must not confuse the withdrawal from Afghanistan with people in power not having the stomach to order a genocide with bombs. It's dangerous to let ourselves believe we can topple the system when we don't have the numbers for a real general strike. This is something else that Trump and his fans don't understand. The illusion that everyone can become the next Zuckerberg or Musk or Bezos is so powerful that millions of people every day go to work to try to screw more people than the other guy because they have bought into the lie of upward mobility. We must remember that the fascist and the fascist right Democrats are always perfectly willing to put tanks on the streets. And the reason we don't see tanks on the streets more often is this theory of soft power, or in other words, 
Preserving the illusion of democracy is good for business, even if several powerful interests now believe they can make more money by saying the quiet part out loud, as their mouthpieces are constantly showing us in the last few years. The task of the left is partly infighting because we need to unmask the Jimmy Dores of the world, yes, but the bulk of it is to prepare the masses for a political awakening, to help them realize that a single rich black man or rich Asian woman or trans person with the right politics, like Caitlyn Jenner, is worth tens of thousands of poor whites to the rich whites who give tax-deductible donations to the people in charge of keeping us divided. This is the disagreement I have with the new book by Chomsky and Prashad. Not that there isn't an apparent power vacuum, but that the seeming unwillingness to bomb Afghanistan until there's no one left is not a political witness, but a calculated decision that, among other things, has led to the current situation where the liberals like John Oliver look helpless because, of course, we have to help the Afghan people survive, but also, of course, we can't risk giving money to the Taliban, so here's what we can do to help the Afghans without helping the Taliban. Spoiler alert, is not much. I don't think US lefties understand how close we are all the time to tanks in the streets to protect good people, but relying on the fact that, quote, they couldn't do that here, end quote, is why so many things Trump did were not illegal. People just thought he would be finished politically if he did any of hundreds of things he did that did not end him. The coming years are very important, not because the empire is crumbling, but because the fascists have decided they want to get rid of the illusion of democracy and rule by fear. Whether or not we take for granted that the United States creates wars to feed the shareholders of the military industrial complex, I think the warning stands on its own. And an apology for not fleshing out my arguments more, I would if I had the energy at the time. One quick update, I sent you an email because BJ Prasad agreed yes. to come back on the show. Thank you. Uh, yeah. He yeah. doesn't think uh, Noam Chomsky will have time to come, but BJ Prasad is pretty good, I think. I think that would be great. I hope you can. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for reaching out. Uh, I've pissed off the other guests you got for me. Uh, I. I've done my I've tried to get them to come back, but they they will not come back. So uh, this time, I don't think it was my fault. Do you? Rodrigo? Kind of, you were kind of uh, insensitive towards something that triggers many black people. So I, maybe I, it's a little bit your fault. It's a little bit my fault. I triggered. Yeah, a little bit your fault, a little bit God's fault. Uh, let's not quibble on the exact percentages. Okay. Uh, I, okay. I'll think about it. Um, Usually, okay. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you. That is our shoe. Great show, Labor Day. Thank you all for, for showing up. It was uh, a privilege to spend Labor Day with everybody who showed up for our virtual studio audience, as well as our friends on YouTube. I need to thank the super chat. I understand we got some super chats and uh, we're going to do a meeting on Wednesday. I will get the names of the mods and read them out loud as I have done before. This show is put together by Grace Chat. Can I try? Can I try saying the names of the mods? Yes, please. Uh, from England, Autumn Leaves and Chucky Nuna, she's 61. From the United States, uh, Lexi444, Midi Doctors, Bob Carmody. Most of, what they, most of them are mods for the Majority Report. Mm -hmm. M2Sand, S Scout is Taken, Dan Frankenberger, The Invisible Ninja. Uh, I think that. that's all of them. Well, thank you to the mods. I, I uh, 
thank you so much for for doing that and uh i want to thank uh the people who put this show together they would be andy brown sarah bush grace jackson professor jonathan bick hannah feldman the invisible ninja joe in norway and of course the brilliant dan frankenberger i think i remembered everybody i don't think i left anybody out sarah bush hannah feldman grace jackson andy brown the invisible ninja joe in norway professor jonathan bick and the brilliant dan frankenberger i think i got all those i want to thank all our guests the brilliant dave cyrus he was great tonight the great howie klein david cobb dr harriet fraud ethan hershenfeld lane from cm fantastic job lane from cm and professor mike steinell thank you benji thank you rodrigo office hours every friday night at 8 p.m please join us go to my website for the link every friday uh it's it's there if you don't get the invitation just go to my website the link is there while you're over there please sign up for my newsletter it comes out every Friday I am David Feldman happy Labor Day the most, we should be celebrating it in this country in a much different way uh happy Labor Day and remember to stay strong I don't have it yet remember to stay strong and uh, where is it here we go uh stay strong and protect the weak okay let's turn to that big rally this Saturday so oh, much love at the rally, David, so much love. Great people, great people in Florence, South Carolina. So smart, so discerning. And it was sold out, David. They were packed in tighter than Chris Christie sitting in a coach seat. Get it, David, because of the weight. Can you get it, David? Are you following me? Get it, because I get it. can't fit into a coach seat, David. Do you get it? I get you it. can have that one, David. That's another freebie. I know you people like freebies. I know. I know you love the freebies. What people? Your people, David. The free brews. <laughs> oh, boy. I can't help it, David. You know, they say that Zelensky is a comedian. But I'm so much, I'm so much funnier than Z that Zelensky guy. I just don't <laughs> get him, David. I don't get him. I don't get that Nanette Fabre. I don't get them. Anyway, the people of South Carolina love me, David. I do great there because their elections aren't rigged. You get an honest count in South Carolina, unlike Georgia or Arizona or Vermont, where I won in a landslide, David, but they rigged it. They rigged okay. it, David. And this Ukraine thing, terrible, David. Sleepy Joe doesn't know how to handle Putin. Putin would never do this with me. You know why, David? Why? Why, sir? Love. <laughs> love. We love each other, David. I love the dictators, and the dictators love me. Yeah, they but is that, is that something to be proud of? You know, David, dictators is a combination of two terrific words. Dick. <laughs> which is a word to call terrible, terrible people, like Sleepy Joe, and taters, which is a food you eat three times a day. It's a delicious food, dick taters. Makes you angry and hungry, it's all at once. My favorite two emotions in the world, David. Anger, hunger. Because they're the only two emotions I've got. <laughs> Thumbs it up all there, David. Oh, dictators. such interest. I love them. Such I love them, dictators. You can't, you can't love just one. So it, they say about it's dictators. Pronounced. 
So it's pronounced yeah. dictators. Dictators. And you can't love okay. just one. Okay, let's talk about dictators. Let's talk about Putin. He's, I may have you to know. run again, David. I may have to run again. I really, I really may have to run again. Too many people want me to, David. I don't want to, David. I don't want the attention. I'm going to be happy. More time with beautiful Melania. More time with my family. More time with Melania. More time with my family, Ivanka. Eric Donald Jr. gathering together every night by the fire, coming up with racial slurs for Letitia James. <laughs> it's a little family tradition that we had gotten away from. And now, and now we're All back. Right. And it fe I feel like a whole person again. All right, please. You know, can we just talk about the situation? Got, so, David... David, we gather by the fire and we've got slurs, David. We've got slurs like you wouldn't believe. I don't want to hear that. But that's, sure. You're not going to hear it, David, because we keep them in the family. We do. Good. But I may have to run, David. I really may.